2021 to order. Um, Madam Clerk, over to you first with regards to our call to order. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to provide a very shortened review of the protocols for electronic participation in this council meeting. Voting for this meeting will be conducted verbally for procedural votes that do not require recorded vote. The chair or I will call for any objections. If you have an objection, please indicate your name and objection. If no objections are stated, the motion will be deemed to be adopted. For recorded votes, I will call upon each member in alphabetical order based on last name. I'll confirm the vote for each member. If you do not respond when called upon to vote, I will call your name a second time. If you do not respond to the second call, you will be recorded as, as abstaining from the vote and your vote will count in the negative as a nay vote. If you're participating electronically and are leaving the meeting, please send an email to council at peelregion.ca to indicate you're leaving the meeting. If you leave the meeting for any votes thereafter, you will be marked absent. We'll now commence the meeting with roll call. Mayor Brown? Here. Thank you. Councillor Carlson? Here. Thank you. Mayor Crombie? I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Councillor DeMurla? Councillor DeMurla? Councillor Dasco? Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Dillon? Councillor Dillon? Councillor Downey? Present, good morning. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca? Here, good morning. Thank, thank you. Councillor Fortini? Good morning, everyone, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Groves? Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Ennis? Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Kovac? Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Mahoney? Good morning, present. Thank you. Councillor McFadden? Good morning, happy Thursday, everyone. Thank you. Councillor Medeiros? Here. Thank you. Councillor Pileschi? Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Parrish? Here. Thank you. Councillor Raz? Here, good morning. Thank you. Councillor Sato? Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Santos? Here. Thank you. Councillor Sinclair? Present, Ian. Thank you. Councillor Starr? Present. Thank you. Mayor Thompson? Present. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Councillor Vicente? Councillor Vicente? We have quorum. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. Councillor Dillon, uh, I'm here. I just had technical difficulties. Thank you. Councillor Dillon, duly noted. Thank you all. We have quorum. Madam Clerk, our Indigenous land acknowledgement. Thank you. We would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates as part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, indigenous people inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we wish to acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are the direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give respect to our first inhabitants and a shout out to our Haudenosaunee friends and neighbors and uh, forefathers and mothers if you will. I got a great little update that they are putting forward a program this week on celebrating water and how appropriate is that? Good on them. Okay, uh, moving on. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Hearing none, I've got one other acknowledgement. I may ask our CAO to do it. I understand the front benches look a, a little different. We've got a new recruit. So uh, Janice, perhaps you'd like to introduce our newest face. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you, Chair Yanika. Yes, it's my pleasure to um, introduce to Council at her first Council meeting, Keely Dedman, who's joined us as our new Commissioner of Public Works, I think now in her second week. So uh, as I was a few months ago, I'm sure it feels like drinking from a fire hose. But uh, Keely comes from the City of Guelph. She was the Deputy CAO there for Infrastructure Development and Enterprise Services. Uh, 
Um, Keeley has extensive background and experience uh, in engineering, transportation, environmental services in the public sector, and she's well known to everybody uh, because she's been very active in both the um, Canadian Public Works Association, the Ontario Public Works Association. She currently chairs the Regional Public Works Commissioners of Ontario. Um, just so delighted to have Keeley on board, and uh, as Nando says, a tremendous addition to, uh, to our executive leadership team. And maybe with your indulgence, Chair, I'd just ask Keely to put on her camera and say hello and, and say a few words to Council. Thank you. Absolutely. Keely, welcome. And why didn't you say hello to the team? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that kind introduction. I'm so thrilled to have joined the region of Peel. It's, um, it's such a, a terrific staff that is here, um, dedicated, committed professionals. And I'm so looking forward to working with this council and moving forward our strategic plan together. Thanks for the introduction. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much and welcome. Okay, moving on. Next I have is the approval of the minutes. I have a motion here moved by Councillor Carlson, seconded by Councillor Grove, that the minutes of the March 25, 2021 Regional Council meeting be approved. Is anyone opposed? That is carried. That brings me to the approval of the agenda. There are some additional items that I'd like to enunciate first with regards to our approval of the agenda through a, by way of motion from Councillor McFadden and Councillor Downley that the... Sorry? I'm okay, wishing to speak to, oh, so why don't I read the motion, then I will come to you with regards to the agenda. Uh, you're right, because I don't see you on my list, but I will get to Parish and Groves once I put the motion properly before us, and we will deal with the agenda. The motion that reads that the delegation listed as item 7.2 on the April 8, 2021 regional agenda be withdrawn, and further that the agenda for the April 8, 2021 regional council meeting include a communication from the city of Mississauga regarding a mobile vaccination unit to be dealt with under COVID-19 related matters 9.2. And further, that the agenda for the April 8, 2021 Regional Council meeting include a communication from the Mississauga Board of Trade supporting mobile vaccination units to be dealt with under COVID-19 related matters, item 9.6. And further, that the agenda for the April 8, 2021 Regional Council meeting include a communication from the City of Brampton regarding mobile vaccination units to be dealt with under COVID-19 related matters, item 9.7. And further, that the agenda for the April 8, 2021 Regional Council meeting include a communication from the City of Brampton regarding vaccine distribution to be dealt with under COVID-19 related matters 9.8. And further, that the agenda for the April 8, 2021 Regional Council meeting include a communication from Dr. Sergio Borja, William, uh, William Osler Health Center regarding prioritization of COVID-19 vaccinations for the Peel education sector to be dealt with under COVID-19 related matters item 9.9. .9. And further, that the agenda for the April 8, 2021 Regional Council meeting be approved as amended speakers, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You you hit my my subject, which is the uh, the motion on mobile vaccines. You you stated it. I should have been more patient. Thank you. Yeah, with thanks to the team here that picked up on it, and so good on them, and well done to the clerk's department, Councillor Gloves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a motion. It's related to item uh, to report 13.1, and it's a presentation also that uh, Dr. Saha will be doing. Um, I know that there is a recommendation in the report, but I just thought this motion will strengthen that recommendation. So um, if it's appropriate, I'd like to bring the motion forward at that time. And Councillor Groves, thank you. And I, I want to add to that, you're right, Dr. Saha is giving us a presentation with regards to 10.1 in your related matter, which speaks to seniors' health and wellness in Peel Village. What I'm going to suggest, Councillor Groves, if, if you will agree, and the rest of the team, I would like to deal with that delegation right after our main block of delegations, because I understand it's just five to seven minutes, and that way we get Dr. Saha and that team back to work, and then we can deal with the COVID conversation, which I think is going to take considerably longer. So I'm going to tuck them in at that time, if that's okay with the team. Um, having said that, more speakers to the agenda. Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a notice of motion that I sent in for uh, with uh, respect to the request of two of the delegations that we're going to be hearing today. I'd like to bring the notice of motion uh, forward after the delegation so I can uh, shed some light on it at that time, if that's okay. Yes, thank you. And the clerk did speak to me as that as well. And we will acknowledge you at that time. 
Anybody else with regards to the agenda as amendment? It not. It has been moved by McFadden and Downey, Madam Clerk. The vote over to you. Are there any objections? If not, our agenda is approved. Thank you. That brings me to the consent agenda. So with regards to the delegations, I already noted 7.2 has been struck. After 7.3, we will deal with 10.1. Then we're on to the COVID report 8.1. Communications items under 9. 9.1, General Rick Hillier, Chair of Vaccination Distribution Center, his latest update on consent. Thank you. 9-2, Christine Elliott, letter from the minister uh, advising of the one-time funding for implementation of centralized incident management system on consent. Thank you. Number three, another letter from the same minister on the same topic on consent. Thank you. Number nine, four, Manav Sindhu, Special Assistant Office of the Honorable Pramit Sarkaria, with regards to the, advising the government of Ontario is doubling the size of the small business support on consent, and then additional item 9.5 from Stephanie Smith, Legislative Coordinator, City of Mississauga, providing a copy of the City of Mississauga's resolution regarding mobile vaccination units, which we've already know is before us, as 9.5 on consent. Thank you. Uh, the staff presentation 10 one, oops, sorry, did you have, oh, and there was a further one. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I have to deal with the rest of them that we spoke to. 9.6, Brad Butt, Vice President, Government and Stakeholder Relations Board of Trade, um, additional item in the correspondence that we received on consent. Thank you. 9.7, Terry Brenton, Legislative Coordinator, City of Brampton, with regards to the mobile vaccination units that we spoke to on consent. 9.8 from Terry as well from Brampton with regards to the distribution of the vaccine on consent. And 9.9, .9, Dr. Sergio Borges' presentation that I spoke to as well on consent. Thank you. 10, we've dealt with 10.1, the seniors and wellness, um, seniors health and wellness matter that we'll deal with under uh, delegations. 11, items related to public works. We have a communication item, 12. Point one, Laura Hall, Director of Corporate Services and Town Clerk of Caledon, a uh, copy from Caledon Resolution regarding the town comments regarding the Region of Peel's Class Environmental Assessment Study of Airport Road. On consent, thank you. 13, 13.1, Building an Enhanced Community Paramedicine Program in Peel. On consent, no. oh, that's no. a hold? It is yes. a I see Councillor Groves asking for a hold there. Thank you. 14-1, uh, Donna Cripps, Transitional Regional Lead, Ontario Health, uh, correspondence from the Lins. On consent. Thank you. Uh, no items related to human services. Dealt with 15, 16, 17. On to 19. Items related to enterprise programs and services. Number one, I believe that was the deferred delegation request for development charge relief from the can of properties. So I guess we will just uh, receive that on consent. Okay, 19.2, 2021 final levy bylaw and dedicated provincial gas tax update on consent. Thank you. 19.3, uh, proposed road closure and transfer of region owned lands located on the east side of the Gore Road across from Edge Forest Drive on consent. 19.4, proposed surplus and transfer of region owned land located on the south corner of here Ontario Street and County Court Boulevard. On consent, 19.5, report of the clerk regarding the Regional Council Policies and Procedures Committee workshop. Hold. On, uh, asked to be held. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Communications items, 20.1 from Minister Laura Scott, email dated March 23, advising of the extension of timelines for submissions on an asset management plan. On consent. Thank you. 20.2 from Minister Peter Bethlen Falvey, Minister of Finance and President of the Treasury Board, regarding the Ontario Cannabis Legislation Implementation Fund. On consent, other business we'll deal with. Notice a motion we'll deal with at the time. The bylaws, we have to deal with the in camera. So I think that's got us good to go. Madam Clerk, 20. Point, sorry, 20, oh, 24.1, the minutes from the in-camera. So with regards to in-camera matter 24.1, the March 25, 2021 Regional Council closed session report minutes. Do I have consent for those? We do. Very good. With that, Madam Clerk, for the consent agenda vote, I have a motion that reads from Councillor St. Clair, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, that the following matters listed on the April 8, 2021 Regional Council agenda be approved under the consent items as enunciated. Madam Clerk, you need a recorded vote? Over to you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll begin with Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? Yes, thank you. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demerla? Councillor Demerla? Councillor Dasco? Yes. Councillor Dasco in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? favor. Councilor Fonseca in favor. Councilor Fortini? In favor. Councilor Fortini in favor. Councilor Groves? In favor. Councilor Groves in favor. favor. Councilor Innes? In favor. Councilor Innes in favor. Councilor Kovac? In favor. Councilor Kovac in favor. Councilor Mahoney? Yes, thank you. Councilor Mahoney in favor. Councilor McFadden? In favor. Councilor McFadden in favor. Councilor Medeiros? In favor. Councilor Medeiros in favor. Councilor Pileshi. In favor. Councilor Pileshi in favor. Councilor Parrish? In favor. Councilor Parrish in favor. Councilor Raz? In favor. Councilor Raz in favor. Councilor Sato? <coughs> Councilor Sato? Whoops, sorry, yes. Councilor Sato in favor. Councilor Santos? Yes. Councilor Santos in favor. Councilor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr. In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente. Councillor Vicente? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are on to delegations. Our first delegation, 7.1, Anthony Mason, Secretary, Huttonville Residents Association, and Neeraj Sharma, Resident Cities of Brampton and Mississauga, regarding safety issues pursuant to Vision Zero at the intersection of Mississauga Road and Ostrander Boulevard and related item 22.1. And I also believe a matter Councillor Pileshi is bringing to our attention uh, today as well. So, uh, Anthony and Neeraj, please proceed. You have five minutes. Minutes. Tony, your mic's not on. A Anthony, okay, Tony, if you're Anthony, I can hear you now. Yes, please proceed. Okay. Mr. Chairman, councillors and staff, good morning, and thank you for letting us present this delegation. If we can change to slide two, please. <clears throat> Historically, when we came here 25 years ago, Mississauga Road in Brampton was a two-lane road. <clears throat> Slowly and surely, we've been widening it to six lanes, and about six years ago, north of Queen Street to the intersection from our subdivision at Ostrander Boulevard and Adamsville Road was widened to six lanes. <clears throat> it was then going to continue out to six lanes all the way up to Bavare Drive. <clears throat> we immediately found that doing a left turn out of either of the subdivisions on either side of Mississauga Road posed a problem that the center median was not wide enough and either the front of your car or the rear of your car would actually protrude into a traffic lane and upset the traffic trying to get by. <clears throat> it was pointed out to our regional councillor at that stage that Whilst we were still building out the road north of the junction, we could widen this uh, center median so that when traffic going south um, <clears throat> was stopped by a light, we could get halfway, and then when it was safe to go, we could continue with our left turn. Um, <clears throat> our regional councillor took this to the, the region, but nothing happened, and later on we found out the suggestion had been declined. So <clears throat> that was the traffic problem that we initially had. It could have been resolved because the region owns the land to the west of Mississauga Road and hadn't at this stage finished widening and therefore could have increased the width to allow the median to be widened. <clears throat> the Huttonville Estates is only 34 homes, but we have a lot of all year round walkers and dog walkers. And when we get to this time of the year, with three subdivisions now around us, we get other subdivision people coming to walk, to jog, to cycle, exercise their dogs. And to do that when you don't live in the subdivision means you have to cross 
Mississauga Road. <clears throat> and that's where the problem uh, basically comes up. We have two bus uh, stops at this intersection, and we're all encouraged to use more public transport. However, no matter which subdivision you, you live in, if you do a return trip, you have to cross Mississauga Road at least once. And that is actually not a six-lane road, it's a 10-lane road, because we have a bus, bus pull-in on the west, three active traffic lanes, a very narrow uh, sub-raised median in the center. It's 107 centimeters wide. Then we have a left turn lane, three active traffic lanes, and a right turn lane. So you're crossing 10 lanes. And if you get halfway, you're on this raised median of 107 centimeters. In one direction, you've got slower turning traffic about a meter away from you. More scary is the active lane behind you is one meter away with high speed traffic up to 100 kilometers an hour. We're posted 70, but very few people do that. And if you have a track, <clears throat> tractor trailer going by at 100 kilometers, the buffeting from the, the wind that that creates is pretty scary. But we have people going and taking that because the alternative is to walk 500 meters to the south or 500 meters to the north to a signalized crossing place. So this is something that totally contradicts Vision Zero. Um, <clears throat> and now we have that on top of the, the traffic situation. So that really doesn't leave anything other than signalizing this intersection. So that's the issue that conflicts with the region's uh, vision zero. So I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in here now, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, you went a little over time, so I'm going to really motor guys. If we can change the slide. Um, first, I want to commend the council uh, for uh, the fantastic initiatives that are noted here. Vision Zero and the Sustainable Stride, um, Transportation Strategy are fantastic. Um, you know them well. I probably do not need to go through them in great detail. Um, but just to kind of look at a few things around them, zero fatality and injury collisions for all road users, very lofty goal, and one I'm really proud to live in Peel to have a goal such as that. Uh, sustainable tra uh, strategy, uh, transportation strategy, you know, 37% of trips for walking, cycling, trans uh, transit, carpooling up to 50. You know, once again, a really solid goal from that perspective and a system that is safe, convenient, efficient. These are the right things. You guys are doing the right things. But the problem here is our neighborhoods in this area are falling short uh, from benefiting or contributing to both those strategies. So we can go to the next slide. I just want to talk a little bit about um, the, the final issue. So as you know, with the pandemic and lockdowns and shutdowns and everything else, you know, the only really form of physical activity these days is, in, is you know, getting out and kind of doing your thing. Tony's already mentioned, we have people walking through the neighborhoods um, and we're crossing nine to 10 live lanes of traffic. Um, it is a tragedy waiting to happen. Uh, from that perspective, you know, people are walking into our neighborhood to get to the credit. Uh, they're doing so in a very dangerous fashion. Second point, there's no playground in, in our area. We have a lot of young kids, so we have to cross that same nine lanes of live traffic to get to the uh, playground on Adamsville. The, all of these conflicts relate back to one of those strategies and our issues. The transit stops that were mentioned, all of our people and all the communities around us are crossing those same lanes to get to those transit stops. Uh, you have to sprint at rush hour to get across. So if we're promoting safe public transport, this is not doing it for us. We have, a, we have dozens of young drivers in this area trying to use you know, their newly uh, acquired right to drive. I have four daughters, three of which are already young licensed drivers and the other one turns into one next month. My heart is at my feet every time they take the car out trying to make a left on that road. Uh, it's just very unsafe. Uh, police records are incorrect. Uh, Councillor Pleshi has gone back and taken a look at things. They're showing no accidents in 2020. We've provided evidence uh, with pictures of police and fire attending. Uh, so there have been a number. We have three documented and there's another three potential. And Niraj, and Niraj I'm going to give you another minute or so to wrap up before I go to Councillor Pleshi. So about a Thank minute you. more. 
Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, and we're also growing like mad around here. So, that, that, you know, it is something that's really big. So, you know, once again, each of these points, um, you know, around safe mobility, walkability, age-friendly built environments, safe transportation parameters are in conflict based on everything that I've just mentioned. Yeah, and, um, you know, we're just going to look for your support on this. This is something that we've been after for some time. While I know, you know, we're, we're councillors from all over the region, and this is specific to the Brampton area, um, I'm looking for your support. We're all Peel residents. We all should be able to benefit from Vision Zero. Um, and like I said, this is a, a tragedy waiting to happen, and I'd hate to see that happen after a discussion uh, where we're bringing this to your attention. I thank you for your time today, and uh, we'll pa pass it over to Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Michael. You're next on my list. Councillor Pileshi, questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you to the delegations. And I think typically uh, amongst regional councillors, we've been here for five years, never seen a delegation like this with this type of uh, type of request. And just a little bit of background, I've been working on this for five years now, trying to, with staff, trying to come up with uh, with other arrangements to, to see how we can get pedestrian traffic and car traffic across this, uh, this uh, major street uh, safely, as safe as possible and it's just come down to um, we don't believe that there's anything else we can do other than put up a set of, of traffic lights and I think that's why I was I, I uh, brought this motion uh, forward I, it, just a, a simple request to to put up the traffic lights but also enter into the a cost sharing with the municipality understanding that you know, typically, if the region staff isn't, they're saying that it's not justified. And and to you know, our delegates' points, they're absolutely right on on the data is is not factual. Um, the data that the region has is not what the data that I have in the emails that I receive from residents showing the multiple accident year after year. Um, so that's kind of my request to see if there's an appetite to, to even bring this motion forward here today to see if we can uh, uh, get this done, enter into a cost sharing with the local municipality uh, to see if we can make this intersection safer for the residents around it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councillor Pelleschi, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you for your vigilance on the file and all the work you've been doing that I'm aware of as well. Uh, perhaps through to the clerk before I go to my two other speakers, how best to... to position this so that it keeps moving forward. What a direction or motion should we have before us that uh, Mr. Councillor Pileshi might consider? Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to, to clarify, uh, Councillor Pileshi, we do have your motion. It's my understanding that it was going to be a notice of motion uh, referred to staff to report back at the uh, next regional council meeting with a report. Uh, is that uh, correct? Um, and that was kind of the intention. It's just uh, five years of working on this, Mr. Chair, Madam Clerk. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's an appetite on, on council to understand that we've been working so hard at this. Maybe if there's a, a opportunity to get this done today, I'd be, uh, I'd be very appreciative. Thank you. I will hear the conversation and we will go from there. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. My next speakers, Councillor Santos, then Mayor Brown. Councillor Santos. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, thanks, Councillor Pileshi, for, for all of your hard work on, on this particular file. The, um, the community or the community on the other side is actually in Ward 5, where Councillor Vicente and I represent. And I know that um, in talking to the residents there, um, they are also concerned about this particular area. Today, later on in the agenda, Councillor Vincica um, is bringing forward a motion which I also support with respect to sustainable active transportation and um, you know some of the things that we need to demonstrate in terms of being committed to vision zero and prioritizing really the safety of active mobility and active transportation um, this particular intersection really is the, the, the safest place to be is in your car, <laughs> where you are encased in a steel frame vehicle. Um, and, and if we are going to prioritize and start shifting our thinking, especially um, in, in Brampton and Mississauga, around encouraging people to walk, encouraging people to take their bikes, um, certainly the five years of work on this file 
is coming to an opportune time for us. So I would support, if possible, for us to move forward today if um, if council if, if uh, our council colleagues would would um, allow for that um, because uh, you know time is of the essence of course and uh, I certainly support either moving this forward today since we are going to be talking about active transportation later um, as well as if we can't do that um, making sure it happens at the next council meeting thank you very much and thank you to the delegation as well Thank you. Mayor Brown. Yeah, I just want to thank the delegation for the very detailed um, presentation. Um, obviously, they've done their uh, homework, and um, I've been briefed on the, the safety challenges here before from Councillor Pileshi and Councillor Willens, and, um, you know, I always believe that ward councillors have the, the, the best grasp on their on, on their ward, and I know how passionately Councillor Pileshi feels about this, and Councillor Santos um, has been so involved in active transportation from a Brampton perspective, and so, you know, trying to get to the, adapting to to get to that Vision Zero, adapting to, to create those safe um, uh, communities um, is something that I certainly want to rally behind. So um, if Councillor Pileshi at some point will have the appropriate direction or motion or um, how we can meet this concern, I'd be happy to support. Thank you. If that exhausts my list of speakers, Councillor Pileshi, if I can suggest, and perhaps a city manager might like to chime, understand the intent, and, and I think it's laudable. Very difficult for us, though, to approve something that we really don't know all the moving parts to. How much would it cost? How is it shared? What's the rationale? I'm thinking as the regional chair now for the next dozen that come in at the very next meeting, and we can't explain why or what for or how, uh, even though it's right as rain, perhaps. So perhaps through to the CAO, um, would it I guess what I'm leaning towards is because I otherwise need two thirds to even deal with it today. Um, uh, there's been a lot of patience. Uh, it would be my suggestion that can we accept it as the notice of motion that'll be before us in two weeks because it would be lovely to have a report and a framework because uh, otherwise I think it, in two weeks time we'll just have a lot more requests for a lot of other intersections. And it's nice to have a framework from which we dealt. But to the CAO, what would your suggestion be on that? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I really would ask that this be referred back to staff. I, ha I have been checking. Uh, I understand this particular intersection meets roughly about 15% of the warrants for a signal. That's a pretty big gap. So even if our data is off, it's not off by that much. Uh, and and I think therein lies the dilemma, you know, and, and not that money should be the determinant of everything, but a signal probably costs somewhere in the order of a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, so, you know, if we're not going to um, look at the criteria that have been established for signalized intersections, uh, then I think, you know, we, 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 we kind of are in a bit of uncharted territory here. So I would recommend certainly that staff be given the opportunity to come and report back. Council always has the ability to vote and, and, and overrule uh, a recommendation of staff. That's a given. Uh, but I think it would behoove you to have the information in front of you before you do that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the discussion. Councillor Pileshi, over to you. Would you like to receive it as a notice of motion and let's get that report in two weeks' time? Sorry, um, Chair, it's uh, Councillor Dillon. I was trying to get on the board. Oh, I apologize. Please go ahead, then I will go to Councillor Pileshi. Go ahead, Councillor Dillon. Um, sorry about that. You know, I just want to just uh, support Councillor Pileshi in this. Uh, you know, he's the, the local uh, ward councillor, and a lot of the times uh, they have a real pulse of, of what's actually going on, and sometimes... Uh, the numbers, uh, they don't really reflect what's what's going on. And uh, there's a similar uh, issue we're having on Airport Road uh, in Eagle Plains. Uh, and uh, Janice, just a, a, a quick message to you. If we've been asking for some information, some data for that area for a few weeks now, we haven't uh, received it. So uh, if you can really push staff to get us the, the rationale for some of the uh, for some of the uh, advice they've given us. I'd really appreciate it, but 100% uh, support uh, uh, Councilor Pileshi on this. Thank you. And Councilor Pileshi, I've had Mayor Thompson come on now, if you'll allow him to say a word before I come to you for a motion, if I may. Mayor Thompson. Um, yes, uh, I, I hear where Janice is going, but I think I know that intersection extremely well. 
And to me, is that there's a cry for help here that we need to find some solutions. For Vision Zero, if it isn't signalized, I wanna know what the region suggests as a solution. Doing nothing, I believe is not the answer here. We need solutions, uh, if it isn't signalized intersection, what is it that we can do to make that safe? There's gotta be something there that, uh, there's other tools that we can definitely use. Even, a, you know, let's look at a crosswalk or anything, but I definitely believe the volume of that traffic, especially the trucks coming up over that hill, it's a good movement corridor as well. Um, I do believe we need to have a solution of some kind coming back. I'm willing to defer it to staff, but I'm looking for a solution for it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Thompson. Councillor Pileshi. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to hear some uh, councillors to see if anybody was opposed to to dealing with it now, and and I, I respect your, uh, your you know your leadership here at the region and and uh, our CAOs as well. Um, I guess in not hearing uh, too many comments, whether uh, for or against, um, and and I don't want to set uh, you know uh, a precedent here, and and but uh, Mayor Thompson is absolutely right. There's a call call uh, for help here, and if there was anything else that I could do over the last five years that I've been working on this, uh, believe me, I would have done it. So, Mr. Chair, if we can uh, achieve the two thirds, then um, let's see where we go from there. So the request from Councillor Palesh, I need a seconder for that motion that we'd like to deal with it today, and I need two-thirds. Do I have a seconder uh, to do, Madam Clerk, do I even need a seconder to get two-thirds? We need to do the two-thirds vote. So the mo after the discussion, and I respect that, Councillor Pileshi, and I appreciate the way you've couched it. Um, so the motion is that we would like to try and proceed today. That's what Councillor Pileshi's put before us. I need two-thirds to deal with the matter today. Madam Clerk, the vote over to you. So we have a motion to waive the rules to be able to uh, have a motion proceed out of a delegation. Um, I'm assuming the motion will be moved by Councillor Pileshi. We do need a seconder for the motion to waive the rules. Dillon, I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dillon, thank you. All right, and I'll begin with uh, Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor, Councillor Carlson. Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor, Mayor Crombie. Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demerla. Councillor Demerla. Councillor Dasko. Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon. Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey. Favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca. Yes, in favor. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini. Yes, in favor. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves. Yes, in favor. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes. In favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac. In favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney. Yes, thank you. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden. In favor. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros. Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi. Yes, in favor. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor yes. Sato? Thank you. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? Mayor Thompson, I, I, I think I heard you say in favor, thank you. Councillor Vicente. Councillor Vicente. And that, that carries the two thirds vote. Thank carries. you. So now that we have the matter properly before us to be dealt with today, Councillor Pileshi, I come back to you for a motion that I need seconded that we can then debate. And Madam Clerk, is this the motion itself from Councillor Pileshi? So Councillor Pileshi, I have your previous motion. May I read it at this time if I can get a seconder? Please, thank you. I think Councillor Santos is seconding. Councillor Santos, I if we can acknowledge- yes, that's correct. Very Thank good. You. So here is the motion properly before me now moved by Councillor Pileshi, seconded by Councillor Santos. Whereas the Huttonville Residence Group has continually expressed concern about the safety of motorists, pedestrians, transit users, and cyclists. 
And whereas traffic studies and data collection are conducted in a very narrow time frame and does not depict the overall picture of road users on a daily basis, and whereas the area will continue to experience growth increasing the amount of people and the necessity for safe mobility, whereas the Vision Zero Road Safety Strategic Plan aims to address a number of priorities outlined in the Region of Peel's 2015 to 2035 pardon me, strategic plan by promoting healthy and age-friendly built environments and building a community that promotes safe mobility, walkability, healthy living, and various modes of transportation. And whereas the goal of Vision Zero is that no one should be injured or killed in Peel region resulting from a collision, and whereas the key recommendation of the long-range transportation plan is a 50% sustainable mode share target inclusive of walking, cycling, transit, and carpooling, and whereas a short-term priority of the sustainable transportation strategy is encouraging and supporting cycling and walking to and from schools, transit hubs, and other community destinations. Therefore, be it resolved that the Region of Peel install traffic control signals at the intersection of Mississauga Road and Ostrander Boulevard, and further, that staff investigate the feasibility of cost sharing between local municipality and the Region of Peel. You heard the motion. Do I have speakers? My first up to the motion is Councillor Rass. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I would uh, support the motion, but I would just make a friendly amendment. I would put the last line, um, move that, switch the last two lines. And really, I think they, in order of process, you need to look at a feasibility study before you install the lights. So, um, but uh, given the, um, the, I would say the, the poor design, and we need to fix this in the future, whether it's Brampton or Peel or whoever is responsible for those road designs, uh, we need to do a better job to implement Vision Zero. And uh, I don't know if uh, as the installation of lights progresses at this and other intersections that there also needs to be uh, a better lens of how to implement uh, Vision Zero along our roadways in Peel. Thank you. So, Councillor Raz, as chair, I need a little bit of clarity from you. The last clause reads that the staff investigate the feasibility of cost sharing and only cost sharing. You're asking, if I've understood you, I'll come right back to you, you know, the, the what's and the wherefores and the hows. That ship has sailed, if I understand the motion correctly. So, if you want to us to investigate exactly so, the cost sharing and that to come back, I understand. Otherwise, I'd have to rule it's contrary, I think. So back to you. Well, wouldn't you, before the region of Peel goes and installs the traffic signals, don't you look at, don't you finalize a cost sharing agreement between the local municipalities? Um, isn't, isn't that the appropriate course of action? I'm, I'm not going to agree or disagree with you. I'm just telling you the motion before me is one to approve and then afterwards apportion the cost. That is okay, the motion seems to be before a me. Bit backwards. So I would ask the mover to, um, you know, make sure our I's are dotted and T's are crossed before the traffic light gets installed and also maybe take a look at other opportunities for intersection improvements other than just a traffic light. So Councillor Pelleschi. I, I want to rush this through today, but. There, there might be opportunities to make a bad situation even better other than just traffic lights. Thank you for the thoughts. I will hear the rest of the conversation and Councillor Pelleschi's next up. Councillor Pelleschi. No, I agree with the comments uh, 100% and I'm happy to, to switch the order and, and develop the cost sharing with the, with the local uh, municipality. And I reached out to some colleagues in Mississauga to get a better understanding of how they do it. And that's how they, they do it is, is by understanding. So, I'm happy to switch those around, enter into for the cost sharing, and then and then um, install the lights. Yeah. Thank you. And before I go to Councillor Cato, I want to be absolutely clear on what is before the chair. The whereases all remain the same. Every word remains the same. But the two salient clauses read that staff investigate the feasibility of cost sharing between the local municipality and the region of Peel, and be it resolved that the region of Peel install traffic control signals at the intersection of Mississauga Road and Ostrander Boulevard. That is the motion before me. Speakers to the motion. Councillor Sato. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very supportive of the motion, um, and I do sit on the, on the region's Vision Zero Task Force. Um, one of the things that we uh, that we promote is prevention, and um, you know we're we're trying to get rid of the uh, criteria 
that says you have to have a certain number of collisions before you do anything. And we're getting away from that in Peel. And I wanna say that our Vision Zero staff that are working on Vision Zero at the region are doing an outstanding job in, um, in, in taking uh, preventive measures such as, uh, as this. So I'm kind of surprised that they hadn't recommended um, signals given the information we got today uh, right off the bat without it having to come to council. Uh, one of my concerns, however, um, and the, the councillor might know this, I know at some intersections, um, the region has paid 100% of the cost of, um, of signals. Now, I, I know one of mine, which is a very large intersection, they were doing road work as well, and they built it into, um, they, they built the whole thing into that costing. But could uh, work staff confirm, are there situations around the region where the region has paid 100% of the cost of signals? Whether through they're the warranted or not. Yep, through the staff. <laughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Terry Ricketts here. Um, yes. yes. Councillor, I can confirm there are situations sure. where the region pays 100%. In fact, that okay. is most often the situation. And that's what I thought. So I guess I'm a little concerned, and Councillor Pileshi, um, I don't want to see this being held based on a cost sharing. If the signals are needed for safety, then... Um, I guess I'm a little concerned. Yes, you can go and you can try and see if you can do a cost sharing, but I would not want the motion and the installation of the signals to be based on reaching a cost sharing agreement. And that's what the motion seems to seems to imply right now. So, um, I mean, to me, the cost sharing is, you know, if we can get it, let's do it. That's how I feel. Um, but I want it to be very clear in the motion, Councillor Pileshi, that we're giving staff direction to install the signals. And if we can get a little bit of funding from the municipality, that's fine. But I don't want to hang my hat on a cost sharing. And as staff have said, we have installed it 100%. So um, I'm not even sure that the cost sharing feasibility should be in the motion. Maybe uh, leave the motion, take that out, and just give direction to staff to... Um, as, a, as an aside, to see if you can get a cost sharing with the municipality. But I, I, I think putting it in, um, I don't want to see it stopping the uh, moving ahead while staff fiddle around with cost sharing discussions. Um, I, I think it's too important for road safety to, uh, to make that a criteria. Councillor Sato, thank you, because I do think that clarity is necessary, and I think the CAO is waving at me for the same reason. So why don't I get that from the CAO before I go on with my list? Uh, through to the CAO. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, to build on the, the information that um, Terry provided, we would typically pay 100% of the costs for a, a, a signalized uh, installation on a regional road, I'm advised that we don't cost share even if the cross streets are local. So I think, you know, it's in essence, uh, if you want the signal to be installed on the regional road, it's at a regional cost. That would be our standard approach to these things. So my suggestion, I mean, if Brampton wants to gratuitously contribute to the signal, we'd be happy to take the money. Uh, but the reality is our standard is it's a regional road, it's a regional cost. Thank you. So what I'm going to do to keep so moving Mr. forward Chair, and focus... Mr. Chair, sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could respond then since I, I've asked the question. Um, I, I'm asking that the motion be amended to remove that clause. Yeah, and thank you, and you, you got out ahead of me. I'm thinking the same thing. Would the mover and the seconder then, Mr. Pileshi, Councillor Pileshi and Councillor Sand, would you like to strike that final clause that reads that staff investigate the feasibility of cost sharing so it does not exist, such that the only direction before us reads, therefore be it resolved that the region of Peel install the traffic control signals at the intersection of Mississauga Road and Ostrander Boulevard, period. Councillor Pileshi, is that how you would like the amended motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to continue to hear uh, from some of my other colleagues. Okay, uh, so we're still speaking to the main motion. Councillor Fonseca.
Chris, we can't hear you. I need you to unmute yourself, please. Sorry, Chris, I see you saying you're unmuted, but I, I can't Can hear you. you. Hear I see the now? lips. There we go. Go ahead. Very strange. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do want to say I support the motion. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Councillor Santos referenced uh, a motion that uh, her and I have been working on over the past couple of months uh, with regards to um, taking the opportunity and being collaborative uh, when it comes to um, the region and uh, uh, the city of Mississauga, city of Brampton, and town of Caledon, um, uh, um, taking advantage of when and where we can to put to put safety first and to reach the mandates uh, within uh, Vision Zero and active transportation that uh, all of us have um, at the local municipal. Uh, the local municipal t council table and then also at the region uh, that we have expressed and passed motions on. Um, and um, one of the reasons why we have, this is a good example, uh, Councillor Pileschi's uh, motion here today is a good example of, of why we've, um, we've put that motion forward. Um, I, I was going to ask questions similar to what Councillor Sato raised. I do believe that, um, when it comes to the cost, um, if, if there's cost sharing opportunities, that's great. But at the end of the day, the principles of Vision Zero, uh, we need to make sure that we're putting safety first. Um, I, that, that, that is obviously the number one priority uh, when it comes to Vision Zero strategy and um, uh, neighborhood safety and community <coughs> safety and resilience. Um, my one, I guess my one point that I would raise, and I think it's captured even if you take out the clause around cost sharing, because it's been clear that on a regional road that that cost would be, um, uh, the region would uh, take on the cost of the actual signals. Um, just to what has also been discussed uh, and Councillor Rass brought up, I think when we're looking at Vision Zero strategy outside of the signals themselves, uh, there are other opportunities that we need to make sure that we look at um, when it comes to ad adhering to and advancing uh, Vision Zero principles. So um, I'm, open to uh, I'm open to taking out the cost, uh, the cost, uh, this being contingent on the cost sharing uh, to Councillor Sato's to Councillor Sato's point, because that was made clear, uh, and that was my question. But I do think that we need to be looking at Vision Zero. It's not just about the light infrastructure; it's also about looking at other uh, other opportunities to ensure that uh, that the intersection and the the intersection and the the uh, Vision Zero principles are being uh, are are we are we. Um, are we taking? Are, are we ensuring that all of those, uh, all of that infrastructure, or all of those principles are being put in place outside of the lights? So I'm, I'm not sure if I made myself clear on that, but um, basically, I support it. I don't think it, we should be. It, this should be contingent on the cost sharing of the light infrastructure itself. Um, at the same time, I want to make sure that we're we're addressing all the Vision Zero principles in and around this intersection for the community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Councillor Fonsi, but I, I need some clarity on the point that you're making. I want to be clear. We're asking to go ahead without a staff report. Now it's like you want us to do a report. That's not what this motion says. So I, I wish to be, so I understand the conundrum you're speaking to. I think the chair shares it, but that's not what this says. So either the funding issue is all that's before us, yes or no, because we're going ahead with a light and I respect that, but we can't then say, did we look at all the other options? The answer is no, you didn't want us to. You didn't want a staff report back for two weeks. So in fairness to staff who I have to defend, um, it's gotta be clear and I think it is clear if that's the the wish of this council. My list is Raz, Downey, Parrish, Sato. Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, yes, the main road may be a regional road, but it also is um, a T intersection with, um, uh, with city roads. So 
I think if we're going to go down, pardon the pun, this road, then we just need to be clear um, if it's a if it's a hundred percent funded by the region of Peel. Oh, the then... Sorry, sorry, Councillor Parrish was uh, jumped in there. Um, we need we just need to be clear who's doing what. I I'm sure that we're going to get a ton of other requests. I don't even know what our budget is. So it would have been nice, Councillor Pleshy, to have a report come back in two weeks um, to support that. It's only because we know that there are going to be other requests. But if this is going forward today, fine. But there are financial implications. And I know people like saying there, you know, money should be no object when it comes to safety. I agree, but money is an object because we also have, um, we have other priorities. So I would just like to know, and I'm fine with this one moving forward, but to make sure that anything coming forward in the future is actually properly papered. And we have a sense of what the budgets are uh, with respect to the signalized intersections. And um, just as an aside, not part of this motion and allow me the uh, um, uh, the extra time, Mr. Chair, just to, we need to do a better job of design. Uh, so we're not in these situations where we're putting in signalized intersections after the fact. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Thank you to you, Chair. Um, just uh, to follow up with Councillor Raz's uh, point, um, and maybe something for the delegates and the, the neighborhood community to consider is that, um, you know, signals work in a system along the roadway and, and adding to that system may not necessarily help. Um, it may compound issues uh, depending on the flow of traffic. And, and that is why I will continue to defer to the, the traffic engineers because I am not one. Um, I do also feel like I've been having this conversation all week in regards to community safety zones, ASC cameras, et cetera. Um, uh, these issues are not political. They can't be political. They have to be uh, based on data and measured and warranted um, uh, based on the legislative criteria, uh, you know, and that's why we implement them. So um, I don't at all begin to debate uh, safety issues and concerns that the residents are seeing, um, but I, like Councillor Raz, um, would love to see a staff report coming forward because maybe a light is not the best option. Maybe there are, there are other traffic um, techniques or uh, intersection designs that could be implemented in this case that would actually make a better scenario all around for the community. Um, but uh, it, and maybe that's something that the traffic, fact, uh, traffic staff uh, could speak to. I, I don't know if anybody from travel, I think what you're saying is would we benefit from a report? I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, Madam City Manager, if you wanted to add something. Uh, uh, no, I mean, Terry is uh, here if you want her to speak to any of the technical questions. So, Terry, you've heard the conversation. What would you like to add based on uh, Councillor Downey's comments? I think, um, I think it might be helpful to add, um, like Councillor Downey is quite correct. When we look at the addition of traffic signals, we consider that on a network basis. And the reason we use the, the criteria we've talked about, the warrant system, um, which is established through the Ontario Traffic Manual, is because that shows you on a network basis where your tipping point is, where you're going to get a net safety benefit. So the reality is that anytime you add a signal, there's going to be an increase in certain accidents and a decrease in others on a network basis. So the purpose of the warrant is to let you know through um, a standardized and, and complex um, set of analysis, when you reach that tipping point such that your net safety benefit overall is, or, or such that you have a net safety benefit rather than um, a net safety detriment, I'll say. So in this case, um, uh, the CAO was quite correct earlier, the area meets approximately 15% of the warrant. Um, if any criteria in the warrant met 100%, then you would be at that stage where you know you, you would have a net safety benefit from adding, from adding this signal. Um, and I do maybe also want to point out that what I'm really interested in is some of the other conversation around other options. So we've talked a lot about signals for this intersection, um, but I do think there's opportunity to work with Peel Regional Police on the speeding issue there, and also to have further discussions on pedestrian um, pedestrian movement uh, rather rather than than the signals discussion necessarily because that may not in fact um, well based on the numbers 
that wouldn't provide the region with an overall net benefit for safety, which is why the Vision Zero staff, um, Councillor Sato was asking earlier why they would have recommended against it. That's why they recommended against it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Downey, anything further? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. And next on my list, Councillor Parrish. Thank you. Um, the split between the region paying and the city paying, it's all the same taxpayers. The region uh, collects 42% approximately, the cities collect 33%, so it's the same guy paying it. So that argument doesn't concern me at all. Um, and I'm sure Councillor Pileschi has looked at all these other options. He says he's been working on this for five years. Suddenly, when he's about to make a motion and he's about to let this go on forever, he had an opportunity to stop it about 20 minutes ago. He's uh, going to grab uh, loss out of the clutches or victory out of whatever it is backwards. <laughs> George says defeat from the jaws of victory. Thank you, George. I, I can never get those things right. Um, I, I think we just vote for the light. There's not a, I don't think there's a single Mississauga councillor that hasn't looked at a traffic report coming back on an intersection for a stop sign or even lights, and we just overrule it because we say the local councillor knows the area the best. And you've had two delegations here today, that, that uh, two gentlemen that made a good point. And if I didn't want to speak, I would have just moved the mo move that we vote now. But Paul, or um, Michael, please, next time somebody says to you, do you want to just call the vote, do the vote, please. This is just, it's, it should be over by now. Councillor Parrish, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm trying my best here, but thank you for your comments. Councillor Sado. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for letting me, for, uh, I apologize for coming back on, but listening to some of the comments, I think it's very clear that members of council are really not aware of what we're doing on Vision Zero at the Region of Peel. Um, as I said, I do sit on the task force, so I guess I, I know that all of the discussion that's been going on um, is being done at the Vision Zero task force, and um, the, the prevention methods and changes to uh, to intersections and signals, then a lot of work is, is being done physical as well as uh, technical. Um, so first of all, I'm going to, um, and I've already suggested to the staff that uh, we have a presentation at a future council meeting on what the Vision Zero Task Force is doing and how staff are now looking at intersections and warrants um, in, a, in a different way. Terry mentioned the warrant warrants. Um, going by the provincial warrants for um, road safety is not Vision Zero. And the region actually has thrown out the warrants for, uh, for pedestrian activated signals on our roads because um, they, they are very hard to meet and they're, they're just not reasonable. The warrants for uh, traffic signals as per the provincial um, uh, road book is they're absolutely ridiculous because you need to have a certain number of collisions at an intersection. That is not vision zero. You do not wait until you have someone injured, killed, or property damage at, at a certain number at an intersection before you do something. Vision zero is prevention. Vision zero is to, to stop those things from happening. And with looking at this intersection and, you know, members of council, it's the same thing with the always stops, as Councillor Parrish said, we get we get our, our warrants come back. And yes, you have to meet a certain percentage on both roadways. When you have a major road, you will never, ever meet those warrants because the side road traffic will never meet them. On a road like Mississauga Road, you're never going to get any of those side roads meeting warrants. So you, you can't go by that. You have to look at, you know, when I look at Mississauga Road, you're not going to get the traffic to slow down. You know, saying Peel Regional Police should deal with the speeding. Of course they should, but that's not the solution. We all know that. We know that we're putting, you know, we can't have a police officer at the corner of that intersection or up the road every single day to stop the speeding. So, you know, I, I guess... If it was each one of us, if it was our ward, we'd be yelling and screaming to get the traffic signals. You know, uh, I mean, it, it happens all the time. We do it at the local level mainly, 
and this one happens to be at the regional level. So give the residents their traffic signals and give Councillor Pileshi and Santos their traffic signals. Let's let's put Vision Zero to work at this intersection. Let's prevent any collisions and please stop calling them accidents. We should know by now that the word accident has been taken out of Vision Zero, it's collisions. So every time I hear a staff person use the word accident, I really cringe. So please, and I'm sorry, I'm very passionate about this, this Vision Zero stuff. So, um, but Mr. Chair, I would like, um, uh, I would like staff to arrange to have a presentation on the Vision Zero initiatives of the Peel uh, for the Region Appeal. Uh, we've done updates and they go through on the consent agenda. Um, but let's uh, let's have a deputation presentation. Thank you. And I think that's a good idea too to come back. Yes. Uh, moving on, I have Groves Dasko Pileshi, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I do agree with uh, a lot of the comments made by the previous speakers, and this certainly is not a political decision. This is safety, and safety does come before. Safety is first. I can tell you that um, I've been asking for a traffic signal at an intersection in Bolton, and staff kept telling me it didn't meet warrant, it didn't meet, it didn't meet the criteria, and I had a, a, a senior killed there, hit by a truck, and so... I do believe that the, the local councillors and the residents in the area, they know this area, they know the issues much better than I certainly don't know, but I am relying on the councillor and, and the residents there because I would hate to see us um, defer or come back or, and God forbid something happens, like what happened to my resident. Um, none of us want to see that, so I'm in full support of this motion. And I think that sometimes, you know, we have to forego warrants and criteria. And as Councillor Sato said, prevention is key here. So I'm in full support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dasko. Thank you, through the Chair. And I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, the, the proper course probably would have been to see what that report looked like, just to see if there's any other measures, you know, to, to look at. However, hearing everything here from today, it's, uh, I think the homework was done. Uh, the deputants spoke very well and made a very compelling case along with the councillor. And, uh, you know, absolutely, I'm a big believer that the councillors know their areas best. And, um, and so I, I think, that quite frankly, we've over-debated this. And, you know, if I could ask, let's just call the question and get to it. Thank you, and you segue beautifully for the chair because my last speaker is Councillor Pileshe. So, Councillor Pileshe, can I be clear on the motion you'd like to put? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to support. Uh, thank you to my colleagues too. I'm happy to support Councillor Sato's uh, amendment and in, in taking out the cost sharing and putting forward the motion as uh, as amended. Very good, Councillor Santos. You're happy with the amendment as the seconder. Yes, and thank you to all of our colleagues. Very good. So to be clear, the motion before us, other than the whereas is, is very, very clear. Therefore, be it resolved that the region of Peel install traffic control signals at the intersection of Mississauga Road and Ostrandro Boulevard, period. And as an aside, we're going to have that report come back that Councillor Sato spoke to his direction to staff to get a further update on Vision Zero. Madam Clerk, that is the motion before us. Uh, the vote over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll begin with Mayor Brown. Yes, enthusiastically. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson? Yes, you had me at intersection. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Carlson in favor. <laughs> Mayor Crombie? Yes, thank you. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demerla? Councillor Demerla? Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes, I fully support. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? Councillor Downey, I'm back to her. I think she's having some technical problems. Uh, Councillor Fonseca. Madam Clerk, I apologize. I was disconnected. What am I voting on? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is uh, Councillor Pileshi's motion um, that was uh, previously put forward on the screen. Um, to, to simply, if I can, is it to simply approve the lighted intersection. That's what you're voting on. 
Okay, Thank yes. Thank you. Councilor Fonseca in favor. Councilor Fortini. Yes. Councilor Fortini in favor. Councilor Groves. Yes, absolutely. Councilor Groves in favor. Councilor Innes. Yes. Councilor Innes in favor. Councilor oh, Kovac. Really I'll support it, yes. Councilor Kovac in favor. Councilor Mahoney. Yes, thank you. Councilor Mahoney in favor. Councilor Medeiros, or sorry, Councilor McFadden. Fully support. Councilor McFadden in favor. Councilor Medeiros. Yes. Councilor Medeiros in favor. Councilor Pileshi. Yes, collisions. Councilor Pileshi in favor. Councilor Parrish. Yes. Councilor Parrish in favor. Councilor Raz. Reluctantly, yes. Councilor Raz in favor. <laughs> Councilor Sato. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? Councillor Vicente? And I'll come back one more time to Councillor Downey. Not sure if she's been able to log back on. If not, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. So that carries. So congratulations, Anthony and Neeraj. I, I do want you to know for what it's worth in my 32 years, I hope you can go back to your constituency and let them know your counselor just climbed Kilimanjaro with just his shorts on. It's an amazing piece of work and advocacy that he delivered for you, and you should be very, very proud. Well done on you, Councillor Pileshi, and well done, Council. Great conversation. More to come back. The other thing that I need is if Councillor Pileshi and Councillor Santos would agree to accept and receive the delegates. Is anybody opposed to that? If not, that carries. Thank you very much, and again, congratulations to the community. I'd be remiss, by the way, um, at the introduction of one of the delegates they spoke to. Uh, you know, we all got here in Mississauga was just two lanes, and look at the pressures. Um, I've been around a while. Uh, the folks down in our neck of the woods still have to fake the whole Mahoney clan, from Steve down to Mrs. Katie Mahoney and down to the sun, for all the great work that's been done there as well. Thank you. Um, did somebody else have a different point of order? Uh, Mr. Clerk, it's Councillor Vicente. Just to let you know, I think uh, my votes have not been have not been heard. That was a yes for that vote, that last vote, and the last two before it. Okay, Th and thank you very much, Councillor Vicente, because we have missed you, and I'm I'm glad you acknowledge and will be recorded as such. Okay, that concludes the matter. Thank you to all. Moving on, 7-2, the delegation was withdrawn. We're on to 7.3. Raghav Patel, resident of Peel, regarding the expansion of the My Home Second Unit renovation program. Um, Mr. Patel, welcome, and you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, before this presentation, I want to recommit to learning more about the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, land on which the region of Peel operates. Members of Council, I'm here today to propose an expansion to the My Home Second Unit Renovation Program. But first, I want to review some issues this program addresses. Next slide. The Region of Peel found that 72% of households applying to the central waiting list were doing so primarily because they are victims of family violence and need assistance escaping from abusive homes. If we're telling victims of family violence that they need to wait 23 years or six years to find subsidized housing, we're telling them that, that they're stuck there, waiting in dangerous conditions. Next slide. I want to highlight that the number of unregistered second units in Peel are in the thousands, and that these illegal rental units pose great dangers for the tenants living in them. Next slide. Home ownership in the Peel region keeps becoming less attainable, and even during COVID, prices continue to skyrocket. Lower income homeowners are being stretched increasingly thin, taking on huge mortgages they can barely cover. I also want to highlight the median gross income, household income in Peel from the last census was around $86,000. Next slide. These are some key details of the renovation program, which we will now cover. Next slide. In regards to the interest-free loans and their variable amounts, a big pro of this detail is that the loans will greatly increase the living conditions for existing tenants of illegal second units. However, the variable amount means that loans given will not ensure housing for households on the central waiting list. Next slide. The detail about eligibility is excellent because the program will surely address the issue of existing unregistered second units, offering their operators the support to transition to a legal second unit. But the program will not address the creation of new illegal second units, and in the absence of more stringent enforcement options, 
a far-fetched argument can be made that homeowners that cannot afford to build a legal second unit will build an illegal one to be eligible for this program. Next slide. The detail about rental price may deter some operators of illegal second units, but is overall a very beneficial detail in terms of increasing the stock of affordable rental properties in the Peel region. Next slide. The My Home Second Unit Renovation Program is a great step forward, but there are still substantial gaps to how the program tackles these main issues. I also want to note the maximum gross household income for the program is much higher than the median reported in 2016, around 110,000 compared to that 86,000. Next slide. The proposal being set out today is a My Home Second Unit Construction Program to act as a sister program to the renovation program. Very similar, but with changes to key details. Next slide. Loans will be increased appropriately so homeowners can build a new second unit. Potentially, the region can use a central builder and save money because of scale. The key change is that under the construction program, homeowners must re rent to a tenant referred by the region of Peel, a household on the central waiting list. Next slide. Eligibility is a major difference of the proposed construction program. Homeowners must be looking to build a new second unit. This will help address the creation of new illegal second units, but will not address existing illegal second units. Next slide. The proposed construction program will be very effective in filling in the gaps the renovation program has when tackling the issues of social housing crisis and illegal second units. The construction program will help affordability by targeting lower income homeowners to participate through a lower maximum gross household income than the renovation program. To operate a second unit for rental, even an illegal one, is to have great financial privilege. And for many lower income homeowners, it is unattainable. To help lower income homeowners access the revenues that come from renting a second unit would be to greatly improve their lives and greatly affect affordability in the Peel region. Next slide. Uh, I think I'm a slide behind. Can I get a one more slide ahead, please? Thank you. In conclusion, creating a sister program to the existing renovation program, the My Home Second Unit Construction Program, will help to better address the issues outlined today. Working in tandem, the two programs will address these issues with an exponentially greater impact than either program could individually by focusing on and filling in the gaps that either program has in addressing these issues. To my understanding, the renovation program is very much still in its pilot phase, currently on hold and only accepting dozens of applicants. Now is a perfect time to launch a sister construction program as a pilot at a similar scale to judge how these programs work in tandem and so that they can grow together. We need bold, innovative solutions to the issues outlined, and I want to commend the Housing Services Department at the Region of Peel for the innovative renovation program, and I hope this council will consider a sister my home second unit construction program to further these efforts thank you for your time and thank you to the staff that helped with this delegation and thank you to whoever is running the slideshow i really appreciate it mr patel thank you do i have any questions of mr patel at this time seeing none if i could have someone move receipt of the delegation i see councillor mahoney and i see councillor carlson all those in favor are there any opposed that is carried. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, moving on, what we deal with now is the last presentation I have. We've moved up 10-1, which is the Seniors Health and Wellness Report, Peel Village. And I know Dr. Saa is here, and I don't know if Commissioner Polzinelli would like to speak to it as well. So over to the team. Who would like to roll this out, please? Thank you. Or, or, or Eileen as well. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> or Donna, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just getting some feedback. Okay, I think that's taken care of. Thank you, so thank you, Chair, and good morning, Chair Unique and members of Regional Council. My name is Donna Kern. Sorry, I'm still getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, we're still getting some feedback. If we could make sure that everybody who otherwise isn't speaking is muted, please. Thank you, carry on, Donna. 
Thanks so much. So my name is Donna Kern and I am the Director of Senior Services Development within Health Services. I'm happy to be able to provide an update on our Seniors Health and Wellness Village at Peel Manor Initiative and receive Council's direction today on how we move this incredibly important project and our ongoing advocacy efforts forward. As noted in the accompanying report to Council, we are asking Council for funding support and I will provide more detail about our options. We also have Dr. Sudip Saha, the Region of Peel Senior Medical Director for Long-Term Care, Senior Services Development and Community Paramedicine to co-present and who will now kick off our presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Donna. Chair Ainika, members of Council. Thank you for thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to present to you today and a very warm welcome to you all. As I've spoken to this council before, due to public health efforts, people are living longer. For the first time in the recorded history of the world, we have a situation where the number of people in Canada who are over the age of 65 is larger than the number of children younger than the age of 15. In our neck of the woods, this is also a significant problem. The Central West Lynn saw a projected rise of 61% in the number of seniors. The, the Central West Lynn will see a prevalence rise of 61% in the number of seniors who are over the age of 65 between the years 2016 and 2025. I'd also like to highlight that for every five years over the age of 65, you double your risk of getting dementia. Unsurprisingly, the Central West Lynn has the highest provincial rise in dementia at 66%. This is compared to a provincial average of 29%. On the background of these overwhelming statistics, the number of long-term care beds in Ontario increased by only 0.8% between the years 2011 and 2018. I would like to also state that four out of five people who are currently resident in the region of Peel's long-term care facilities would fulfill a diagnosis, would, would fulfill a criteria for the diagnosis of dementia. We also know from the pandemic that the majority of individuals who have died from COVID-19 have been in long-term care. Having acknowledged all of these facts and the lessons learned, I would like to state that there is now a clear and present ma mandate to modernize long-term care. The answer to this challenge is a different approach to care, an approach whereby we are able to provide equivalent care in the community and care specialized for looking after dementia patients. Next slide, please. This is where the Peel Manor project comes in. It is a center of excellence for dementia care, while also addresses the need for community and system capacity challenges. We are building an exceptional long-term care facility with state-of-the-art dementia-friendly design and modernized IPAC standards. The facility is also key to, develop, to developing a model of care in the community that provides the support of long-term care for vulnerable seniors wanting to live and age successfully at home. Next slide, please. From the project's inception, the Region Appeal, with leadership and direction from Re uh, Regional Council, had the foresight to develop a plan that not only included necessary improvements to the Peel Manor long-term care home, but also create an innovative health and wellness village. Sorry, I'm still getting yeah, so much uh, feedback. Again, if everybody can redouble your efforts to make sure that if you otherwise aren't speaking, if you make sure you're muted, please. Thank you. Try again, Donna. Okay, thank you. But also create an innovative health and wellness village that would address shifting demands and service needs. The visual on this slide is something that was shared with Council back in 2014 when the site plan and concept were endorsed. Since the beginning, the project has included many components to meet the needs of seniors in the community and support seniors to age in place, including space for socializing and other health services on site. Next slide, please. With council direction, we aren't just building a new facility. We're creating an integrated and cost-efficient way to keep seniors living in the community while reducing barriers to services. As depicted on the slide, the campus of care also includes several housing options and a seniors-friendly park. 
Plans for the new facility include a 177 bed long-term care home with an enhanced facility design that improves infection prevention and control, inclusion of 59 butterfly dementia care beds with 29 of them tentatively targeted as specialized behavioral support beds to allow residents with complex health needs to be better served, an expanded adult day services program for up to 90 clients, an eight-bed respite care center, a, centers, a seniors focused integrated health care clinic to serve clients and their caregivers, and other health and social services co-located on the site. Next slide, please. Construction began in September 2019, and our planned move-in date for our long-term care residents is the end of July 2022. The service hub, which will serve as a physical home base for the integrated care team that will help to facilitate coordinated care, is planned to be operational, at least partially contingent on external funding streams, by the end of 2022. Since 2015, we have been advocating for provincial funding to support this project. Despite our consistent advocacy efforts, Peel Manor has yet to receive any financial assistance to support the rebuild and transformation of the site. In September 2020, the Region of Peel applied for redevelopment funding through Ontario's Ministry of Long-Term Care's current development application process. While the, re while the Ministry recently awarded funding to several other projects, it is unclear if they will be providing any additional redevelopment funding at this time that we could potentially benefit from. More recently, staff have initiated conversations with Ontario Health regarding operational funding needs, but engagement and direction has been challenging within the context of the ongoing health system transformation, pandemic response, and mass vaccination efforts. Next slide, please. In many ways, the world in which we are building our Seniors Health and Wellness Village has changed and our innovative plan to create a true campus of care is needed now more than ever. We know that many seniors would prefer to age in place. The current model of long-term care is expensive and not sustainable. The cost to deliver care equivalent to what someone would receive in long-term care in the community is approximately $103. That compares to a cost of in excess of $200 to provide that care in long-term care. I would also say for comparison purposes that that same individual when he occupies an acute care bed in an acute hospital costs the system in excess of $730. And a lot of this is happening at the moment. Working in partnership with our local system partners and the Brampton Etobicoke Ontario Health Team, our vision is to wrap supports and services around the client and the caregiver so that the care that they receive is comparable to that received in a long-term care center with the added benefit of remaining in their own home as long as possible. I would also like to reiterate that for the cultural diversity that exists in the region of Peel, a large number of ethnic uh, people have culturally, culturally feel that they would like to keep their seniors at home. This would support those efforts. The program will offer a new short-stay respite center. This will provide greater needed support to unpaid caregivers and fill a significant gap in our community. Ongoing efforts by paramedic services to enhance a community paramedicine program in Peel will also play a vital role in achieving this vision. They will provide home visits and wellness checks for the client that will allow vulnerable seniors to remain safe at home. In closing, I'd like to say that while recent provincial funding to enhance community paramedicine programming is welcomed and is sure to have an impact, enhanced, invents, in, enhanced investments in other community support services like respite and adult day services were missing from the recent provincial budget and are necessary to achieve fulsome wraparound care. Next slide, please. Uh, I think it's the one before this. As you are aware, the region has become a sector leader in transforming long-term care through a person-centered care approach. This has demonstrated improved quality of care and improved outcomes by meeting the emotional, physical, and clinical needs of long-term care residents. The new Peel Manor Long-Term Care Center has a 59-person butterfly unit that will enable exceptional emotional-based care. 
The Seniors Health and Wellness Village is also an important opportunity to broaden the reach of emotion-based care and integrate the butterfly model into other seniors-focused services. We are striving to create a center of excellence for dementia care and our model will help to, will help to inform best practices. All of this sets us apart from other long-term care development projects that are currently happening. Thank you. Next slide, please. Without provincial support at this time, the rebuild poses a financial challenge and puts our ability to achieve the full vision of the project, as Dr. Saha described, at risk. While we continue to advocate for funding from the province and other provincial partners, we are looking to council for their support. The level of financial impact to the region will depend on the rollout scenario pursued. Although there are a multitude of potential rollout options, we are proposing three scenarios for Council's consideration. In all three scenarios, the 2022 rollout will include A, the incremental staff required to support long-term care operations in a larger vertically spread building, B, basic community-focused integrated care service planning and de delivery capability, and C, effective maintenance and support of the ground floor shared spaces in the new building. Scenario A represents the phased full rollout with regional funding. Under this scenario, base staffing would be in place at move-in, and permanent staffing to support the expansion of adult day services and operations of the short stay respite center would be in place at the start of 2023. This scenario maximizes the achievement of intended program benefits, but also has the highest impact to the tax levy. Scenario B is similar to Scenario A, however, the 2023 expansion of adult day services and introduction of short-stay respite would be managed as a 12-month pilot. The scenario allows us to address unmet service demand and gain learnings while providing more time to align with evolving provincial and Ontario health team funding processes. This scenario draws on internal reserves instead of the tax base for the duration of the pilot. Scenario C represents the minimal rollout with no adult day service expansion or short stay respite services. This scenario has the lowest financial impact but does not achieve many of the program's intended benefits. Staff recommend Scenario B, the 12-month pilot for the Adult Day Services Expansion and Respite Centre, as it allows us to achieve the intended benefits and gives us more time to secure external funding in our evolving healthcare landscape. Next slide, please. To meet the demands of our aging population, a paradigm shift is needed. We will not be able to meet the needs of our seniors through just bricks and mortar long-term care buildings. The long-term care at home model that we are pursuing at Peel Manor is a much more affordable way to meet the needs of the rapidly growing aging population and within the context of COVID-19. It also allows some of our most vulnerable seniors to receive care in their homes, where it is safer, and where most want to live out their lives. We continue to work with William Osler Health System and other Brampton Etobicoke Ontario Health Team partners to meet unmet demand and bring our vision of seamless integrated care to life. This innovative approach to care is something we hope can not only be a model that can be expanded across the region's long-term care homes and adult day services programs, but also something that can inform the provincial approach to integrated emotion-based care along the continuum of services for seniors. Currently, we do not have a funding agreement to support our community support services expansion. Key relationships with Ontario Health and the Brampton Etobicoke OHT are vital to moving the project forward and obtaining funding. However, funding conversations have certainly been challenging in the current context given ongoing health system transformation, pandemic response and mass vaccination efforts, and advocacy to support the initiative continues to be a top priority. 
At the same time, the region continues to call on the provincial government to provide capital funding to support transformation of the site that will enable dementia and IPAC friendly design. With your leadership, the Region Appeal can strengthen our advocacy efforts, demonstrating the value add of the Seniors Health and Wellness Village Initiative and our emotion-based approach to care in shaping the gold standard of care for seniors. Next slide, please. That concludes our presentation for today. We thank you for your time and we welcome any questions you may have. Yes, thank you, and I have a list. It is Groves, Crombie, Santos, Fonseca. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Saha and Donna, for your presentation. Um, great presentation. Um, but just a couple of comments, Mr. Chair, on this. Um, one of the things I think um, that this uh, presentation touched on in the report is the emotional well-being of, of seniors. Um, we know that if the seniors' emotional well-being or mental well-being is not addressed, then it certainly affects their physical well-being. The premier was yesterday, I believe, he announced the, uh, the new, um, I guess, stay-at-home order. And one of the things he said was, and he stressed it, that he has heard from several CEOs of hospitals that they are bursting at the seams with uh, in, in um, ICU. Hospitals are full. We are having to send folks to different hospitals outside of their regions, outside of their own their own municipalities. So funding for me is absolutely necessary. The province needs to realize that prevention is so much better and, and costs less than the cure. Um, so it, it concerns me when we are, we, we haven't received our fair share of funding. Uh, for years, Peel has been asking for their fair share of funding and to date we have not received it. And so again, I think that the province needs to recognize the importance of this and the need to have, to, to ensure that seniors' emotional mental well-being is uh, properly um, looked after and funded. Um, I did, you know, I, I ran into some of my seniors last week. They were sitting out on the patio when patios were allowed to open. And the comments from, from those seniors is they're so, they were so happy to be out because they are falling into depression. That type of um, depression obviously affects their, their physical well-being as well. So, uh, you know, while Peel has been a leader, I believe, in seniors' care, our butterfly model has proven to be very successful, and, and, and we certainly are a leader in that. Um, and I also think, and through the presentation, we, uh, Dr. Saha, you spoke about um, integration. Integration is very important for seniors because you don't want to isolate them. You want them to be part of a larger community or a larger village or, or that. So it is, it is very important. Um, and so, Mr. Chair, with that, I, I strongly believe that, I don't know, more advocacy or whatever it is that we need to do, it needs to be done so that the Premier, um, the Premier and the Minister of Health recognizes um, the need for this funding to keep our seniors well physically, mentally and socially active. Um, so I, I do have a motion and I know there are other speakers on the board and I, like I said, I, I'm happy to bring that report forward and uh, where it's appropriate to bring this motion forward. Thank you. Thank you. I will come to you first at motion time. Mayor Crombie. I was just going to say that I support the staff recommendation and Councillor Groves's uh, motion. And I really don't want to go into a lot of detail because I think it was a, a wonderful presentation. It's something that we all know is badly needed. I was quite surprised at the uh, the percentage of people who uh, typically can um, have dementia here in the region of Peel and wondered if that was higher here than other places. And that was one of my questions. But of course, this is very need needed. Uh, and I, I support the recommendation for fund the funding model as well. I think we need some time to continue to advocate for more funding. Of course, in, in the middle of the pandemic, it will be challenging. And certainly uh, with our operational deficits, it's extremely challenging this year. And hopefully next year will be better as people are being vaccinated. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Santos. 
Thank you through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the team for the presentation and Councillor Groves for um, the motion you're bringing forward. When staff had uh, briefed myself and Councillor Vicente on, um, on this file recently, um, one of the things that I had asked and, and they had brought up was whether or not the province um, the province's long-term care standards actually incentivized or included this new way of doing things. And, um, and the answer was no, it's not. And so this new approach, which is really a best practice leading approach to deal with uh, seniors' long-term care and dementia in, in an affordable way, especially now given the pandemic, is currently not exists is currently not supported with it with existing policies at the province. So, just a quick question to staff: if you if you could just share with the rest of, of council um, that particular issue and 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 how we may be able to go about um, using Peel Manor uh, as not just an advocacy piece for funding, but an advocacy piece to start to change the standard and policy because I know that they have recently given money to another long-term care facility um, in Brampton, which was a surprise to all of us and, and very happy for that. But my, my concern is that we are leaving this particular best practice behind because the standards at the province are not updated. So if staff could comment on that, that would be great. Yes, through the staff. Um, thank you for those questions. I'd like to say, uh, suggest that there has recently been a call out for influencing the national long-term care standards that is currently being discussed, and the region will be making an application to be part of that committee. Uh, I remain hopeful that through the context of the work that we are doing and our aspirations to, uh, once the COVID pandemic is over, to collect data that would highlight the statistics that we speak about. Uh, once we have that hard data, it makes a much more compelling case. Certainly the preliminary data that we have collected so far is entirely encouraging and delivers much better outcome in a number of aspects, like overall uh, mental uh, um, health was better for, the, for our residents, families were significantly happier in the context of the care that was being delivered delivered, um, and also um, nutrition in the context of our clients improved. Okay, thank you. Chair Yanika, may I just add to that response? Please. It's Nancy. Yes, so just Nancy. To, add, um, to add to the response from a more structural perspective, Councillor Santos, the, the conversation we had, and it's a really great point, um, is more of the structural piece. So right now, the, it's the continued issue, there's two actually, the continued issue um, is that the policies that the province have do not fit a redevelopment. Oh, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Yeah, yeah, again, the same reminder, if everybody can make sure you're muted if you're not the speaker. Go ahead, Nancy. So the policy that the province holds right now are for two types of long-term care. One, which is a new build, and the second is a redevelopment of a seat home. Right now, even though our um, Peel Manor home is in dire need of redevelopment. Uh, some years ago, back in the late 90s, it was issued as an A home. So even though the building doesn't, um, isn't defined any longer as an A home, the province doesn't have a mechanism to fund those homes that fit the Peel Manor, um, the Peel Manor situation, where it's an A home, but it is in dire straits of, of redevelopment. The second is the physical layout of the building itself. Some years ago, when we started in the planning, looking, looking forward. I, sorry, I can see Councillor Sadel. It's yeah. still, yeah. Oh, yeah, there it, it goes. Th okay, there it go is. ahead. Yeah. And the second piece, and I think this is the one that Councillor Sa Santos was also referring to, is that there are physical design principles. Sorry, Mr. Chair, someone else has their microphone on, but we're just getting echoed. Yeah, I, I hear you, Councillor Sato. Again, if I could ask one more time, please, if everybody could be sure you are muted if you're not the speaker. Uh, try to finish it off, Nancy. Go ahead. Yep. Physical design standards that are applied by the province, we went over and above that. So the physical design principles that are part of this structure of the Seniors Health and Wellness Village are actually improve 
And how about if I leave it there because it is a little choppy, but those are the two policies that we are working with or against, however you'd like to put it. The one is the actual build of the long-term care home and redevelopment. The other, the other is a physical design layout that we decided to go ahead with. And thankfully, in the case of a pandemic, that physical design will certainly support our residents living in the home and the community that would visit that, that structure. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. A number of my questions have been answered and to try to be concise, I'll just say, first of all, um, thank you very much uh, to um, Councillor Gross for putting the motion forward. I don't know if there's a seconder, happy to second it. Um, if there isn't one, I wanna say thank you very much. And when you look to appendix, uh, appendix, um, Two, which shows an overview of all of the regional advocacy efforts uh, going back to 1998 and then up to 2021. Um, regional councillors and regional staff um, have um, been at the leading edge, and this has already been mentioned by a number of the councillors, uh, have always been at the leading edge. And I do want to say thank you to previous uh, uh, previous uh, terms of councillors uh, for having a mandate at, of being at the leading edge of long-term care uh, and health and wellness for seniors uh, in the region of Peel, because if it wasn't for your advocacy, we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, that being said, uh, to Councillor Santos and Councillor Groves' um, points, and it has been at and has shows through the appendices and in terms of the advocacy, even though we have been leaders and uh, others, other municipalities and other regions have actually uh, used our, um, our leadership model uh, in terms of providing long-term care, uh, dementia care, the butterfly model and, a, and an integrated care model, we have not received our fair share of funding by any stretch. Uh, by any means. Um, so I fully support um, the motion here today and moving forward uh, in terms of advocacy. Um, I do have um, just one question. When, when uh, staff met with me uh, and discussed, um, discussed uh, and broke down and explained uh, what um, uh, Nancy uh, just just um, explained with regards to not fitting into eligibility for uh, a rated uh, a rated homes or um, C being able to access funding for C rated homes or uh, also not having been eligible or receiving any funding for operational support. Uh, one of the one of the um, the asks that I made was that for Nancy, um, and Dr. Saha to explain further um, or, or let me know if there has been any value placed on the beds that are it within communities. So um, the funding mod model that is currently in place uh, places value on um, uh, beds that are within the capital infrastructure. And I believe uh, Dr. Saha, you referenced that that is uh, equivalent to about uh, $250 versus the model that Peel is providing. Um, and if, if there is value and recognition of beds uh, within a community, uh, aging at home, um, the, costs, uh, the costs are about $103 and uh, the long-term sustainability and the value given obviously into the emotional and uh, the emotional care uh, and also the other health and wellness care to the actual um, individual, uh, to their families, and also to um, the staff providing that care within a community is exponential 10 times. Uh, and can be sustained over many more years. So could you please um, just maybe shed a little bit of light around that? Is, is that recognized in terms of the value? Does the province recognize uh, those beds currently within a community aging at home? 
Um, and is this something that we should be somehow advocating for in terms of advocacy for the integrated care model, uh, a new and a new mechanism for uh, the region of Peel to be able to access funding? Through to staff. Yes, Dr. Saha. Uh, certainly, uh, Councillor Fonseca, thank you for that question. Um, the narrative that we're getting from the ministry would suggest that there is an acknowledgement of the fact that this is the direction that they would like to move um, towards. Uh, there was a recent docu document from the National Institute of, Nas National Institute of Aging um, edited by Dr. Simir Sinha, that also acknowledges these figures and also highlights the fact that with the uh, prevalence of the population that we have that is rapidly aging, it is uh, both impossible from a cost perspective as well as from a logistics perspective to continue to build cities and cities of long-term care. So I, I, and I, again, you know, a, a number of these aspects and the, and the, um, the uh, the weaknesses of the system have also been highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, as I've highlighted the majority of deaths that have happened have been in the long-term care sector. So this has also kind of accelerated the demand that we need to acknowledge these things and we need to move to a different mandate of care. Uh, and, and certainly the push is for the development of more uh, community-based infrastructure and providing the supports to seniors at home so that they can age successfully at home. And I would just add that the NIA document that Dr. Saha references does in fact uh, advocate that the province count beds in the community as long-term care beds. Uh, if we just uh, repurpose funds and reshift to an upstream uh, intervention where the supports are brought to people's homes into their own beds, that those in fact can be counted as long-term care beds, but they're not to date. Okay. I would also like to add that the uh, the clinical narrative in terms of the validated literature also supports the fact that when seniors are allowed to age at home successfully, the 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 quality of life that they receive and the uh, the outcomes in terms of overall health measures is better. So I think both of those uh, you know aspirations are merging with this model. Okay, thank you very much. And just one other question, I guess to to well to everyone, Donna. Um, Dr. Saha and uh, Nancy, um, with regards to, there's reference to and um, ongoing discussion um, with regards to Ontario Health. Um, have it, would would a would a joint letter of support um, with regards to recognition of valuing. Um, uh, valuing these uh, beds within the community be something, I, I don't think that that, I know we've had discussion about that um, on the health integration uh, committee. Uh, there's an ongoing discussion and I recognize right now within COVID, uh, everybody's resources are stretched, uh, but at the same time, uh, would there be, would there be value in preparing uh, from an advocacy standpoint a joint letter around that recognition and ensuring that moving forward um, uh, in terms of applying for funding and advocacy for the an integrated care model, that recognition of beds within the communities be, um, be considered and recognized. Yes, I, I would absolutely uh, say that that would be extremely helpful. Um, there is, it, it absolutely has been communicated from the province before the pandemic that the intention for the health system transformation and um, uh, Ontario health teams was to uh, reform our healthcare system so that we worked as one integrated care team together. Um, and this is exactly what we've been uh, uh, trying to do uh, and working towards. And so that advocacy would be very helpful. I think as was presented in the presentation, we find ourselves at a time uh, during a pandemic and a mass vaccination effort and, and a health system transformation where uh, LINs have just been uh, dissolved and Ontario health teams are not mature enough to be fund managers at this point. So it's a, it's, it's a very uh, interesting time uh, to be in seeking funding for this. Okay. Thank you. I, also, I would also like to add that from the clinical front line, that would absolutely be a step in the right direction. Okay. Thank you. My last speaker, Mayor Thompson.
Thank you. So I'm just going to continue on from where uh, uh, Councillor Fonseca was because basically we're on the same page here. Um, going forward, we got the AMO conference in August. I really think this needs to be part of the intergovernmental relations. Uh, it should be key on their mandate. We, Dr. Saha and, and uh, Donna and the whole team, I want to say thank you because you have looked at a model that works the funding, especially with COVID, I think it's COVID stretched or not. I really think this tells us this is the time that we need to push forward on a similar situation of this, because this is a solution of what we've learned that come out of COVID is why this is necessary. And I think the Peel Manor project is a really good project to do, but I think we need to push it from all fronts. I think the advocacy piece, we need to use every avenue we could possibly do to, to push this forward. And Don is quite right. The new health teams, Ontario health teams, are not just yet mature enough to really understand with what we're doing. But Peel's always been recognized as a model leader here. And I really think we need to come out and push on this is how we need to go moving forward. And it's been well thought out. I, I, I think this presentation is really key. And I, I think all of us as council, and I guess, Mr. Chair, coming back to you, do we need to add this as a motion or can we take that as direction that this is an advocacy piece even for intergovernmental relations so that we're pushing on all avenues through AMO, through FCM, through all the connections that we've got? And I, and I believe that's inherent in the motion itself, yes, and your point's uh, doubly well received. Uh, okay, oh, Councillor Vincente's come up. Councillor Vincente. Thank you. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can. Please proceed. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their comments. Uh, both Councillor Santos and I are, are really honoured to be um, the area councillors where this wonderful work is happening. And we support uh, the report, the recommendations. And uh, in terms of the advocacy piece, uh, Mayor Thompson is absolutely correct. We need to keep pushing for all of these different um, aspects of long-term care that require additional resourcing and funds. At the most recent uh, AMO Board of Directors meeting, uh, we discussed uh, the recent, um, um, if I could just refer to my notes, uh, Ontario's long-term care staffing plan. And uh, we made sure that uh, as part of our work from the Regional Appeal to AMO, that we added uh, a piece with respect to uh, increased pay to support the retention of healthcare professionals in long-term care, which uh, from uh, our experience has been one of the challenges in terms of uh, this is a very competitive field where the best professionals can easily be uh, attracted to other healthcare uh, providers. And if we wanna retain the best here in Peel, and in our facilities that uh, we need to make sure that uh, we have the resources to pay staff uh, a co competitive uh, pay. And so that was added to AMO's advocacy piece to the province at our last uh, board meeting. And uh, going forward, uh, Mayor Thompson and members of council as AMO's representative for the region appeal uh, will be sure to push all of the advocacy uh, efforts that we want presented at AMO and presented to the province. Thank you. Thank you. That exhausts my list. I have the motion before me, moved by Grove, seconded by Mayor Crombie. But before I go forward, I didn't know if the acting commissioner had a point of clarity through to uh, Commissioner Lockyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Through you, the existing report at 10.1 in its final paragraph does have a um, a resolution dealing with advocating to the Ontario government and Ontario Health for sustainable operational funding to support the expansion of adult day services programs and respite center at the Seniors Health and Wellness Village. That's already in the staff report. I believe, and I'm just wanting uh, some clarification from Councillor Groves. Councillor Groves, your advocacy that you were referring to was more about um, developing the provincial standards for emotion-based integrated care at traditional long-term care and community-based care to enable seniors to live at home and support their needs. That's what I understand. So um, would you be satisfied with taking that uh, sentence that I just, just referred to and adding it to the existing 10.1? 
I know that there was also some discussions, and I'm just wondering if you're all right. I just wanted to, to point out that there was some request for advocacy in relation to the $30 million for supporting the redevelopment of Peel Manor. And um, I wanted to make you aware that there are existing resolutions for that advocacy, the 30 million, as well as the 4 million in operating funding that have been passed by previous councils and this council in uh, from 2017 to 2019 and was included in the provincial budget submissions in 2019 as well. So there is ongoing advocacy in connection with the capital and operating funding. So with your, um, blessing we'll add that sentence to the existing 10.1 and that is the motion that would be voted on together with what mayor thompson was referring to adding it to the amo uh, advocacy for the conference in august we would take that as direction as a tactic for the advocacy that has been uh, approved if if 10.1 uh, passes is that a fair representation of what it is that you're looking for councillor groves thank you Councillor Groves, is that amenable to you? Um, I just want to for clarification. So I guess what I'm understanding from uh, Catherine is that we're just going to add that to the recommendation in 10.1 and not bother with this motion. A, a second motion is not necessary uh, procedurally because you already have a recommendation and a motion from 10.1. The staff report does have a recommendation in it. So uh, it would be two motions on the same same report uh, doing the exact same thing. You've already asked for advocacy. This is just uh, clarifying what that advocacy means in 10.1, which is the report that outlines everything that Dr. Saha and uh, Commissioner Polsonelli were referring to. Well, I, I guess the reason for my motion is just, you know, as we, we said earlier, Catherine, that we've already done this, we've passed motions, we've sent it to the province and nothing. Um, and I understand the recommendation, I read the recommendation, but I guess the reason for the motion is just because it just strengthens that. So, but if you think that it's duplicating it, that, that's fine, I'll leave it up to the rest of the, um, Council to um, to decide that. So, Councillor Groves, uh, yeah, uh, one more point just to be clear, because the chair needs the definitive motion before me. Back through to uh, Commissioner Lockyer. So the motion would be as it exists in the report at ten point one, with the addition of that the Region of Peel. Um, advocate to develop the provincial standard for emotional based integrated care both in traditional long-term care and community-based care to enable seniors to live at home with the supports they need for as long as possible. So we're adding that as a, as a more fulsome uh, indication of the advocacy that you're looking for. The report itself speaks to, to advocate. This is, this is the particular things that you're wanting to advocate on. Councillor Groves? Okay, I'm, I'm I fine. see you nodding. Okay, so that is the motion before me as clarified by the mover and the clerk. And uh, I'm going to take that vote at this time. Madam Clerk, over to you. Do you need a formal vote? Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, we're voting on the recommendation contained in 10.1 uh, and report at 10.1 with the amendments as clarified. And I'll begin with Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? Yes, thank you. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor DeMurla? Councillor DeMurla? Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? Councillor Downey? Councillor Fonseca? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini? Councillor Groves? Yes, in favor. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? In favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? In favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes, thank you. 
Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? In favor. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? In favor. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? In favor. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? In favor. Councillor Vicente in favor. And that carries. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, you've handed me the, is this a companion motion? That was the, uh, that was the oh, very good. And now a motion to receive the presentation from Councillor uh, Fonseca, seconded by Councillor Groves. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes our, Madam we're good, everything good. So carrying on that dealt with all of the delegates. Thank you to all. All right, item eight, COVID-19 related matters. Our regular update from Dr. Lawrence Slow, our medical officer of health. Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of council. Uh, good morning and uh, really grateful uh, to be here again with uh, Manali Varia and Brian Laundry to provide an update on the COVID-19 response uh, as it is continuing here in the region of Peel. Uh, Certainly, uh, there has been a lot that has changed uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks since we've had the opportunity to speak. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, I'll outline a bit of an agenda. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll walk through the situation update with uh, Manali uh, initially, um, our, and then I will speak to some of the public health measures uh, that have been implemented uh, in respect of um, uh, the stay-at-home order and, uh, and also the school closure that was issued uh, this week, uh, the rationale behind those and, uh, and uh, our perspective and interpretation of that in the context that we're operating in, and then to really speak to uh, the community mass vaccination plan updates. But I will share with uh, you, Mr. Chair and members of Council, uh, that um, when I uh, saw the, uh, when I watched the provincial announcement yesterday, um, I know that many felt, uh, you know, frustration or anger, uh, but I felt a little bit of hope. Um, and the reason being that uh, uh, to the degree that we know that other countries have received vaccines uh, before uh, we did, uh, it very much is almost the exact same playbook uh, that they utilized um, as the third wave was bearing down on them. Uh, we know that we can't vaccinate fast enough to stop the third wave at this point in time, so we do need to still rely on those measures to limit contact and interactions. But in countries such as Israel and the United Kingdom, where a third wave was bearing down just as their vaccination efforts were ramping up, uh, what, what they essentially did was they closed, they vaccinated, and then they moved towards an exit. Um, and so I think it's essentially the same playbook here. We're in a period where we're going from a period of uh, significant vaccine scarcity into uh, a more volatile, uh, but eventually a, a surplus and supply situation, hopefully. Um, and uh, we are also in a situation where, while the vaccines won't prevent this wave, uh, they will hopefully allow us to start gradually reopening um, after this third wave uh, with the confidence that we will not go backwards. So uh, we've seen it in other jurisdictions, and I'm hopeful that this will be the same uh, fate that we can do, that, that, we, that, that will be ours, uh, provided that we're all able to hold on a little bit longer uh, and make it through the next uh, four to six weeks, uh, you know, with the measures and with continuing to ramp up and push people to be vaccinated. So with that, I will thank you and I will push it over to uh, Manali to uh, provide us with an update on the current situation. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, and good morning. Uh, next slide, please. So we're uh, again at a critical point of our response as Dr. Lowe has mentioned, so I'm glad to share the situational update today with Council. We'll start with the overview of trends in COVID-19 incidents across Peel with this slide um, presenting the rate of new cases by week for Peel as a whole, um, which is in the, the thicker black line and by municipality. So the, here the threshold rates uh, under the provincial reopening framework are showed uh, in the colored horizontal lines at the bottom. Um, the weekly incidence rate of the red zone is marked at 40 cases per 100,000, which is about for Peel, about 90 new cases a day. 
So you'll see while we had declined since our January peak of just under 700 cases during the provincial shutdown, we saw this downward trend begin to turn around at the end of February. And that was followed by uh, it is, we are seeing this rapid increase in case counts over the past few weeks. The rapidity of spread is primarily the result of the B117 variant. Um, it's predominant and circulating in Peel. And so Peel's incidence is now similar to December um, prior to the original pr province-wide shutdown on December 26th, which was accompanied by more restrictive public health measures um, than the April 1st emergency break that was announced. Um, as it says on the slide, we are rapidly heading back to peak January levels, our seven-day moving average of the daily new cases is 540 compared to 396 cases one week ago. So that's a 35% increase. Um, we know that the health system capacity in Peel and across the GTA is under significant pressure, um, as was mentioned in a previous presentation. And although ICU patient transfers and other actions are in place to manage the surge, um, this is certainly posing significant challenges. And from a recent presentation uh, at the provincial level from their science advisory table, um, it was shared that across Canada, COVID-19 uh, accounts for the majority of ICU occupants um, which is really uh, challenging to the health system's ability to deal with regular ICU admissions. Next slide, please. So with the variants of concern, uh, the, this picture with the virus is changing daily. Following the announcement of the April 3rd emergency break and the province-wide uh, public health measures, Peel, Toronto and Ottawa's public health units uh, communicated to the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario that stronger measures were required to reverse the surge that our health regions and other health regions are facing. Um, as mentioned, both Peel and Toronto have seen uh, that rapid case growth while still placed in the grey lockdown of the provincial framework, um, just highlighting the need for stronger public health measures, as has been now announced with the April 8th stay-at-home order. And you'll be hearing sh uh, more shortly about the vaccination program rollout, but as Dr. Lowe has mentioned, an honest analysis is that the vaccination alone can't stop the current wave based on both the size of our population that needs to be vaccinated and then the vaccine supply to date. So our actions now are to keep the transmission low to successfully deploy our vaccination program. Next slide. And so last week, the provincial science advisory and modeling tables highlighted the importance of, of what I've just expressed through their modeling data that uh, we're showing here in this slide. So the graph represents total cases in Ontario over time with actual data, which is the bars of daily cases uh, up to April 1st. And so after this period, you can see um, really four different scenarios were modeled by uh, by this advisory group. So the dashed red line shows spread where we do nothing different and you see exponential increase in the cases um, expected or predicted there. In a scenario with only vaccination, which is the solid red line, cases would continue to increase um, in one or two weeks. And then in these other two scenarios, which include stay-at-home orders, it's really that combination of vaccination and measures, um, such as the four-week stay-at-home order shown in, in the, the lime green, um, that are projected to show success in curbing current trends and allowing our vaccination program to continue. Next slide, and I will turn it back to you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you so much, uh, Manali, for that update. Um, so uh, in the context of this situation and the uh, significant case growth, uh, the additional um, unprecedented strain on our hospitals and our intensive care system, uh, which has seen a, a significant rise in um, transfers, uh, ICU uh, utilization, uh, as well as um, as well as additional surgeries that are likely to be cancelled at both sites. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our decision uh, on Redinger on Easter Monday uh, to move schools to uh, online learning. I understand, of course, that this was challenging and uh, resulted in frustration amongst many of the parents and students in our community. 
Um, the decision was not uh, taken lightly. Um, it, uh, you know, and certainly we would have preferred to uh, issue an, an advisory around the shift to remote learning sooner. Uh, but given the number of stakeholders involving, you know, two provincial ministries, uh, two, uh, four uh, school boards, including one which we share a, a boundary with another health unit, Wellington, Duff, and Guelph. Uh, and also trying to coordinate with a number of health units. It took the better part of the Easter weekend to really um, do our due diligence to ensure uh, that we were going forward with uh, a decision of this magnitude. Um, and we, I, I was I'm glad that we were able to get it out on Easter Monday prior to schools returning in our region. Um, in doing so, however, I wanted to reiterate a few things. The strong public health measures that have been implemented by our schools and uh, taken forward by uh, you know, our, our frontline uh, education workers, uh, teachers, uh, they have prevented spread of COVID-19 in the school setting. Uh, what is essentially reflected in schools typically is uh, reflective of what we are seeing in the community. So we, uh, we see cases come into schools, we see exposures occur in schools, but because of the measures that are in place, they typically uh, will prevent uh, significant spread. However, the measures themselves are also not foolproof. They're not 100%. Uh, so in cases where there are lapses or there's, uh, there is um, a situation where the measures didn't necessarily cover things, we were seeing uh, more outbreaks and more outbreak-related cases in recent weeks representing uh, the increased introduction. Uh, similar to long-term care homes, as I've said previously, schools are the same thing. The more cases you throw at them, uh, eventually something's going to get through. Um, and so we had gotten to a point and a threshold of, uh, of our cases uh, where continuing with in-person learning uh, with the measures, uh, we, we realized that the measures, uh, while they are effective at a certain level, uh, may not have been as effective at the current transmission levels that we are seeing in the region of Peel. Uh, however, uh, we are hopeful that this, using these four days for remote learning as well as the spring break, which is scheduled for next week, uh, as a bit of a cooling off period uh, from Good Friday for in-person learning, uh, that there will be an opportunity to return to in-person learning sooner rather than later, as opposed to leaving things on the go and then having to go into in-person learning longer beyond. And we also know uh, that the province's recent announcement to vaccinate educators, which we are still waiting for further information on, uh, may also be another um, a measure that will assist uh, a gradual return to in-person school. So that was uh, that decision, and we'll go to the next slide. So we also know that yesterday the province announced uh, and advanced some of the measures that I had communicated to the Chief Medical Officer of Health together with my colleagues in Toronto and Ottawa. Uh, we do know that they, um, they did move to review the businesses that were uh, and services that were defined as essential by restricting big box stores to uh, essential items defined as grocery items, pet care supplies, household cleaning supplies, pharmaceutical items, healthcare items, and personal care items only and also uh, including capacity limits on businesses that remain open, uh, limiting to 25%, uh, safety supply stores, optical stores, uh, businesses that are selling motor vehicles, boat and other watercraft, uh, vehicle repair and rental and telecommunications retailers. Um, I think that uh, those are the measures that were uh, covered uh, with this in addition to the, the broader stay at home order that was announced by the province. I think, uh, as I mentioned, it was also, uh, you know, welcome that the measures were introduced across the province rather than on a regional basis with a recognition that uh, region hopping uh, has led to uh, exposures and acquisitions outside of the region of Peel uh, that subsequently were included in our case and transmission counts. Uh, in the letter to Dr. Williams, we did also uh, suggest other supportive measures, uh, again, continuing with uh, paid sick days to supplement, supplement existing federal income supports uh, and increased uh, and uh, more consistent vaccine supply for us in the region appeal, as well as travel restrictions between regions within Ontario uh, to really uh, um, encourage individuals to uh, stick to the provincial recommendation uh, to stay uh, local, uh, to make sure that they are not traveling from a high transmission area to a low transmission area. In general, uh, you know, those measures will continue to see whether they are taken up by the province. But as I've mentioned, the overall strategy is really at this point in time, close, vaccinate and exit. And so this, these measures really speak to the closure aspect of trying to bring the current third wave under control by limiting contact and interactions encouraging our residents to stick to the advice of staying home as much as possible, 
uh, hopefully for the last time, uh, by making sure that they're limiting their contact and, and distancing and masking with all precautions, preferring the outdoors to indoors, should they have to meet for any essential reason outside of their home during this stay at home order. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So then this speaks, uh, this slide speaks to the second part of our, uh, of the closed vaccine and exit uh, um, playbook. Uh, and really our vaccination plan has started to take off. Uh, we, have, we are now over 200,000 doses delivered uh, in the region of Peel. Um, and uh, we have now opened all 11 of our community clinics. Uh, that includes uh, our hospital clinics, as well as uh, the seven uh, broad mass vaccination clinics that are available throughout the region of Peel. Um, we have uh, built a mobile clinic model that has been uh, continuing, um, and uh, that uh, that uh, model uh, that that clinic uh, model Brian will speak to. Uh, our mobile clinics have really been focused on outreach to vulnerable residents, congregate settings, including apartments with high proportions of senior and elderly, and also uh, a homebound program which started just in the last uh, few weeks as well. Um, that uh, continues to roll at this point in time. Uh, we have hired over 80% of clinic employees, 1,200 or 1,600, and trained and, uh, and trained many of them in the process of running our mass vaccination clinics and continuing to bring more capacity online as our supply ramps up. We have over 600 physicians that have volunteered to vaccinate in our clinics, um, and we have also trained 255 community volunteers to assist with clinic operations with over 4,000 uh, hours donated to date. TransHealth has helped 445 uh, residents and perhaps more, depending on the number of residents per ride, uh, to get to vaccination clinics. Uh, and we have also continued to answer over 5,000 calls per week and hundreds of community and stakeholder inquiries around the vaccination rollout. And the primary care pilot uh, with 10 sites uh, has completed and pending further uh, supply as it is being received, it will continue to expand uh, to more clinics uh, and more doctor's offices throughout our region. Brian is going to walk us through uh, uh, our overall efforts, as well as to speak to the age-based approach, which will advance to tomorrow on Friday, April 9th, when all vaccine clinics in the region of Peel will begin accepting bookings for residents 50 and older, uh, beginning at 8 a.m. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Brian, and we'll go on to the next one. Thank you, Dr. Lowell, and good morning, Chair Anika and members of council. Today, <clears throat> Excuse me. Today I'm going to update you on Peel's mass vaccination plan, starting with our allocations and capacity. Uh, we're just showing high level uh, numbers here because uh, allocation and capacity are tricky to quantify at any given point in time, given the dynamic nature of supply. So this is uh, presented at a high level. We generally have confirmed allocation out a couple of weeks and then planning numbers for another week or so. And those allocations often change even within that time period. We do not have firm uh, commitments on an anticipated doses beyond April. However, we are preparing for an increase in supply based on uh, the federal government's vaccine contracts and the information uh, on those volumes that we've heard about. One of the challenges is to ensuring that we are uh, to ensure that we are ready for this uh, increase is human resources. It's very difficult to secure staff resources for clinics given the competition across the system and the characteristics of the clinical workforce. Uh, they're part-time, they're casual, they're one or two, uh, take often one or two shifts per week, so often have uh, high sick rates, but as Dr. Lowe has pointed out, we have done a significant hiring and continue to onboard and continue to ramp up that capacity in order to prepare for increased volumes. Uh, also in order to prepare, we're looking to expand our uh, on-site capacity at uh, Save Max and at Paramount and Caledon East uh, to, by increasing number of shifts or in increasing our footprint and also uh, continuously improving our efficiency at all sites. Uh, just speaking to what we may know in May, uh, we're expecting to receive 400,000 doses of Pfizer, but uh, details yet unknown. And of course, there's Moderna and other supplies as well. Next slide, please. 
So the uh, multi-pronged approach to vaccination, as uh, Dr. Lowe referenced, is, is uh, put on this slide. So along the bottom is the percent community uptake and where those uh, each of those strategies are targeted with respect to those who want to receive the vaccine. And uh, we, I referred to these before as the early adopters or those who are ready, willing, and able to be in that first 50 ish percent and then the remaining to be uh, populations that we have to continue to work you through. So this is an overview of the approach to our uh, Peel's population, to vaccinate Peel's population as fast and efficient as possible. Uh, we're planning to move through the five-year age groups at a pace that ensures optimal flow, which estimated at five to seven days. Uh, this approach makes the best use of capacity and resources. Our fixed clinics have been purpose-built this is the most efficient and timely way to vaccinate the remaining population, which will include essential workers, those with high risk medical conditions and those living in high risk communities. We estimate that will happen by early June uh, at a 50% capacity rate uh, with our current uh, volume of 10,000 per day. Uh, but we're ramping that capacity up and it, with uh, increased uptake, which we would hope for through some of the age groups as we go, uh, that, that, could, uh, ex that could either decrease or increase depending, depending on that uptake. And of course, it has to be matched with uh, supply and our ability to control uh, opening eligible uh, age groups. I'll, I'll talk to the cumulative effect of that impact uh, later in the presentation. So fixed sites uh, clinics cover uh, most of the released population. So this is the race to the start line we've talked about. Uh, however, there's a second component to our approach, uh, the race to the finish line, which is where we will get to where we all need to focus on, which is needed to complement uh, this fixed uh, clinic strategy. So those are the other colored uh, Below the, below the fixed clinics, the peach or orange or whatever color that is, pharmacies and primary care, our mobile clinics, which include pop-up and homebound clinics, as well as targeted clinics. Um, and these would be based on needs as informed by emerging information uh, on coverage rates and in consultation with our community partners with whom we've been working. In addition, the province announced uh, yesterday uh, complementary action in the following areas. Uh, they talked about mobile vaccine teams being organized to administer vaccines in high risk workplaces that need to stay open, shelters, residential buildings, community centers, and faith-based locations in the high risk neighborhoods. Next week, special education workers across the province and all education workers in high risk neighborhoods in uh, Toronto and Peel will be eligible for vaccines, followed by a rollout to all education workers across the province. And like Dr. So Lowe said, we're looking for details on that from the province. But as an example, we've been, we've been working with public school boards throughout this pandemic and are currently exploring options of being, uh, whether we can flex up our capacity through our pop-up clinic model to vaccinate uh, school-based special education and development services program staff. So the age-based population health approach is really the fastest, most efficient way to get to both the start line for those that, uh, to get the vaccine as fast as possible. Uh, and also the, it's the faster way to the finish line. It is simple, it's understandable, it respects a prioritization framework, but accelerates moving into eligibility categories much quicker for many essential workplaces. Uh, it's fair and equitable. It gives the system a focus for resources and energy. It removes the drains of competition and complexity, and it releases resources to more quickly increase our focus on our vulnerable and marginalized populations to remove barriers of access. We will continue this cycle by unlocking 50 plus uh, uh, tomorrow, as uh, Dr. Lowe has said, and appropriately messaging the sequential opening of age groups in descending order uh, by age as we move forward. Next slide, please. So the capacity by clinic type, uh, this is to show uh, kind, of, kind of the the, the scope and the uh, a volume of the different sites and the different approaches. Uh, both pro approaches are needed, uh, but this is the fixed uh, site clinics in the top row and the mobile clinics in the bottom row. 
please treat this information as preliminary and approximate. Uh, we're still getting information in uh, on both the uh, both of these models, but it's in int intended to give you that idea of scope and degrees rather than provide exact figures. One correction uh, to the slide, although those are targeted for 20,000 doses for fixed, lights, fixed sites eventually, our mobile clinic target is uh, closer to 700 doses per day by the end of the month and, and growing from there as, as, uh, as much as we can. Both of these uh, models are necessary and complementary. Uh, fixed sites being the most cost-effective and efficient to handle large volumes, and uh, the early adopters and mobile clinics designed to help those with access barriers who need support to receive their vaccine. In addition, fixed site clinics also are better suited to handle the specific requirements for vaccine storage and handling. And uh, just and so, just in summary, we need both these clinics. They have different focus and they have different strengths. Next slide, please. So this slide gives the shows the uh, shows the uh, age-based approach to achieve uh, first dose coverage faster. So on the left-hand column is the age groups uh, by five-year age groups, and on the right-hand column is the estimated population appeal in each of those age groups. So uh, across the top, you'll see the, the different weeks starting with this week and uh, forward into June. Uh, and you can see in the percentages, uh, the percentage of population that are, has either been covered in the case of all those percentages in the first column on April 5th, uh, and then the percentages that we have the capacity to, to vaccinate across our po population age groups as we progress through this model. So just to look at that first column under April 5th, you'll see we've uh, gotten to 60% and 61% in our 80 and our 75 plus populations, 50% uh, or so in a 70 to 74 population, and then the decreasing percentages there uh, as of Tuesday, I believe that figure is. So we continue to, as we continue down through the age groups, the uh, the capacity we have based on the, the size of the population in each age group suggests we can, uh, suggests we can uh, vaccinate approximately 60%, between 60 and 65% of any given age group uh, in a seven day period. And that's only at 10,000 uh, per day capacity. Uh, we're ramping up to 12,500 uh, shortly across our system, uh, and we'll 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 be able to adjust. But no system will work perfectly, so we have to build in some contingency there. And uh, we've talked about some of the limitations of being able to plan this exactly. So these are these are planning figures. And if we get higher uptake, well, th this graph will have to extend uh, a little longer into the into the future. Uh, of course, uh, getting uh, influx of other groups and younger age groups into our age groups we're just opening, such as uh, the number of teachers that could be identified coming, uh, you know, as priorities in the near future. And that will also interrupt this flow a little bit. But this age-based approach is is the way to keep things consistent and get to that end in population as quickly as possible. And in this scenario, and I think this is fairly conservative, uh, at least from the percentage basis, we'll, we'll have reached 53% uh, of our total population uh, with only the 10,000 dose capacity with the 12,500. It'll be closer to 65, 65% um, 65 of our population uh, by the early, by early June, according to this uh, modeling. Next slide, please. So the the one of the initiatives in our multi uh, pronged approach is the hotspot strategy, and this slide provides an overview of work that is underway within Peel's defined hotspot communities. So just take a minute to talk about that. The ministry has identified hotspot communities where provincial and local data demonstrate historic and ongoing high rates of COVID nineteen death and severe illness, as identified through uh, factors such as hospitalization and have been assessed based on factors related to determinants of health, things like lower income, material depravity, and high ethnocultural diversity. Uh, in Peel, we have 25 uh, hotspots as defined by our postal code for forward sortation areas. 
And with uh, and in those 25 FSAs, we have a total of uh, almost 400,000 individuals aged 50 to 79. That represents roughly 25% of the total population. So indeed, they are areas that should be focused and provide a, uh, a large impact on Peel's overall uh, results. Targeted approaches are essential for these communities and a number of principles are being applied to the work we are doing to address systemic barriers to access and the needs of marginalized or vulnerable populations driven by data and local knowledge and local context. We're really pleased to have the support of members of our community equity and engagement advisory table who represent many community agencies and many focused on supporting uh, these very populations uh, and, have it, and they have shaped our approaches from uh, their insights. We will continue to work closely and seek their direction as well as support them in their direct engagement efforts, recognizing they are our most trusted messengers and partners in implementation. Few of the key actions already underway include a strong emphasis on grassroots mobilization and community-led approaches, which is meeting our most vulnerable where they are at, removing significant barriers to access in these areas through programs like our homebound vaccine strategy and our transportation assistance program, supporting ambassadors and influencers within communities with accurate information, steady and constant conversations, leveraging trusted messengers exploring specialized mobile clinics and safe familiar settings for vulnerable populations who may feel unsafe visiting a mass clinic, such as uh, working into community hubs and faith-based locations. And then focusing on longer term issues of vaccine confidence through targeted approaches and co-designing solutions with those most impacted. Next slide, please. As we move through the prioritized groups rapidly, our outreach efforts are a continuous 24 seven effort and conversation with the community. Our integrated communications approach uses 360 degree model that allows for a consistent and cohesive message across many and all platforms. It combines multiple integrated strategies, including those uh, around that circle earned media through media releases, interviews with Dr. Lowe and at clinics with Paul Sharma, out of home or outdoor advertising, such as over past billboards, municipal screens, bus shelters, convenience stores, print advertising in newspapers in, in, in multiple languages, email campaigns through our own resident newsletter and with partners. Website, this is a constant multi-time per day update, uh, active dynamic process, social media, and, and so on. I won't go through them all. But multicultural communication is also achieved by a number of things. Collaboration with community task forces for planning, validation, and support, translating materials uh, prep in terms of preparation and distribution, and proactive media pitching to community, community media outlets. Next slide, please. So this is uh, that's a slide to to just to outline the challenges and barriers. You know, it's important you are aware of what these are and uh, how they can impact on our, our on Peel's mass vaccination plan. So under the heading of communication and issues management, there is obviously public confusion and mixed messaging related to eligibility. And certainly over the last day, we've experienced that in uh, large quantities. It creates a huge burden on our call center and our, uh, and our comms teams to try to uh, work through the messaging and provide as much clarity as possible. There's a number of comparisons with, pub with other public health unit partners or public health units, uh, period, and other jurisdictions. Uh, that, that's good in that it provides some opportunity for ideas, but uh, frankly, uh, rarely bears fruit and it rarely is a, uh, the rarely is the grass uh, that much greener on the other side of the fence. There's vaccine confidence in shopping. It adds complexity to planning and operations as people uh, cancel appointments because they're trying to get a, a vaccine of their preference. There's volatility of vaccine supplies. So that, as you know, this is managed federally and provincially. Uh, we're trying to advocate for a steady supply and a, an enhanced supply to meet our uh, needs under our uh, age-based approach. Uh, but there's, and, and there's variable uptake. We can't predict how, how each eligible population can, will uptake on the, on the vaccine 
and we have to, that's a bit of a, an art and a science as we see how those percentages unfold. Uh, of course, the provincial COVAX vaccine appointment booking system is uh, provincial, it's controlled by the province. It really limits our ability to make changes such as el eligibility by age when we wanna open new age groups and uh, to flex our appointment bookings up or down depending on vaccine availability, clinic capacity, variable uptake. So all those factors that move the needle up and down and, and we don't have a, a control over. It, ha it has its benefits in the long run. It will be the simplest to, to hit the huge volumes of by age uh, and get booked second appointments and manage the system that way. But un unless, until we get a little more control over it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And then uh, it also has limited reporting and data analytic capabilities. Staffing is uh, something I have to keep, uh, keep bringing to your attention. It's a major issue for clinic operations and for expansion. Uh, a lot, many of the clinical staff are part-time. There's high absentee rates. There's competition for these staff. They're, they're, cl they're clinical. They're, many of the acts are delegated acts. They have to be uh, healthcare providers to, pro to, provide, to um, provide those acts in, in those uh, within the clinics. Uh, and, and most of the time they're, they're all, given their healthcare workers and we're in the midst of this of a worldwide pandemic, they're, they're in uh, high demand by many people and we're often getting uh, one or two shifts a week and, and it's a flexible workforce. So it's, it's really challenged our human resources planning and our, our staff are continually uh, working to improve this as much as we can. And as I said, we've we really worked hard to build up our capacity and continue to look for strategies to make this uh, the workplace of choice. Uh, but the, there's a uh, uh, scheduling and team it's team burnout are realities. And you know, there's I, I think uh, I see AO Janice Baker put it best. It's like we're at the 10 mile mark of a 26 mile marathon and and we're burnt out, but we we can't quit. So, uh, but that doesn't mean people don't drop off along the way and we are, we experience that, which is another reason uh, to uh, just to focus on a simple approach an age-based strategy, which is the simplest and fastest and keeps us on track and focused. Um, continuous operation process and flows. We've taken a continuous improvement approach and will constantly adapt to improve. And although our flow is usually pretty good, uh, sometimes uh, it can appear to be backed up and, and there's lineups outside of our clinics. Uh, people come early for appointments. Uh, usually they bring someone with them. Uh, the appointment blocks are such that 70 or 80 are booked in, in a given 10 minute or 15 minute time frames in intervals. So people come at the same time. Uh, like I said, they come early and then with physical distance, uh, uh, distancing that really extends those lines. But for the most part, those lines move very quickly and our processes are, are, are smooth and improving. So just before I turn it over to Lawrence, who's going to speak about some of the immediate priorities to manage some of these issues, uh, I would like to thank all of those who support this work. It really is uh, tremendous work. Um, COVID exerts a relentless pressure and we cannot get to the finish line as quickly as any of us would like, uh, but we have a plan and the plan is working. Uh, last council, I presented the phenomenal impact the vaccine program in long-term care had in reducing outbreaks and cases in our most vulnerable population. Today, the integrated response table sunsetted. That table brought to, uh, came together a year ago to and brought together system partners across the region and the province, our hospital partners, public health, Ontario Health uh, in the region to tackle the catastrophe of outbreaks, deaths and illness in long-term care. And a year ago was meeting daily. And so the fact that it's no longer needed is, is, uh, is a testament to the work that the system has done and to, and quite frankly, uh, the, the, the vaccine program in these uh, institutions, in these uh, places of residence. So there is an end, we have a plan, and together we will get there. Dr. Lowe. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, and we'll go to the uh, next slide or around challenges, uh, next slide around immediate priorities. Uh, so, uh, in addition, so I, I would echo uh, what Brian just shared, the sunsetting of the long-term care integrated response table, it represents a significant milestone, it represents uh, 
uh, the, the uh, plummeting uh, that we've seen of outbreaks in our long-term care settings, uh, you know, thanks to the high rates of vaccination coverage that we've achieved there. Uh, the plan that Brian has outlined, and particularly moving down the age brackets uh, very quickly, um, making the most of the capacity in the system that has been built uh, to get us through to May, while also using the other prongs, our very immunization strategy, uh, to um, continue to uh, reach optimal levels of coverage across and to, to, su to supplement and support uh, the ongoing uh, mass vaccination efforts will hopefully get us to the same point where uh, insofar as we've been able to demobilize the IRT in respect to long-term care, we will also be able to demobilize um, the ongoing emergency response as our community starts to see a shift in transmission patterns. But to get there, there are a number of challenges uh, and priorities that Brian has highlighted. Um, we really do need to continue monitoring uh, the situation and ensuring that the measures and the restrictions that are put in place um, are uh, adhered to as much as possible. You know, people always talk about the need for hope uh, in the community, and I think there is a lot of hope. Um, we are seeing our vaccine supply increase. As you heard, we have capacity already, and that is capacity conservative estimates through to mid-May, but we're bringing more and more capacity online every day, every week. Uh, so there, there is, uh, you know, just in the time being for people to really adhere to the staying home, the limiting of contact interactions, uh, this is kind of the, the last hurrah, as it were, uh, to really make sure that we can close, vaccinate, and exit. Uh, we do continue with our high-risk contact uh, case, uh, case management and contact uh, tracing, our outbreak management. That is crucial to ensuring the success of reducing the third wave in our community uh, and also um, uh, ensuring the success of our vaccination efforts. Uh, we are uh, continuing to open vaccine uh, to additional population uh, down through age brackets, but also uh, in coordination with the province, uh, other priority groups that have been identified as announced yesterday, such as essential workers, teachers, hotspot areas, etc. Uh, we continue to negotiate for stable supply, um, which the province has shown receptivity to, as well as an ability to manage the provincial booking system so that we can chart our own course and chart our own uh, our own uh, gating and releases uh, in line with our own operations. Uh, in respect of those operations, we continue to prioritize optimizing our vaccine clinic operations with process improvements, uh, alignment of capacity to maximize vaccine usage and minimize wastage, uh, to stabilize schedules and staffing, and to uh, ensure that we have control of the booking system to give us the ability to book appointments further out. Uh, we continue to maximize our public communication efforts to be proactive in minimizing confusion, focusing on priorities, making sure that we're sticking to the plan and getting through as quickly as possible, uh, following the fastest path to community immunity uh, that is before us with what has been built and the, and the system that's in place. Of course, with the continued focus on the most vulnerable and providing them with modalities, uh, as well as outreach to address uh, individual needs of support, as well as address uh, vaccine confidence. Um, and then finally, managing a burnout and balancing stretched resources amongst our staff across uh, both the vaccine, vaccination response but the ongoing COVID-19 response and also uh, managing ongoing critical programs in public health as well as across the region. So we'll go to the, the final slide and I will just say uh, we are at a very critical juncture with the increase in variants of concern and the frustration uh, with the measures that are in place uh, and our resources being strained to a maximum. However, I am hopeful uh, because uh, you know vaccination is here and while it will need time to be successful, uh, it will position us well uh, to ultimately prevent a fourth wave and hopefully exit uh, into a post-pandemic epoch. Um, you know, the reality is that this third wave is here. It's being driven by the variants and the vaccination. Even if we were to vaccinate everyone today, uh, would be unable to stop uh, what is happening right now in our hospitals and through our community. Um, but uh, this is really uh, one large, uh, giant collective community effort uh, to overcome the challenge, to stay home, to get the shot when it's our turn, and then to ensure uh, that we're keeping safe until we can move uh, gradually out of this final, uh, what I hope will be a final closure. So I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and all of Council for your leadership and support, and myself, Manali, and Brian are all here uh, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and thank you for the presentations, but just in terms of time management, I see it's 12.20. I have a list of 
10 speakers, which I don't think is going to take 10 minutes. The team here hasn't had a break, and I know we have the whole agenda to deal with. I'm wondering if this might be the appropriate time to give the team here a break and then start up with our questioners, because I'm sure it's, and we have the whole agenda before us. So I'm, I'm going to suggest that we will break now till 10 to 1, so 30 minutes. We will see you back at 12.50, and we'll get to the list of questioners, and I'm sure it's going to be a fulsome discussion. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome back. We're back in session, uh, carrying on with the conversation regarding COVID. I've got the team here ready to answer questions, and my list is Crombie, Brown, Raz, Dasco, Thompson, Parrish, Fonseca, Sado, Demerla. Mayor Crombie. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Lowe. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, there are a lot of people on the board, so I will be brief, and I won't uh, go into areas where I know other people. Uh, are going to ask you questions. So first, congratulations on moving down to 50 plus. That's great news for everyone. Uh, I'll say that I'm supportive of everything you've been doing. Um, my only comment would be, uh, I would have preferred if the parents could have gotten a little more heads up on the decision. But nonetheless, I know you have to do what you think is right. So, um, so yesterday, the province made a lot of announcements. They actually shook up the framework significantly, moving out of the age cohort-based uh, framework and into, you know, high-risk areas, individual high-risk neighborhoods, individuals who are high-risk, et cetera. So they did announce uh, vaccinations for 18-plus in high-risk neighborhoods in, in Toronto and in Peel, including teachers. And I wonder, how does one, I'm going to ask for everybody because everyone's been asking me, how does one register if you're 18 plus and in a high risk or priority neighborhood? So uh, through the chair uh, to Cal uh, Mayor Crombie, thank you for the question. Uh, we're still waiting for further uh, information from the province around their uh, mobile hotspot strategy that they announced yesterday. Um, as we understand it, they are in the midst of assembling uh, mobile teams that will go into identified hotspots, uh, and it will not be involved as a, as a registration. These will be pop-up clinics that, uh, as, as far as we can tell, uh, people will show up at and presumably be registered into the provincial booking system at the time, and then uh, vaccinated, but uh, we don't have full confirmation of that at this time, and we're still waiting for details of this mobile program from our provincial partners. Sounds like they need an awful lot of mobile programs. There are going to be questions from other councillors on mobile programs. I know that you know that motions were passed both in Mississauga and in Brampton yesterday, and I'll allow those councillors to ask those questions. That's not where I'll go with you. I, I do want to note that they finally closed the non-essential aisle in the big box stores, and, you know, that's something at least the mayors have been advocating for for a long time. It does lend itself to a lot more fairness and a level playing field. Um, Dr. Lowe, uh, one more thing, and this is maybe a little bit controversial. Um, so there was a rather unflattering article published yesterday. From your perspective, can you let us know uh, the facts? Uh, so uh, thank you, um, Madam Mayor, and through you, Mr. Chair. I believe if you're uh, referring to a news article in respect of the Amazon closure and uh, what happened in that instance uh, was at the time when we closed Amazon, uh, the province's own prioritization framework was in phase one, and the directed provincial priorities were long-term care and retirement homes, seniors 80 plus, frontline healthcare workers, and also Indigenous and Indigenous adults. And so when we closed Amazon on March 12th, we received a reach out from the province to offer us 5,000 doses uh, in a bid to get the plant up and running again. From a medical perspective, getting people vaccinated even over that weekend would not have reopened the plant because the transmission within the facility was widespread, which is what necessitated the closure in the, in the instance. Uh, it meant that you needed to have that two week cooling off period regardless. Um, and it also meant that uh, those workers would have been incubating and they wouldn't have derived protection from the vaccination uh, for two to three weeks anyway. I also had concerns, especially given that we had only just started vaccinating 80 plus in our community. Uh, I had questions as to how it would appear if we were favoring uh, this one company and plant uh, for vaccination ahead of the many seniors who at the time when we were still seeing the non-variant of concern coronavirus still predominant, we knew that our seniors, and we continue to know that even now with the variants of concern, that our seniors represent the greatest risk of mortal and severe outcomes. 
And we also know that the province's own ethical framework said uh, at the time and continues to say that in a situation where vaccine supplies are limited, you must prioritize every dose possible to those who are at the greatest risk of death and hospitalization. And that is what we did. Uh, on top of that, and, and um, through, you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Madam Mayor, I think Council is also well aware that we had been very closely with our hospital partners uh, tracking our vaccine allocations. Uh, and in a provincial meeting that weekend, uh, just shortly after that 5,000 dose offer was received, uh, we noted an 80,000 dose shortfall based on the planned and received allocations to Peel on a per capita basis. So we actually took that information as well as the offer that we received from the province and together with Michelle Demanuel and Nabeed Mohammed, we went to the ministry to demand and secure our fair share, which led to a commitment from the ministry to increase our supply in the tune of tens of thousands of doses at all of our clinics, which has been received over the past few weeks and into the next two weeks of April. So I think the real story here is that we were operating within the province's own ethical and prioritization framework, which called for us to prioritize seniors at the time and we took an offer of 5,000 doses that wouldn't have reopened Amazon in any case in order to get our fair share from the province at a magnitude of almost 10 more times instead. And I think I would just close by also saying that I think my public representations to date have highlighted my significant concerns around our essential workforce and the risk that they've borne throughout this pandemic, particularly the need for paid sick days, better protections for temporary agency workers, proactive workplace inspections, et cetera. And I am supportive of vaccinating such workers, such as prioritization by the province and supply permits. I know that the recent announcement by the province provides us with that opportunity. And I will also highlight that essential worker vaccination continues to be a focus of our discussions with the ministry and also with all of the boards of trades and economic development offices in our region. We are looking at how best we can operationalize what was announced yesterday, what we will be receiving from the province, and also further information on the province's announced mobile strategy to augment our efforts. So I'm really grateful, uh, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity to clarify the facts on this matter and continue to work in focusing on uh, the prioritization that the province itself has laid out and also getting to uh, the numerous workplaces and essential workers in our region as part of the rollout. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. I thought that was, uh, you took, we took the doses and applied them to where it was most needed according to the framework. They did not go wasted, which was implied. Uh, so that we're very grateful for that. And frankly, those people were in quarantine uh, and weren't eligible to get their vaccine at that time when you close that plant that meant that they were in a two-week quarantine so they couldn't go out um, and receive their dosage so thank you for that are you satisfied that adequate supplies are now coming in so that we can service all the many groups that we have identified as next in line so uh, through the chair to Mayor Crombie, uh, we are uh, certainly uh, receiving those doses that were pr uh, promised as a result of those, um, as a result of that advocacy uh, following that uh, closure and that offer that was received. Um, and we have assurances in working with our ministry partners that we will continue to receive uh, more uh, doses uh, in recognition of our hotspot uh, situation and, and status here in the region of Peel. So thank you. I'm not going to go on any further because there are a lot of people on the board, but I do know that you're going to start to hear a lot of pressure about vaccinating our, you know, our essential workers. And that's so important to us, as you know, both all our councils have passed those motions. So I'll pass on the baton. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Love. Thank you, Mayor Crombie. Mayor Brown. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lowe, for your detailed uh, presentation today. And um, I won't be repetitive of the themes that uh, Mayor Crombie uh, brought up because we're working on those um, together. Um, I would just add, though, that uh, um, I really believe you did take the right decision when it came to uh, Amazon. I felt a lot of the public felt that these large international companies were allowed to operate unabated and there was sort of a special rule for them and a different rule for everyone else. And I think um, the strong position you took on Amazon, um, closing them, saying that they had to get under control, uh, sent the right message and it was the right thing to do uh, in terms of uh, public health. For, for So for what it's worth, I just wanted to uh, add my uh, sentiments uh, that, that, that you took the right uh, approach. Uh, I think all our advocacy on essential workers and the need for vaccines in the hotspots has been um, gaining traction. As they say, the squeaky wheel gets attention. And really yesterday's announcement um, was a significant reply uh, to our plea for, for help. And I know so many times you have said, if you protect 
the hot spots, you protect the rest of the province. By protecting Toronto and Peel, you protect the rest of the province. You get this fire under control, it doesn't spread. And so um, well done on um, the collective advocacy to, to raise this issue. But I do think we need to, to stay on it um, aggressively. And I know a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, vaccine percentages. Peel, I believe, had 20% of the COVID cases in the province, 10%, 10.5% of the population. Um, and at one point it was 7% of the vaccines. Then another point it was 9% of the vaccines. Is it possible to sort of get a weekly update on those on those numbers? And so we can make sure that if if we're not getting what we feel is equitable, that, that, that we can turn up the, uh, the, the, the noise once again? You know, do we have access to that type of data and... Um, uh, I, I know yesterday there was a call from a media outlet asking what I thought about Kingston having 25% of the their population vaccinated versus what we had in Peel. And so, you know, sometimes I hear these stats the first time from the media when they ask me, it would be great to be armed with all the data ourselves. So uh, through the, the chair to uh, Mayor Brown, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we do provide that number on our weekly um, immunization updates in terms of the number of doses received and administered. Uh, we can try to see if it's uh, some way for us to situate it in the overall uh, picture of uh, comparisons with municipalities. Uh, one situation that we have in Peel as compared to Toronto, uh, similar to Toronto and other large jurisdictions, is that the um, approach of our vaccine program has been to vaccinate individuals who live or work in Peel, um, and especially with the healthcare worker um, uh, piece, uh, the, the, what's happened is um, we've also vaccinated people who may not be Peel residents, but here in Peel because they work either in our hospitals or in a healthcare system. Toronto has the exact same issue. So, uh, whereas a jurisdiction like Kingston may have a fairly well contained population, uh, we on occasion, our, our coverage rates will necessarily look a little less than them, at least with the priority populations that have gone before, um, because we're doing live or work in Peel. Um, ultimately, I think that's the best strategy because it actually helps to protect our population overall, knowing that these people work in our long-term care homes or, uh, you know, are, you know, are supporting our residents in hospitals, et cetera. Um, but it will make the coverage numbers that you're describing, at least in respect to Kingston, look a little different uh, because many of those people that do get covered end up, they may work in Peel, but they may not live here. Um, I think uh, the other thing that I would say, uh, Mayor Brown, in respect of the uh, essential worker question, uh, we are very keen to hear from the province uh, a little bit more about their mobile strategy, their pop-ups. I think we would certainly welcome it as an adjunct to uh, the mass clinic strategy that Brian outlined. Uh, but I think we uh, we definitely know um, that uh, uh, we, we definitely know that as as Brian outlined, if we stick to the plan and we continue to move uh, quickly uh, through the age groups uh, through the mass vaccination capacity that has been. Uh, developed, that is the fastest and surest way that we will be through our population, through the bulk of our population quickly, and to the extent that we can then also have that support from the province uh, to get to hotspots, to get to workplaces with essential workers, and also, uh, you know, using our own mobile modalities to do so, uh, those would be important adjuncts to our plan to really try to make sure that we're pushing arms to needles uh, in our mass clinics. Uh, and I just did a quick calculation on the table uh, that Brian provided, and I'm happy to provide this today. Um, in terms of our 60 plus population as a whole, we have vaccinated 40% of them. So if you're talking about uh, the over, like if you take the, all those age groups and compress it down, we're at 40% of the 60 plus bracket covered, which is a significant milestone, knowing that that's the population that has the most significant risk. And also knowing that 40% is where you start to see uh, some changes in patterns of transmission, which I think is, is a really important milestone to mention here in the region of Peel as well. So it's important to continue with the mass strategy and moving down to age categories, augment it with a focus on essential workplace uh, workers and the mobile uh, uh, pieces there and also to know that our continued effort to cover both people who live and work in Peel will make our coverage numbers specific to residents look a little bit different uh, than elsewhere. And I would add, uh, Dr. Lowe, that I mean, look at the, the total numbers. I'm sure there's a lot of Peel residents as well that use the pharmacy service in um, in Toronto and so some of our numbers um, could be in 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 Toronto's and so um, you know that blurs it a little bit too but 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 I do think having that data will will um, will give us a better indication of of how we're doing it if we're getting an equitable share of, of of vaccines do you know what the current status is right now in terms of our percentage of vaccines based on the provincial um, allocation 
So through the chair to Mayor Brown, I understand we are sitting at just over 9%, which is uh, you know, around the 10% that we would be expecting to get uh, of our community with a significant, as I mentioned, the allocations that we secured following the Amazon offer. Uh, we are ex anticipating significant allocations both this week and next week that will probably bring us up to the 10% mark. And, and I'm glad to hear that it's coming, but that in itself is unbelievable that, uh, you know, and, and thank goodness we did the advocacy we did, but the fact that we're still at 9%, the fact we're still under per capita, despite being one, if not the most significant hotspot in the country, that the fact that we're under per capita makes me want to pull my hair out. And so um, it, it shows the noise that we raised and the fuss we made, um, boy, boy, was it was it right. It, it's, you know, to be close to uh, our per capita, we shouldn't even be close, we should be significantly over. Um, so I, I know I'm sounding frustrated, and I know you would welcome any vaccine supply you can get, but um, that number should be a reminder of, uh, of the work we have to do to our provincial representatives to say, that um, that supply, that allocation, boy, does that need to fix uh, be fixed quickly. And I would just say one last thing, and I know there's a long list of speakers. Um, Mayor Crombie has said it on the mobile units to essential workers. Um, you know, thank you for Carolyn Parrish and Council Medeiros for putting um, a focus on this. Um, I'm hearing that left, right, and center from our board of trade and from our businesses. And so, when the province does come out with the details, I would, I, I know you're going to welcome it with open arms. But uh, I would just say, the sooner, the faster, the better. Um, we need it, and uh, there'll be no vaccine hesitancy. You know, I, I'm hearing from companies saying that that, that they can get it set up. Uh, um, quicker than you can imagine. Uh, so um, I, I really think there'll be a willing partners on those mobile units. So thank you so much for your ongoing work, Dr. Lowe. Thank you. And if I could just very quickly before I go to Councillor Rass, uh, Mayor Brown to you and Mayor Crombie, uh, for those of us that sit in on the mayors and chairs calls, a big shout out to the two mayors because if not but for your advocacy, I have no idea where we'd be. Uh, short of stammering on the tables and, and wrenching the Premier personally, Mayor Crombie and uh, Mayor Brown civilly but forcefully have put this cause forward for months. And Mayor Brown, you say it so well. After all of that, we're barely where we're supposed to be. I shudder to think where we wouldn't have been if not for your forcefulness. So I want your constituents and all the good people of Peel to know that. Moving on, Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lowe, uh, to you and your team for the update today. And I know we're going to spend a lot of time on it this afternoon, but I think it's well worth it. Um, uh, without repeating anything else that's already been said, uh, I I understand that um, the ramping up of vaccinations for 18 plus will be in postal codes that are considered a hot zone. The problem is there's only a few postal codes that are not in the hot zone, and uh, I know that uh, there's quite a big chunk in Wards 1 and Wards 2. Uh, I won't speak for Councillor Dasko. I know he's up shortly. But in terms of consistency, we've talked, I mean, for, for months we've been talking, you know, separate Mississauga out of the Peel decision, so either we're in this together or we're not in this together. I just I just need some consistency. Um, and I know that when, so for example, there, there aren't that many grocery stores down in the south. I know people do go north and west for groceries. So we know that the people within those areas are still traveling to those hot zones. Can we... Yeah. What what are we doing to resolve that and bring some consistency to this rollout? Because it's causing so much confusion as well. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to Councillor Rez, thank you for the question. I, I can tell you that uh, myself and the hospital CEOs have been in uh, constant conversation with the ministry, uh, recognizing that 25 of our 33 FSAs are classified as high risk uh, under the province's framework. We have requested that Peel as a whole community uh, be considered as a high risk community and uh, and therefore, uh, you know, speaking to uh, what you're saying, just consistency across the region. Um, that's in line with my previous positions that have been taken in respect to measures, and I'm hoping that the ministry will grant uh, that consideration in uh, in respect of our, our vaccination rollout as well. Okay, thank you. So more to come on that. Um, another question with respect to postal codes. I have a community, it's called Park Royal, and it's right on the border of Oakville. And some of the people registering uh, for the vaccinations are being sent to Halton. Can they go get vaccinated in Halton? Is that okay? I, I think they were worried that if they show up for their Halton vaccination, they're going to see a Mississauga address and be and be turned away. So, what is the best approach for those people? 
Uh, so uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and just so I get this right, because I, I can't quite speak, uh, Council Raz, for what Halton's policies are, but I can speak for what appeals are. And so, Brian, are you able to talk a little bit about what we're doing in respect of, uh, of yeah, this? Yeah, they try to register on the provincial system and it sends them to Halton. Yes. Yes. Uh, can, can you hear me, Lawrence? Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Raz, and through the Chair. Uh, they, they they should not have any barriers to to getting vaccinated in Halton. The provincial system opens uh, vaccination sites for a hundred kilometer radius from uh, from from the location of where the individual uh, lives. So uh, the the policies uh, should allow for them to be vaccinated in Halton, as as my understanding. And that's okay. certainly and that's certainly our understanding. Well, as well for people coming to Peel. Okay. Perfect. Um, a couple of, uh, I think it was last meeting and the meeting before, we talked about a council or portal um, for information. I haven't been able to see it or didn't see a notification. Is, is that up and running? So through you, Councillor Raz, I agree. I actually have not received an update on that portal for quite some time as well. So what I can commit to, I will take that back to my team and make sure that that portal is uh, it has either been available or launched. I will uh, I will double check, but I realize in the midst of all the other things going on that it's something that I haven't followed up on. So thank you, and I'll bring yeah, that back to the team. We get so many questions that if we have the right information, we can certainly uh, not, uh, we can relieve staff of having to answer some of those questions. So we're we're happy to help out as well. Um, it was kind of addressed, but I'm just wondering what can we do about uh, people who don't make their appointments? Um, is, you know, can, can people show up towards the end of the day if, and if there's excess uh, vaccine, it's first come first serve. I mean, what, what can we do there to, to make sure that we use up the vaccine and get, you know, jabs in arms as quickly as possible? Yeah, so uh, through the chair to Councillor Raz, uh, we follow a, a very strict zero wastage policy in the clinics right now, and we're kind of uh, constituting it as we go. Uh, so if someone doesn't show up, uh, that's accounted for in the in the constitution just to make sure we're not left with a, a whole ton of doses at the end of the day. Um, we have had a, an internal standby list that was targeted at phase one priority populations uh, previously that were that were either employees or uh, you know like within the region or, or related services. Um, I do know that there was a standby by plan that uh, was going to be launched. And so maybe I'll pass it to Brian to just advise where that is right now. Hi, thank you, Dr. Lowe and uh, Councillor Raz through the chair. Uh, we, we do have standby policy. We've been operating it sort of on a paper-based uh, site-by-site basis uh, at the current time. Uh, we're trying to get it into an IT system and it's still going to respect the prioritization framework. So we'll be able to identify either those that are already eligible that are uh, that haven't yet come in and have indicated that they'd be willing to come in at short notice, uh, which we've done kind of, uh, you know, anyway, but we'll make it more uh, robust through the IT system. And please, no first come, first serve. We only have so much security. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I was just checking and maybe a little bit more hopeful. Um, for the homebound uh, seniors or those with um, physical ailments that don't allow them to get out of their home, what, uh, where are we with, with rolling that out and how can people sign up once it's going to be in place? So through the chair uh, to Councillor Raz, this program has launched and I will pass it to Brian to share the details of where we're at. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Raz, and through the chair. We, yes, we've launched our homebound uh, uh, vaccine strategy. We've only uh, had the opportunity to do uh, a few to date, but we have uh, we're, we've got the process in place. We're uh, ramping up our mobile teams. Uh, we're ensuring our vaccine supply. Uh, we've worked with our partners that, that would be refer referring into the program. Uh, and there is a self referral option, and uh, the that call number, I believe, is on our website today. Okay, thank you. I will pass that along. Last question to Dr. Lowe. Um, I read today that uh, Canada has tripled the P1 variant um, more than the U.S. Can you take us through how that has happened? Is it as a result of vaccination or just the this particular variant has gone through Canada? How does that happen, given we, we, were, we were not so envious of the U.S. a few months ago and now we have vaccination envy. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, through the chair to Councillor Raz, uh, the, this really reflects the nature that the COVID-19 uh, situation in Canada is really an agglomeration of all the different outbreaks that are occurring uh, from coast to coast. Uh, and I, I shouldn't say it's a coast because there's nothing in the north right now. Um, but uh, but at least in the west coast in British Columbia, they have a significant issue uh, with the P1 variant, which is fast becoming the dominant variant out there. And we're certainly concerned about the P1 variant. Uh, it is, uh, in addition to being more severe and more transmissible, there is some question or whether it can partially escape uh, the vaccination, which is which would not be good, obviously. Uh, here in Ontario, the variant of concern that we are uh, that we are most faced with is B117, which was the variant that was originally identified in the UK, and that makes up almost 70% of our vaccines at this pro at this time. But uh, we do know that um, BC's picture specific to P1 is quite unique, and we're all watching that very carefully because. Um, we are hoping that that will be brought under control in, in very short order, and I suspect is what led to uh, some of the increased enhanced provincial measures in British Columbia uh, that were brought down recently. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dasko. Thank you to the Chair, and I wanted to say uh, uh, I, I appreciate the the, uh, the presentations that both of you have done, and, uh, and a lot of the work that's gone into this to date. Um, I couldn't imagine it's uh, it's talk about overwhelming. I also want to thank Karen Raz for bringing up some of the points that she did with regards to uh, what we're going uh, and what we're dealing with down in, uh, in southern Mississauga, where there is a significant uh, older population and uh, those that, uh, quite frankly, feel disconnected still from uh, ways to get to injection sites and things like that. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask, I guess, a little bit of clarification because I think this is the biggest issue that everybody right across the province is running into is this confusion. Uh, and, and, and quite frankly, you know, I, I can't say that it's, uh, it's on your behalf, Dr. Lowe. I know that you're trying to do what you can, but uh, just stressing to the province to come out with basically Less is more, uh, and, and just giving us, you know, just the facts, man, kind of thing, you know. Um, part of that is, for example, the hotspot locations. Uh, people are asking me, okay, so if I book through the province, and can I, come Friday, can I get my 50 plus? Then somebody says, well, you know what, if I went through, um, if, if I went through the Trillium site, then I can book anywhere uh, in, you know, if I happen to be in Mississauga, I can book anywhere uh, come Friday if you're 50 plus. I mean, so I, I'm getting confused now at this point. So if you're able to provide a little bit of clarity on that, that would certainly be great. And also just with regards to, uh, so that's my one question. The second question I do have is with regards to the mobile uh, situation. And as you know, I've got uh, the fairways in, uh, in Mississauga, you know, down on, on Dixie, uh, where 70% plus of that community is is uh, our seniors, with a lot of folks that are terrified to go out, especially like I mentioned, wheel trans and things like that. People saying, "Oh, I don't want to get in that. You know, I could get infected in, in, in the wheel trans, uh, you know, uh, component of it." So I'm just wondering, when will we see that rollout happening? when they'll start getting to some of the apartment buildings, and say, uh, Peel Living Buildings and, and what have you, uh, and, and condos that uh, where people really can't get out. So those are my two questions, if I could. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Through the chair to Councillor Dasko. On the second question, I'm going to, to just share that. So the mobile clinic, uh, the mobile uh, modality that we have been running has been going to settings like that. Um, I don't know where whether Fairways was prioritized or where, but the priority was really targeting uh, seniors, apartments with lots of seniors or large uh, condominium buildings with lots of seniors in hotspot areas initially. And as I mentioned, obviously all appeal is a hotspot, but there were additional um, gradations even within hotspots that were used to, to target that modality. So uh, I'll answer this, the first part of the question and I'll give it to Brian uh, to talk a little bit. I think they had identified 120 such uh, locations. I think they're halfway through them right now um, and, and obviously continuing on them. Uh, in respect of the 50 plus, uh, this reflects the ongoing conversation with the ministry around 
whether all of Peel should be considered a hotspot versus the, the hotspot FSA. So um, the province will open, and uh, at this point in time, there's an indication they will open our community clinics, which are on the provincial booking system, to those who live in those hotspot postal codes. Uh, but our hospital partners, as you know, because they... Um, they're, they have, they've retained their own booking systems. Uh, they, they basically are reflecting our position that all appeals should be a hotspot and they are going to move to 50 plus for the whole community. So the hospital website is 50 plus for everybody and the provincial one pending our discussion, should they see things our way, they may also align to that. But for the time being, we'll be aligned to the provincial view of, of the hotspots as they stand. And then Brian, that's, that's great and, news. thank you. And then I'll pass it to you, Brian, to, um, to comment on where we are with the uh, mobile congregate. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think you outlined it well, Lawrence. Uh, we're we, we plan to be through 120 uh, settings by the end of April. I don't have the list on me to know exactly what where those uh, where those are right now. Uh, and we've also just uh, jigged our program there to 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 try to expand. And uh, we're working with our uh, population planning tables uh, to look for communities and those. You know, once we get through those higher risk congregate settings, then it, it move into other like uh, others where there's concentrated housing of seniors uh, that are unable to mobilize still. You know, we put the bridge in for when you can, uh, please go to the clinic because it's the fastest. Uh, and it's, as I pointed out earlier, the mobile clinics are, are a, a longer, slower process, but they get to where they need to for people that absolutely need it. So we're certainly working on that. And here, here on the keep things simple, and uh, understandable, that's what we are trying to do through our age based strategy. Uh, but uh, thanks for that. Much, much appreciated. And just the, the other complication as well, I think that, uh, that we tend to get uh, down in southern Mississauga because of the lake is people get drawn to the lake, especially on good weather days, and they come down like it's every day looks like it's a concert or a festival that's going on. And this isn't people really going to one particular spot, they're going everywhere. People are bumping into people like crazy. And so, my fear is the residents that are down there that want to try to get some fresh air are having people coming from all over the GTA. And so those numbers, I think, tend to be a little bit misleading. So that is great to see with regards to Trillium, and I'll certainly let my residents know that. But also, uh, uh, Brian, if you could please uh, let me know with regards to uh, that Fairways building, that would be uh, much appreciated as well. Okay, thank you. Mayor Thompson. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, a few, few questions. First of all, the uh, variant that we have right at the moment, uh, what, what percentage of that? Uh, we got 660 cases today. Do, you know, do we know what percentage that variant have the variant now? I know it's been climbing, but I'm just wondering where we're at. So through the chair to Mayor Thompson, uh, I, I can't give you the specifics for the cases reported today, but over the last week, our proportion of variants is around 67, 68% of the new cases being reported. So it won't be long until it'll be almost 100% then is what you're telling us. Uh, so, I, just to answer through the chair uh, to Mayor Thompson, uh, absolutely, it's anticipated that because this is a more transmissible variant, that uh, in the course of infection, it will infect more uh, readily and quickly than the wild type uh, coronavirus that we were having uh, previously. So it is likely to continue becoming the dominant strain in, in, the, in the weeks to come. It already is the dominant strain, yes. Just for clarification now, I know we're talking about the mobile units to do the workforce that's done by the province. Will that be issued by the province or will you be taking that over once the province has given you direction on that? So through the chair to Mayor Thompson, we're still awaiting details on the province's mobile rollout, um, but uh, we understand that this is meant to be jointly uh, something that is uh, planned and executed. Uh, you know, the province will provide the resourcing and all that other stuff, but at least we in Peel Public Health will have a bit of a say as to where and how it gets deployed within our community. Well, that's good to know. And as long as we stick with our age uh, thing, I think you're quite right. I think it's working well, but if we can get the mobile units, especially in our hot spots, I really think that is like a, like a, a you know, a uh, bang, bang kind of a way of um, rectifying the problem. So that's good. Secondly, uh, going with what Mayor Brown was talking about, uh, we I know there's a lot of people here, especially for the AstraZeneca, going to pharmacies, especially in Toronto, seem to have no problem. They just call and just drive over and, and get the injection. To get those results, 
we should be able to get that through the health card data. Do we, can we not, to know how much percentage that is? Uh, sorry, uh, through the chair uh, to um, Mayor Thompson, I apologize. I was briefly um, distracted by a text message which advised that the hospitals actually have gone live already as of noon uh, with booking 50 pluses. So uh, that was just something there. And, and I apologize as a result of that, uh, Mayor Thompson. I, I missed the other part of your question, but I, I, I was happy to be able to provide counsel with that update. <laughs> You know, that's good, that's, that's, I saw that at lunchtime too, so thank you for that. Uh, no, what I'm asking about is a number of people, especially between the uh, going to get the AstraZeneca shot, especially with pharmacies, a lot of people from Peel had no problem. You just drive, you don't book it and just drive over to the pharmacies in Toronto and, and to get the injection. We should be able to know about those inoculizations because of the health card, would we not? Is that how we get the data or is it you have to go through the platform that the uh, province has that you're running on your data? Uh, so through the chair uh, to Mayor Thompson, it's both. Um, we have access to that data from the provincial platform. They need to extract it obviously, but they are able to track it based on postal code of residence, yes. One thing with the workforce, do we know uh, for the mobile units and things like that, um, are we going to know within the week to, or how fast do you think we'll get this up and going? And what I'm thinking about is, can we get the teachers done, especially for next week when they've got the break? Uh, so uh, through uh, the chair to Mayor Thompson, uh, there's actually two answers to that one. Uh, first of all, um, I have requested more information on the mobile uh, program from our provincial partners. In respect of teachers, my understanding is that they're going to be starting with special ed teachers and that um, and, and also teachers in our in our uh, high risk neighborhoods as identified by the province. Um, and I believe that that is actually going to go via our community mass vaccination clinics um, because they're mobile and they're able to get there. So uh, we're in, in essence, uh, what I can say, Mayor Thompson, is we're waiting for details from the province on both the mobile program as well as how we're going to get the teachers um, vaccinated throughout the, uh, the, the, the coming weeks uh, based on the announcement yesterday. So, uh, but we, well, we, do you think we'll have the information by the end of the week? This is Thursday. Will we know by the end of Friday to, so that we can even get the message out to our public? Uh, yes. So, uh, through the chair to Mayor Thompson, we've received assurances from uh, our ministry partners that further information is coming and it will like, it will be before the end of the week. I think they've indicated, uh, for example, that they wanted to move to 50 plus and also start vaccinating uh, teachers as of, as of the start of the spring break. So I, um, I will continue to uh, press the ministry for further information. Thank you for all the good work that all of you are doing. I really appreciate your team's doing an awesome job. Uh, keep up the good work, sir. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm a bit surprised at the number that I, you gave out earlier of 9% of vaccines coming to Peel because the Toronto Star this morning still has us at 6.7%. Does it change overnight? Uh, so through the chair to Councillor Parrish, that was the most up-to-date number that my team was able to provide me. And I think it reflects an allocation that we received uh, earlier this week and the Toronto Stars may not have reflected that. Okay, second question. I'd like to go back to the Amazon 5,000 uh, doses that were sent to you because we closed, you closed, we all closed the Amazon plant um, I find it kind of shocking that they're not smart enough down at Queen's Park to have exactly the same answer you did, which is once they're sent home, how the hell do you find them to give them their 5,000 doses? So this does not build my confidence in the decision-making at Queen's Park, I'm sorry. The other question I would have to do with that Amazon is if they gave you 5,000 doses for Amazon, why wouldn't you have given them to the Amazon in Caledon or the Amazon in Mississauga to prevent another outbreak? Do, do you have a reason for not doing that? So if I may, uh, through the chair to Councillor Parrish, uh, it was very clear that the offer was for 5,000 doses for the 5,000 workers who are off at the at the Brampton warehouse. Um, and uh, I think it's very clear that if the offer was 5,000 doses unrestricted, I would have happily taken, I would have happily taken it. But on my basis of the assessment of the situation, the fact that it wasn't going to change the two week closure, um, we actually said uh, we're we're not uh, we're not interested in the 5,000 doses, but we are interested in the 80,000 dose shortfall and trying to make sure that we actually get what we need for our seniors who are still as yet unvaccinated at this point in time. Well, thank you for that. And through you, Mr. Chair, um, this isn't a rude question, so don't take it as such. Is your authority as our MOH 
Does it give you the power to deviate from provincial directives? Um, are you, do you report to us or do you report to the province? Uh, so through the chair to Councilor Parrish, and I don't know if the regional solicitor wants to weigh in as well. My understanding is that I, uh, I, I do report to uh, the, the Board of Health, uh, but um, you know, with specific uh, accountabilities and autonomy built into the role within the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Uh, but I am also accountable to the Ministry of Health through the accountability and funding agreements and also the Ontario Public Health Standards uh, to maintain certain elements of program and practice and also to adhere to uh, protocols that are issued by the Ministry of Health and the Chief Medical Officer Health. So it is a role that requires uh, that that um, that requires me to report uh, to both uh, yourselves as the Board of Health and to the Ministry of Health. And I don't know if the regional solicitor would like to co to comment on that. Yeah, Patricia, that'd be you if you had anything further. Yes, thank you. No, uh, I think uh, Dr. Lowe summed it up very well. Um, as it relates to vaccinations, as well, we should keep in mind that. Um, the provincial prioritization framework, uh, something that we are that, that Dr. Lowe uh, is bound to. Bound to. Um, the region does receive uh, vaccinations uh, through an agreement that the, uh, the region executed with the province, which allows uh, the region access to the vaccinations um, on the condition that it uh, administers the vaccinations. Um, in, 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 uh, in accordance with provincial directions. So from that respect, there's also contractual arrangements that are in place that would uh, bind the region and the medical officer of health to uh, provincial direction. Thank you for that. Uh, could someone then explain to me why uh, Niagara is vaccinating all teachers of all ages and all schools over the, March, over the April break? So uh, through the chair to Councillor Parrish, I can, I can explain. Uh, the uh, provincial prioritization indicated there were three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, as you know, uh, within phase two, there are there is some flexibility in respect of uh, age, essential workers, et cetera. Um, and so I think uh, to the extent that that was where Niagara went uh, with their teachers, uh, we know that the province has identified for Toronto and Peel that they will also uh, permit uh, the vaccination of of teachers, and we're waiting for further information from the ministry on that. Um, but I think it's also uh, really vital for me to reiterate uh, Brian's presentation uh, today uh, around the vaccine rollout. Uh, the fastest, uh, quickest, uh, most elegant way is to keep moving down the age brackets to the extent that we'll be doing 20s and 30-year-olds by uh, by early May. Um, I mean, the reality is, is it takes out a lot of the question of which group and why and how, and so that will still stay the backbone of our program. But of course, with the adjuncts of the mobile clinics, the provincial mobile program, the primary care role, and the pharmacy role to support that, especially with the high priority groups and, and neighborhoods. And thank you for that answer. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, there are companies who are hired by large corporations to give flu shots in their buildings and on in their warehouses and so forth. Mostly it's the, the upper level uh, businesses that do it. It's not warehouses. But are you aware of any companies that would be considered to be appropriate to do those sorts of things for us? Uh, so uh, through the chair, I'm going to pass this one to Brian Laundrie because I know he's been looking at the logistics uh, together with the team around uh, around working with uh, corporations and workplaces, essential workplaces. Brian. Hi, thank you, uh, Lawrence, and uh, thank you, Council Parish, and through the chair. We we uh, our, our human resource strategy has looked at uh, all options, and we passed over any uh, offers of uh, agency support. Uh, those are, are not coming as they used to. Uh, uh, we heard of a company yesterday uh, that uh, that we suspect that the government, the province, has some contract with uh, to support. Uh, this mobile workforce, but uh, we haven't been able to ident identify those, but that's something on our, our list to continue to follow up with uh, to determine whether they actually are available. Thank you. One, Thank of them, one of them approached me this morning, so I sent them to you. Um, you. I'd like to also, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I'm going to wind up soon. Uh, I, I share Mayor Brown's and Mayor Crombie's frustrations um, out there in the public. Uh, the per capita allocation shortfalls are bad. And since we passed yesterday around noon, we passed the motion to do mobile clinics. I don't know if you guys follow Twitter, but I've had 3,548 likes. I've had 661 retweets and 123 comments, at least 40 of whom were retired doctors that no one's asked them if they would like to 
participate in something like this. I also published the six MPPs for Mississauga emails and office numbers with my notes of last Thursday and suggested they call their MPPs. So I'm going to take a little bit of credit for the fact that they tagged on in their announcement yesterday because I think the six MPPs in, in uh, Mississauga must be going nuts. Um, comment I wanted to make is that the best prediction for future success is past performance. And so far, I'm not impressed with, with what the province has done. They're bouncing all over the place. They're changing things, locking things down, opening things up. They're bankrupting small businesses. When all along, going into these factories, into these other places where people are working on hourly wages was the thing to do. And you keep using the word elegant. I know doing it by age may be elegant, but it's not hitting the people that need it the most. It's not hitting poor people. It's not hitting people who can't take a couple hours off work. It's not hitting people who come from countries where needles were to be feared, just like guns. It's not helping people who can't speak English. And it's not helping old people who came to this country with their kids and having a clue how to get out and get a needle. So we're, it, we may be elegant and it may be fair, but it's not hitting the people it needs to be hitting. And I think when, when we're smart enough, we pivot. The, the seniors, if you look at the, the map that was in the paper this morning, where the areas, I don't know if you can see this, well, you can't, you probably all saw it anyway. There's a band south of the Queenie that's all not a hotspot. Now I'm sure within those bands south of the Queenie, there are hotspots, but this is a blanket treatment on a problem and it's not working. And I don't think we wait for the province to do a damn thing about this. I think we have permission as of yesterday to treat mobile clinics or mobile um, approach to this thing. You've got the permission. It was there in the, in the thing yesterday. And I think we step up. We put this thing in practice. We don't wait for the province. You'll be waiting until Every single small business is bankrupt. Every restaurant is closed. This is a disaster. And I'm not angry with you. I am just darn angry that the idiots at Queen's Park would send you 5,000 doses after you closed a plant and sent those people home. What were you supposed to go? Deliver them to each house individually and take three months to do it? This is ridiculous. That's the thinking down there. We have to be different. So that's my rant, and I'm looking forward to discussing my motion. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I, I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca. Thank you, through Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lowe, um, Brian, and everyone. I echo everything that has been said about uh, the leadership from Peel uh, to date. Uh, I do want to say uh, support for the multi-pronged approach and how uh, staff have uh, pivoted, been flexible, adapted, and worked uh, within the, the provincial pro uh, parameters, along with um, trying to address uh, the many, many demands uh, and requirements for the health and safety of, of all in Peel. Uh, just want to commend you for that. And also um, what was presented with regards to the 360 approach to communication. I think that is uh, that is essential when it comes to, as you were saying, Dr. Lowe, uh, following the fastest path to community immunity, and it needs to carry on uh, through the vaccination strategy. So thank you to that. Uh, a couple of uh, specific questions that have not already been asked. Uh, with regards to the homebound program, how are how are the residents in the how are residents um, in particular I would say the 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 uh, isolated seniors um, some living in isolation in single in homes or in um, apartments or uh, in settings where they're not in a congregate setting where they actually might be living alone and don't have access to um, to uh, the internet per se, how are they being notified or communicated to uh, about the homebound program uh, and uh, what has been rolled out 
um, with this strategy to date? Are they being contacted through their through their physicians, uh, through other caregivers, um, through like what is that process? And do they have a specific registration process, and or a separate phone line? Um, or line of communication through to the region of Peel. I understand uh, the phone line is uh, quite, um, has been inundated to say the least, but with regards to the specific homebound program, uh, could you give a little bit more information on that? So through the chair, uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Fonseca, and I will pass this to Brian Laundrie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Fonseca, and through the chair, uh, w th this uh, program has been ramping up uh, in, in the planning phase for for a while, uh, last few weeks for sure. We started vaccinating last week, but only have uh, been to a handful. We've been working with our partners for re the referral pathways through primary care, through our hospitals, uh, through individual referral, and have uh, opened a dedicated phone line for them that's posted on our website. We will uh, look at the option of doing a phone blast for those that have been identified as homebound that have received uh, th that are recipients of uh, home care. And so we'll we'll get a significant number of them uh, identified and are looking at uh, all multiple streams of uh, uh, communication to identify them and follow up. Okay, that's great. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, next question, um, I did have to, um, I have had uh, a number of requests uh, to, through to my office. Um, are, does Peel have plans to set up a vaccine standby form similar to what uh, the City of Toronto have, has done? And uh, a number of residents have been the specific example of East Mississauga Health, uh, not East, Miss East Mississauga, sorry, East Toronto Healthcare, uh, where they have a form and attached to that form, it's please complete this form if you would like to be in the standby list for extra doses of COVID-19 vaccine at the end of the day. So uh, thank you through the chair. I believe uh, uh, Brian had mentioned a bit around the standby list. Uh, you know, previously was uh, a very limited uh, standby list because we were running on a on a you know no waste uh, policy. Really had to lift leftover doses at the end of the day. But uh, Brian, are you able to speak to the IT and maybe a bit more around uh, what's going on there? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Councillor Fonseca, and through the chair, we we uh, we investigated on the, the pre-registration system run out of East Toronto to see if there's something that we could learn from them. What we learned is that the program was inundated with 60,000 pre-registrants over a three-day period, so they shut it down. Uh, we, we've got a, a, a process that uh, identifies uh, in a priority order and respects the prioritization framework for, for reaching out to those who are already eligible or next to be eligible uh, in a systematic way that's uh, coordinated and succinct. So uh, we've, we've done that manually to date and uh, it's, our IT is setting up that pre-registration so we can have that uh, call out. And so it's logistically simple. Uh, it's just our, our capacity with all the IT demands right now, but it is very close to being uh, 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 live, but it won't be a public facing uh, pre-registration. We'll, we will dedicate it to specific groups that, uh, to, to manage it properly. Okay, I appreciate that. And this goes to comments, both yourself and Dr. Lowe made with regards to um, uh, comparisons that people are making to jurisdictions that were adjacent to or um, and or they can you know, they can go across in terms of across the border border uh, to get a, to get a vaccine at a pharmacy and or and or other. So I do appreciate you providing that update because I did I did uh, get a number of emails and uh, um, phone calls about that standby. So uh, that clear that's clear. Uh, there's clarification around that. I appreciate that. Um, I had one more question and it's specifically uh, goes to hotspots. So, um, uh, so first you answered about the registration of the 18 plus. So, uh, so that's off the list. One more question about the hotspots. So I've received, um, uh, so the, po the postal goes, and I know that this is through the province that have identified the hotspots 
uh, for vaccination. Um, I, uh, one of the, both, both three postal codes that are in Ward 3, two have been identified in, uh, as hotspots, um, but one has not, and I've received quite a bit of concern in terms of, um, and I'll just kind of read what is standard. Uh, um, I'm very dismayed to learn that uh, postal code um, L4Y um, in Dixie and Dundas, and it's it's within the chart. It, it, it's nothing. Uh, it's within what has been posted uh, on the, the website, the provincial website, as a um, and all the data is around that. So uh, an L4Y, and as the data from the Region Appeal dashboard and the provincial dashboard or uh, provincial data demonstrates, uh, this L4Y postal code has been hit very hard. Uh, with a 10.5% positivity rate, which is among the worst uh, in Peel and or similar to uh, the other postal codes in and around East Mississauga. Um, we also have a case in incidence per 100,000 that is substantially higher than a number of the other uh, uh, postal codes identified within hots or that have been identified by the province as hotspots. Um, is this a glaring oversight and what can be done to address this? Um, so I'm not sure if that needs to go to, and I'm advocating uh, and will contact the MPP for the area for Mississauga East Cooksville, uh, but there is a concern um, uh, from the residents in Ward 3 that live within this postal code that while the data clearly supports uh, that there, it's a vulnerable hotspot area. It has been not recognized on the provincial list. So I'm not sure what the, the region can do to advocate for that L4Y postal code, but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of great concern for, um, for, the, uh, for the residents in Ward 3. So, Mr. Chair, if I may respond through you to Councillor Fonseca, this speaks to uh, really what I had flagged, especially just given the interconnectivity of our region and my desire to just say, uh, given the large preponderance of postal code FSAs that we have that are identified as high risk, which vastly outnumber those that are not, uh, that the region appeal should be uh, should be treated on a consistent basis. What I can commit to uh, Councillor Fonseca, if you are willing to share with me uh, that correspondence or those details, um, that will be helpful in my conversations with the ministry, and I encourage you to also speak with your provincial counterpart in respect to those concerns as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Going on with my list, which is Sato, Demerla, Paleshi, Downey, Groves. Next up, Councillor Sato. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, I've been trying to go down through my scribbles to cross out the ones that have already been answered. Um, could, uh, and I guess this is probably more for Brian, um, because uh, I guess apparently today there's a two hour uh, waiting on the Region Appeals phone line. Um, and I had a resident ask me how she can possibly book if it's a two hour waiting list. She still has her red card, um, health card, which means she cannot book online mm -hmm. with that card anywhere. So is her only alternative to go on a two hour phone wait list? I mean, it, it just seems ridiculous. People are going to give up. And, you know, when we talk about trying to get people to, uh, to sign up for vaccines, here I've got someone who wants to, and I'm sure there's a lot of others that are in her position. And she said, I just don't have time to spend two hours on the phone waiting. And I can't, I've got no other options. <coughs> So are there other options? Uh, thank you, Councillor Sato, and uh, through the chair. The, uh, the wait is totally understandable and the frustration there, we're frustrated too. Our call center's inundated. We, we only, there's days we only answer 20 to 25% of our calls because we just can't get to them because of the confusion and the, and, and the lack of clarity and because of the complexity uh, of, of the process as it rolls out, which is, speaks again to the approach that we've set out. Uh, the, the, the option would be to, uh, the only option, well, a couple of options. One, to uh, 
try, can try later in a few days when all this uh, complexity roll, uh, calms down or to get some help trying to book on the website. But we're going to be, I've got to be honest, uh, bookings aren't going to be that available. If we've opened huge teacher groups, we've opened uh, hotspot groups of all ages, it's going to be a while. Our, our capacity just can't ramp up and down, uh, you know, at a public announcement. So uh, I would just ask uh, for that consideration to, to council to understand to the constituencies uh, there could be delays and uh, hopefully not too much frustration, but hopefully it's understandable. And I'm sorry you don't have a better response than that. Okay, I, I will tell her, uh, stay on the phone for two hours and find something to do while you're, while you're on the phone. Um, so I, I wanted to comment again on this hot, this silly hotspot issue. Um, you know, first of all, the provincial map is absolutely terrible. They have the wrong community names in the wrong place. And I've, I've said this before, and I asked for our regional one to be fixed, but unfortunately we're using the province's map. And um, they, ha they have uh, a community name in my ward that is actually not there. <laughs> it's, it's further west, um, which really confused my residents because um, they, they weren't really sure where uh, where the lines were. Um, my area is not super high hotspot, the L5N, and even down to the L5M, um, there are some pockets, but it is listed as a hotspot. So, um, you know, I, I think the whole issue that they did not make the entire region of Peel a hotspot is, is absolutely ludicrous. So my question to you is, and you said yesterday at, at our council meeting that you are asking that the entire region, you know, get those additional little postal codes in. Um, can you, do you have the authority, and I thought you, you did, um, to, to just do that? So, you know, when it comes to the teachers, for example, you know, you're gonna have a teacher that's teaching in an L5N living down in uh, in Councillor Dasko's ward maybe or vice versa. Um, so what are you gonna what are you gonna go by? Are you gonna go by where they live or where they're teaching? I mean it's absolutely ridiculous. It, it just does not make any sense at all. So can can we just say and, and, and I've already said this, we're gonna do them all, you know, as long as we can put them in. So through the chair to Councillor Sato, uh, you know, I think in both to the extent that we are advocating for that, yes, um, in the question of whether we can do it alone, uh, our hospital partners are using their booking systems to book 50 plus across Peel, um, which are separate from the provincial booking system. For us, the challenge is if we need to change the provincial booking system, we need to work with the ministry at this point in time uh, to ensure that uh, that that booking availability for 50 plus is within whatever the ministry and us agree to. So at this time, the ministry has said that they are sticking with um, the hotspots and high risk FSAs. Um, and I think this speaks, if anything, to the broader thing that we've shared. And I know all of our mayors and chair have heard this on our meetings, um, that uh, we really do think that uh, more autonomy for the health unit and accessing the provincial booking system to set our own gating, to set our own schedules, uh, to be able to make changes to schedule and apply based on allocations. Uh, is really vital. It's uh, I think the analogy is like having a car, but you know, have to ask your neighbor for the keys kind of thing. Um, so uh, uh, we do we don't plan to move off the provincial booking system because it provides significant efficiencies at scale in our clinic. Uh, basically, people come in already pre-registered, and then it just increases the flow and efficiency that much. But we have been exploring options, and Brian, maybe you can talk a little bit about some other options in the event that we still continue to have trouble with making changes within the booking system on our own. Uh, th thanks, uh, Dr. Lowe, and thank you, Councillor Sato. And through the chair, it's you, you've hit on exactly, Councillor Sato, why we've got, tried to go to this simple, uh, simplified age-based strategy. It's understandable. It, it's a population-based strategy, so we're not picking and choosing here and there, and it gets through that population, the mass of the population, the 50 or 60 percent most quickly. There's not a good answer for for, for what you're looking at, for. Uh, 
the province controls the FSA that they'll put into the booking system and the age groups, and uh, we, you know, we're we're kind of bound by that. It, it's sort of the win and the lose of it. It's a, it's the most efficient system and should be there. Uh, to, as Dr. Lowe said, makes makes our clinics more efficient, makes us uh, able to better vaccinate more people more quickly. But uh, we're kind of we don't always have the keys to to making it work for ourselves. So it's just one more example of how the ministry and the province is just totally screwing up on this whole thing. Um, I, I, I have to say I was very loudly rolling my eyes <laughs> um, yesterday listening to the premier because, you know, he, he was bragging about, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Well, you know what? We've been asking you to do this and that for three months, and you're finally doing some of what we asked, and, and even then— they throw in this little monkey wrench, which is totally confusing to people. And I think especially when you look at the teachers, um, you know, I can understand, uh, well, I can't understand, but it's it's easier to understand, you know, people over 50 in, in the hot spots, for example. But when you're, when you're looking at people who are living and working in Peel in two different postal zones, one is a hot spot, one isn't. Um, you know, but they, they could be going to work in a hot spot, but because they don't live in a hot spot, they're not going to get vaccinated. But gee, go into that school that's had several outbreaks. Uh, it just makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely no sense. Um, so I would hope that if, it, if, if the province gets their act together and allows it next week, um, you know, a lot of their announcements, uh, they announce them and then they'll reannounce them and then they'll reannounce that they're going to reannounce it before they even get to uh, to get to implementing it. Um, but I would hope that if a teacher in the region of Peel uh, goes to a clinic, they're gonna get vaccinated. I don't care whether they're in a hot spot or not. I mean, they're in the region of Peel, they're in a hot spot. So um, hopefully uh, very similar to what Councillor Parrish's uh, motion is, you know, you, you've got to use common sense here. And unfortunately, the province doesn't seem to have much of that going around. Um, I'm surprised at your comment, Brian, that on the provincial site, actually, I'm a little appalled by it, that on the provincial site, that people can register to go for a vaccine within 100 kilometers of their postal code. We, we were told previously, because I, I was joking about a month or two ago before we went to my age group in Peel, um, in Waterloo, at Kitchener, Cambridge, where my, my kids live, um, they were already doing my age group. And my daughter jokingly said, uh, why don't you just put in my postal code and come here and get your vaccine? And I said, no, 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 you can't do that. Because when you get there, if you have to, you know, you show your... I wouldn't do it anyway, but, uh, you know, you give your, <laughs> yeah, just, just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> um, but you're giving, you're giving your identification and it shows your postal code and they would say, no, you're not in this postal code. So did the province change the rules now, or is it because some regions are on their own system and as you say, seem to be able to uh, control their destiny a lot better? Um, like, why would the province do that? It throws our numbers off. Um, you know, it, it, it just throws everything off. And I think Councillor Dasko's nodding his head. You mentioned that earlier, too. Like, how can we how can we get the number of vaccines for our population if anybody can come and use those vaccines? It, it's not serving our population. I don't know who wants to answer that one. <laughs> Brian, you you caused it, Brian, by saying 100 kilometers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just the messenger, and thank you, uh, Councillor Sato, and through the chair. Uh, I, it, I think it speaks to the, the end state we would like to get to with vaccine supply and availability. And really, look, this is a population-based uh, pandemic, and we need a population-based approach to get out of it. For us, we have control over appeal or quote unquote control over Peel. So we're trying to make it uh, region wide as much as we can. And uh, I think the province is probably thinking they're gonna make it province wide as much as they can. So in an environment where the vaccine increases and where we go to an age base, where we're primarily age based in the approach, uh, it, it makes a little more sense than, than earlier on where we were 
uh, working through very specified spe specified and specific eligible populations because of the limited vaccine supply and because we had to be very uh, careful and co considerate about where the vaccine uh, was was sent and how it was administered to those populations. As we move into a more global process with more vaccine supply, uh, the, the distance is, is uh, probably less should be less of an issue and more of that province-wide approach. Well, at least Trillium is only using their catchment area, so um, that that's a good thing. They, you know, and, and I don't think very many of us really wanted us to go to the provincial booking system anyway because uh, we didn't have too much faith in it, and uh, I think that's sort of been been shown by uh, by you know comments that are coming through. Um, I am concerned that we're only getting to 25% of our 311 calls um, because of all of this confusion. And do, do you feel that that is just because of yesterday's announcement or has that been over the last little while? The CAO may have a thought on that first, then I'll carry on okay, with the thanks. list. Uh, Janice? Yeah, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. And, and Sean Baird is also um, he, available and because he manages our contact center. So, I mean, we have added additional resources to the contact center. The dilemma you run into, and Brian has already addressed it, is when we open up new groups, we get a, we get a huge wave. So, for example, uh, on the day that um, over 70 opened, I think we had 30,000 calls on the day. Our system is just not designed to handle that kind of volume, Councillor Sato. So that's where you get the very long waits. But on the next day, Tuesday, so I think that was on a Monday, on the Tuesday, uh, we were all close to back to normal. So for those people who want to get in on the first day that a, an eligible category opens up, it is highly likely that they are going to experience uh, a wait, a longer wait time. 24 hours, 48 hours later, uh, the service is much quicker, uh, and they will get through. That's We just can't staff to the kinds of capacity that you would need to handle the volumes that we're seeing on those on those first day or so. Uh, so that's really the issue. That's going to be an ongoing issue, though, if, if you look at the strategy that has been mapped out now by our team is, you know, opening up a new age co cohort every week. Unfortunately, for those people who need to come through uh, the call center, I think that is going to be a, an issue. I know Sean and the team are looking at, you know, how much resourcing we can put in there, but it's also, it's, it's you know, it, there's a whole range of things that have to be in place. It's not just people. So, um, you know, it's it's a it's it's an issue that I think we're going to continue to have for in the short term. It'll level out in the longer term, uh, and people just have to be patient. I I don't have a better answer for you than that. Okay, thank you. And I have one final question for you, Dr. Lowe, and it relates to um, Councillor Parrish's motion. So earlier, um, she asked you about reporting. And um, I, I mean, you said very clearly you report to the Board of Health, which is this council. Um, and I know in the past that this council as the Board of Health, and I guess Nando's probably the only other person <laughs> besides myself that was here when we did this. But many years ago, um, the medical officer of health for Peel uh, did not want to um, order the boards of education to um, investigate and inspect and, re and re uh, repair, replace every single portable in the schools for mold. And it was a very great concern in Peel at council. And uh, the medical officer of, of health at the time, who was very outspoken, um, absolutely stood up in front of council and said, no, I refuse to do it. And we passed a motion as the board of health that gave him clear direction to do it. And it was done. And it was probably one of the best things we did because they found a tremendous amount of mold in the portables and uh, in the board, especially in the peel board. And, um, you know, very, very great health concern. 
So my question to you is, if the motion today, and I believe the wording in the motion is that, um, I don't have it open, sorry, um, is that we, um, and Councillor Parrish can clarify this, um, is that we support or um, we give our blessing to the mobile health clinics going in, in Peel. Um, if that was changed to that we direct the medical officer of health to make it happen, um, would you have to follow that direction? Uh, so through the chair, uh, I believe there was a previous discussion on this uh, and that the regional solicitor at the time weighed in. So I would defer to the regional solicitor's opinion again on this one. Okay. Thank you, and through the chair, um, the council sitting as the board of health certainly has the ability to uh, direct certain aspects um, uh, of the MOH, and that is uh, primarily in regards to ensuring that the programs and services under the Health Protection and Promotion Act are carried out. Um, so in this case, a vac that a vaccination program is being carried out. Uh, the, the Board of Health does not have the, um, the jurisdiction to direct how that is being done. So in, in particularly if those uh, areas involve the, um, the professional judgment and discretion of the MOH. So in terms of the how, I would look at it as, as the what, uh, directing the what, but not so much the how. And um, in this particular case, though, it appears that there is some um, alignment in terms of the, uh, um, the intentions around on-site uh, uh, vaccinations and what council may be, um, uh, uh, the, the sort of the outcome that council is looking for and uh, the, the intentions uh, from, the, from the public health unit. So I don't know that there's um, a misalliance. Um, I, my advice would be to the Board of Health that uh, the, the better categorization would be a request as opposed to a direction so that it appears that um, the, the, uh, the, the Board of Health is actually acting within its uh, jurisdiction. I hope that helps. Okay, that does. Thank you. And, um, and thank you, Dr. Law and Brian for the info and Patricia for the information. Mr. Thank Chair, you. if I may, if Go ahead. I may also just respond to add on to Patricia's piece. So, and I did want to say through you to Councillor Sato, uh, I don't see the mobile uh, clinic as being counter to anything uh, that we've uh, identified as Brian identified in our presentation. Uh, we are taking a multi-pronged strategy um, and to the extent that the mass vaccination clinics and the uh, carry out by age uh, bracket still remains uh, the bulk of and the backbone of our strategy. We do know that there is, uh, we already have a mobile team, we have additional conversations with the province around what they will be offering uh, and we will aim to use all of these various strategies uh, in uh, both fulfilling the the spirit and intent of the motion as well as the overall goals of the vaccination program in the region of Peel. Thank you and Mr. Chair I just wanted to add my my thanks to the 311 staff and uh, and everyone who is having to answer those phones because um, I know our staff at the city um, especially in the counselor's offices are getting yelled at by residents uh, that call in about vaccine information. And I'm sure it's even worse with the staff there. So, um, you know, they're, they're taking the brunt of, uh, of the province's um, action and inaction, I guess I could say. So my kudos to them, but uh, please, um, Janice, let, the, let them know that we, we are all appreciative for what they're doing and uh, we're thinking of them. Thank you. Okay, moving on, Councillor Demerla. Thank you, Chair. Actually, my questions were asked by Councillor Sado, so I'm just going to step down. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you uh, to your, all your team as well. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian's hair for everything that's, uh, that everybody's doing. Really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to get your take, Dr. Lowe, on the double uh, the double mutations variant um, that have been reported in India and now in California. India, I think, closing in on on thousands, but we're not sure how many. Um, California just two days ago was one. Uh, now they're as of today they're at five, um, and currently this is what I want to get your take on the the 
the double mutations and the fact that they're uh, protein strong and, the, and they can lead the immune system. Um, and the fact that I, as of today, I can still book a flight to India or California if I want and come back in a few days. Uh, so through the chair to uh, Councillor Pileshi, certainly the emergence of variants uh, continues around the world uh, with the sheer number of cases that are developing. Um, the emergence of the double mutation variants, uh, as you've identified in India, California, and also in other jurisdictions, uh, you know, we are also in the process of trying to identify or pick up if there are any double variants that are arriving uh, here in Canada. Uh, obviously, there are concerns around, especially since those double mutations may include uh, changes to the spike protein uh, around vaccine efficacy um, and also uh, just uh, general immunity overall. Uh, it is very likely, just given how quickly this virus is mutating, uh, that it will you know, eventually escape the vaccine. Um, and so I, I, while I know that there's a lot of studies that are uh, still out there, uh, it may be a case of uh, similar to influenza where, you know, regular, you know, on an annual or multi-year basis, additional vaccinations uh, may be required depending on the nature of the mutations that are undertaken. Um, I can't comment on the flight pieces um, and those aspects, but the federal government does still continue to have a strong recommendation that people do not travel outside of Canada unless it's for an essential purpose. And I guess that's that's where I, I'm a little bit conflicted and, and what is the essential purpose and 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 where do we say um, as, a, as a community, we can no longer allow this to continue to happen. The feds shut down uh, when the UK variant was 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 strong, they they had shut down all flights to to and from the UK, and um, it didn't work. Uh, the UK variant came, and and so now in this very much very early stage of of this new, uh, actually some scientists aren't even calling it a variant. All viruses change, and and, um, and and that's how they they go on and live. But this double, the double mutation is is the one that's really uh, is so new and and is very concerning, and the potential for this to be essentially the fourth wave that uh, uh, that we could be in is um, going through going through this. I had a couple concerned residents that. Um, we're talking to me about vaccines and which vaccines are being offered where. Currently, uh, the province, uh, I think, does a good job in telling everybody which vaccines are where. They had noticed that um, we don't have that on our, on our website. Is that something that we're leaving up to the province or is it something that we can take a look at to try and get out to the public? So through the chair to Councillor Pileshi, uh, to the extent that our message at Peel Public Health, especially in a hotspot where time is of the essence, our message has been any vaccine is a good vaccine. And if you show up at one of our hospital or community clinics, you will receive a vaccine that has been approved by Health Canada and approved for use in your age category or eligibility. Uh, we've tried to avoid uh, broadcasting or publicizing uh, the vaccines that are offered at different sites, uh, both for the reason that uh, we don't want people vaccine shopping, but also for the other reason that we can't guarantee it'll be that vaccine on site. We have all three vaccine products that are here in the region of Peel at this point in time. Um, and depending on any day, it could be any one of Pfizer, Moderna, or AstraZeneca, less likely AstraZeneca, because as we all know, that has been uh, largely targeted at the primary care and pharmacy pilot. Um, that said, however, the province on its booking system does provide that information. And so if people choose to look, they can look at it from the province. But for us in Peel, our message is, honestly, if you have a vaccine and you're eligible for it, get the first vaccine that's, uh, that's offered to you. It's safe, it's effective, it's our quickest way out of this. 100%, and I think a lot of people are, are, are okay with that, but they want to know before you stick the needle in my arm, which vaccine is uh, going <laughs> So, sorry, through the chair, but just to clarify, at the time of injection, yes, they will be told <laughs> which vaccine they're getting, obviously, <laughs> that's part of the informed consent, but it just that we're not publicizing it on a website or publicly, because again, it can't be guaranteed until the time that they're actually at their appointment. So that, and, and that's one of the, the main things, is because we can't, we're not going to tell anybody which, what they need to get, we're, we're asking everybody to get the vaccine, um, but we're not, we need to be able to, to tell everybody essentially which one they are getting at at some point. So we're leaving it to the province to, to say where their vaccines are. But for us, it's before, it's when you actually go for the appointment. That's correct, through the chair to Councillor Pleshi, absolutely. And that, that's all part of the informed consent process. It's, you know, you're here today, this is the vaccine you'll be getting. It's Pfizer, it's Moderna, it's AstraZeneca, whatever the case is, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Councillor Downey. Thank you through you, Chair, to Dr. Lowe. Thank you to you and your team um, for staying the course. I, I just have a couple of questions about, um, I guess, pivoting um, into potentially, you know, mobile spots, uh, mobile vaccination clinics. Um, I, I guess my concerns are that we would be potentially paying more uh, for a service um, that actually reaches less. Um, and I, but I'm not sure if you actually have uh, maybe stats on that or, or if Brian covered them. And I apologize if this has already been covered, but I've been having some really um, brutal technical issues today. So um, I'm moving around my house trying to find the best internet connection just to stay connected. Um, but I'm wondering if, if there is, you know, a cost associated to the mobile vaccination clinics um, respectful to uh, the open clinics that we have right now and the numbers of people that we're actually reaching in, in the format that we're doing it today. So uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor Downey, I'll start and then Brian can speak to the numbers. Um, so as we mentioned in our presentation, it is gonna continue to be a multi-pronged strategy. We have built up uh, this mass immunization uh, system and uh, we know that moving quickly uh, through the age groups, uh, push, pushing throughput and efficiency through the mass vax uh, clinic, essentially bringing arms to needles, um, will continue to be uh, where the bulk of our residents will expect to get their uh, their COVID-19 vaccination. However, we are committed uh, to other modalities, including primary care, pharmacy, and mobile rollouts. Uh, we are uh, excited to hear that the province is augmenting uh, with provincial mobile units, our own mobile strategy at this point in time. And we know that mobile has its strength in bringing needles to arms uh, in in situations where it's very difficult for people to get to our mass vaccination clinics, whether it be senior Congress settings, which has been our focus uh, to date, but also uh, really exploring with uh, businesses and workplaces and essential workers, uh, which was originally slated for later in, in, in phase two, um, but you know is now being moved up in terms of the discussions, just given the, the recent uh, tone and tenor of, of discussions, as well as pop-up clinics and hotspot modalities. So uh, that is all stuff that will be occurring in parallel to the backbone of mass immunization clinics that will be continuing to vaccinate people efficiently and quickly. And Brian, maybe you can talk a little bit about the numbers and the the costs aspects of it. I know it was covered in your presentation to some degree. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, Councillor Downing, and through the chair. Yes, uh, I, I presented some numbers that are uh, on a cost basis that were showing, you know, twice the cost to go to a mo that our mobile strategy uh, is per dose. Uh, I think that's fair. Uh, partly coming in around that are certainly significantly higher costs, but the the bigger piece is the the volume that you're unable to achieve with through mobile clinics. It's uh, with, so we're not. I wouldn't call it a pivot. I would call it we're continuing to work both our both arms of our strategy, which is the uh, age-based uh, to get through the mass of our population through that population health approach, as well as continuing to focus and work through the second arm, which is uh, supplemented through mobile, supplemented through pharmacy, primary care, community partners. Uh, it is the lower volume strategy, and it's uh, very difficult to set both those strategies up but we really focused on the mass clinics because of the efficiency and the volume. Uh, those are now stood up. They're not by any means done. It's a full-time business to keep those running efficiently, effectively, and to grow them. Uh, but the mobile strategy, once we now, now that we've worked through the phase one populations, we are able to uh, pivot a, a little bit more attention to uh, where we could go with mobile. It takes a lot of work to work with each of those congregate settings to, to get things prepared. Uh, there's a whole bit more uh, additional difficulty with the cold chain, uh, with the storage of vaccines, the types of vaccines, uh, the uh, the consent processes, uh, the list of uh, clients that can be uh, that can be vaccinated, and of course, there's the the uh, the nuances of language, culture, uh, faith, etc., that play into it when you're uh, when you're dealing with a mobile strategy. So we're uh, we're continuing to enhance both strategies, and what Dr. Lowe's uh, highlighted is the additional resources that the province appears to be willing to put to put towards uh, mobile uh, strategies at workplaces, or at least have hinted at that through their 
through their messaging. And uh, that's something that we're not going to turn down, right? We'll take all we can get and, and in that instance, play the advisor role and, and the expert in terms of the cold chain management and the, vac uh, the vaccine uh, storage. Hope that wasn't too long an answer. Thank you, Brian. Um, so just in my you know, limited knowledge of what that mobile uh, system would look like, is that something that um, would be similar to when we go into schools and do HPV vaccines for students, meningitis, that type of thing? And, and would it be applicable, applicable to the point when we get to where we are vaccinating um, our kids and, and applying it to potentially to our school systems? Uh, so th there's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the, the other types of vaccination programs, but I do know through our, uh, and Lawrence can maybe help me out here, but this, this, uh, this uh, program is much more complicated than uh, typical flu campaigns or others where we have, uh, you know, you have the, your waiting period, you have your physical distancing, uh, you have the different nuances of the various types of vaccines. So it's possible, it's possible and certainly something we would continue to look at, but I think Lawrence, you might be able to help me out here on that. Yeah, so through the chair to Councillor Downey, I think it's early days uh, to figure things out, at least in respect of schools, but uh, there are very specific requirements at this point in time in respect of uh, vaccinations and the logistics, as Brian has mentioned, are quite complicated, um, uh, which limits their throughput and their, their overall efficiency uh, because of the need to maintain distancing, the need to maintain cold chain, all these other pieces. Um, but uh, hopefully when we do get to school vaccinations, we will be at a point where it will be something a little bit more like uh, where we've gotten transmission down um, and we're, it'll look a little bit more like what we do in respect of HPV and hepatitis shots. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank you, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Lowe and Brian and your team for your continued um, support and updates and that. Um, I just want to add, I know the postal code issue was brought up, and Dr. Lowe, I just want you to add the L7E postal code as well because... Um, I noticed that that wasn't on the list, and I know that we've had two schools that had to shut down because of the um, because of a breakout there, um, and also recently a business as well. So, if you don't mind just adding that to the list, that would be much appreciated. Um, and, and just a comment: I'm happy to see that the the premier finally listened because we've had this discussion many many times here at council regarding um, the hot spots and us being a hot spot and that we should be a priority. So it was good to hear him say that. But I guess I took a little offense to his comment yesterday, which I thought was really unnecessary. Um, that municipalities and others are playing politics. I took offense to that because I know that we've been advocating on behalf of our residents, and I think that it was it was very disappointing to hear the premier make such a comment because I don't think he realizes that what what elected officials do, and our job is to advocate for our residents. We hear from our residents, we bring them to whoever's um, attention that we need to. So, I, I, just for the record. The Premier really needs to understand that municipalities are not playing politics. We're advocating for our residents, and, and his comment, I thought, was really unnecessary and offensive. But that's my little rant. Thank you. Thank you. That exhausts my list. First of all, well done to staff and the team and carry on. The, the finish line is getting closer. I really believe that. Um, with that, Councillor Parrish, I am over to you because I have the motion from yourself and Councillor Medeiros before me. The only note that I have, Councillor, uh, before I throw it over to you, there was a note made here that staff have, I believe, spoken with you, suggested a change or two, needed to know what your thoughts are on that. So, Councillor Parrish, over to you. Can't hear you, Carolyn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to thank the regional staff for their wordsmithing, but I think I'm going to go with my original motion. They uh, therefore, be it resolved, change the intent of it completely. What I will do under therefore, be it resolved, just so that we're not being too pushy, that the region of Peel, under the supervision of the MOH, outfit mobile vaccination units to go into high infection workplace sites in Caledon, Brampton, and Mississauga to vaccinate all workers wanting to be vaccinated regardless of age, necessitating minimum disruption to their productivity. That's the change there. It's a little bit more elegant, um, but I'm not going to go with their changes. I appreciate their efforts, but uh, changes the intent of my motion. And I'm just gonna walk people through 
My rationale, uh, you've heard me say this, 80% of the GTA logistics, packaging, warehousing, et cetera, is it, for the GTA is in Brampton, Mississauga, and Caledon. 68% of the workplace outbreaks have been in those buildings. In the 2016 census, there were 300,000 workers uh, in those buildings. And I imagine by now, just before the next census is done, it would pro probably have gone up considerably. Vaccinating high-risk groups curbs the spread and protects everybody uh, of every age. A proposal approved yesterday by the Premier allows this to happen. As Dr. Lowe has mentioned, we're not going against the stream. I don't think it, and it doesn't require uh, call centers and bookings, which seem to be clogging up our phones and causing a lot of frustration, as Councillor Sato pointed out. Uh, it's a made in peel solution. It's a way to implement, as we did with seniors dental care, we paid for it for a few years and then suddenly the province decided seniors of low income should have their teeth repaired. Um, the public support from a very small pool of my followers. I have 4,193 Twitter followers, 3,559 have liked what we're doing, 662 have retweeted and 124, as I said to you before, um, have sent comments all positive. There's not been a single negative positive. The theme is about time. Thank goodness we live in Peel. We're really happy with this proposal. I'd like you to go just to show that it can be done. West Sussex, England, they have brought in articulated buses. And I asked our TNW commissioner what it would cost to outfit four articulated buses. He said he can provide four, which are 60 feet long or whatever they are, to September 21st to remove the seats and staunchions, which are those high poles that everybody hangs on to, is three to $4,000 a bus and it takes one day to renovate, renovate each one. The daily operating cost for, for a driver, for fuel and for maintenance is five to $700. The group commitment, for, uh, if you move this little caravan around to the various hotspots, factories, logistics companies, bread packaging, we've got everything, um, you're, you're getting a camaraderie. All the workers are coming out together or they're being filed out. They don't have the language barriers. They don't have to take time off. And they, by and large, make up the poor, more disenfranchised, probably least powerful members of society. But we can't live without what they do for us. And they can't live without the vaccines. At some point, they're going to be starting to drop like flies. Um, I'm going to just give you a quick example. Uh, the Jane and Finch area in Toronto has the highest hospitalizations and deaths, 5.06 for every 1,000 people. They have the lowest vaccine rating in the city of 5.5%. 41% of the 80-plus-year-olds have been vaccinated and 12.2% of the 70-plus-year-olds. To show you a comparison, Moore Park, which is north of Rosedale, Hospitalizations and deaths, 0 0.59 per 1,000. 77.1, 80 plus have had their vaccines and 59.1, 70 plus has have had their vaccines. So what I'm proposing with this motion, with the uh, supervision of, the, of Dr. Lowe and his team, is we take it upon ourselves. Uh, Brampton puts their buses together, we put our buses together, we all send them up to Caledon and wherever else they have to go to hit all these things, all these locations. I would guess it requires minimal supervision on the part of, of the people who are already doing a horrendous job with by age uh, vaccinations. It shows our constituents in this area that we are taking this into our own hands with permission from the province since it came out yesterday and with the assistance and supervision of our medical officer of health but it's a made in peel solution. It's a massive problem here. I think you're gonna find that there's nobody at the province is going to object to this. They're gonna sit back, take a deep breath and say, thank goodness they're fixing their problem there because that problem is gonna fix the spread all over uh, the GTA. So I'm, as I said, I'm very grateful for all the changes. Um, I don't know why, but at the city of Mississauga, nobody ever touches my motions. They sometimes give me a suggestion or two, but. This one was royally worked over. I, I have to show you all the, 
the changes even in the whereas is um, to make it a more elegant motion, I guess. But I am very happy to put this motion forward. I think Councillor Medeiros is also happy to second it without the massive changes that were suggested to us. And I hope everybody will support it. And as we did with seniors dental care, we're gonna be stepping forward in a big way, not terribly expensive and the manpower on the buses. I can give you the names of 40 people who are retired doctors who all said to me, get it going and I'm there. So, or we hire a company, there's many ways of doing this, but this to me is a way for Peel to put our people first, especially our more vulnerable. Thank you. Councillor Parrish, thank you. So I accept your motion as you presented it. That's what before me, uh, duly seconded by Councillor Medeiros. I just think the CAO had a question, comment, or point of clarification. Janice, through to you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councillor Parrish, for the motion. Um, I think the level of specificity that's been put out there is a challenge for us. Uh, I think you and I had a bit of a conversation about you know, give us the direction and, and the priority, but not the how. Uh, because as Lawrence and the team have already pointed out, you know, this the, the vaccines themselves require special handling. Uh, we have got um, mass vaccination clinics. Our plan was uh, a multi-pronged plan. I think the staff have spelled it out. There is a role for mobile in there, uh, but certainly not necessarily for those that actually quite frankly, can uh, uh, easily come to our mass vaccination clinics where, you know, we can we can put thousands of people through uh, in, in a day. Uh, we're already putting thousands of people through in a day. So I think the, 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 the dilemma, and I'll let the medical officer of health speak, Lawrence is very good at uh, explaining uh, his perspective on these things, but just from a logistical perspective, I really Really, I am I am struggling with the idea that we're just going to roll out a you know a caravan of hope across the region. Uh, it means we'd have to take staff out of our mass vaccination clinics where they are extraordinarily productive. It means we have to look at how can, how to handle these vaccines. Some of the vaccines, quite frankly, we couldn't uh, transport in this fashion based on my understanding of what's required in order to uh, protect them from. Um, ensuring that uh, they remain viable. Um, and I just think at the end of the day, um, you know, we all want the same thing. Uh, we have experts here uh, that have been working day and night to figure all of these things out. And now that we have the uh, priority handed to us from the province of getting to these essential workers, getting to educators and uh, broadening our reach by virtue of the uh, postal codes, the FSAs, the recognition that Peel uh, is a hot spot and requires that level of attention. Um, you know, let our people do what they do best, which is figure out the how, how we should roll this out, how we can get to these individuals, and how we can fast track as best as possible uh, getting needles to, uh, you know, arms to needles, I think is really our strategy. But there is room in our strategy for needles to arms in terms of mobile looking at populations that require that level of support. But I would really ask council not to not to try and handcuff us with, you know, using my way buses and Brampton buses and trying to figure out, you know, if we take the seats out, how many needle stations can, I mean, that's just really not a terribly efficient or quite frankly, effective way uh, for us to, to move this strategy forward. So, you know, Councillor Parrish, I know your heart's in the right place and I know you just want to get this done. So do we. Uh, and uh, I would really, ask that you uh, allow us to take this away. Uh, you know, we come back to you in two weeks, we'll tell you exactly how we've been able to integrate the goal into our strategy and to the extent that our strategy may need to be adjusted. Uh, that's great. I think as well, we should really wait to see what the province is going to do around mobile um, and how and what they're going to roll out because 
presumably uh, that will augment the strategy and the plan that we already have uh, in motion and is operating, um, you know, at a pretty good clip. So uh, those are my thoughts. I don't know if Lawrence wants to add anything to that uh, and uh, happy to take any other questions. So what I'm going to suggest is, first I'm going to go to Lawrence. Uh, Councillor Parrish, you still have the floor, so I'd like to hear Dr. Lawrence Lowe's response. Then I'll come to you and then to let everybody know I have a list to speak to it as well, assuming you also want to be on the list, and that would be Demerla Medeiros Thompson. So I'm going to go to Dr. Lowe first, then Councillor Parrish. I'll come right back to you as the mover of the motion. Uh, Dr. Lowe, if I can couch it uh, somewhat differently, just I think what the CAO and, and I'd be interested is the logistical ramifications and is there a reallocation necessary? So yes, we can do this, but suddenly we're closing the clinic downstairs in this building or at 71. To, those types of things that we need to flesh out a bit. So Dr. Lowe, to you, then Carolyn, I'm coming right back to you. Dr. Lowe. So, oh, hi, sorry, just a moment. Hi, Jess, do you want to say hi? <laughs> oh. But just like, just like we've been trying to, but... I, I can print it for you, okay, sweetheart. I just, um, just give me a second, all right? Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, perhaps uh, I'll pass it to Brian Laundrie briefly to respond, and... Uh, and I'll help my little daughter out here. We'll, we'll right start here. with Brian, then we'll come back to you if you have anything further. Brian, why don't you pinch it here? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the, on the logistical challenge, I, 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 we, we, we're challenged logistically to keep the, uh, the mass clinics that we have fully staffed and to expand that. And we removed this, we're moving next week from 10,000 today to uh, a day uh, capacity to, to about 12,500 a day capacity across the region. Certainly our own sites are going up by a considerable amount. Uh, our biggest challenge each and every day is ensuring that we have the immunizers and the clinical staff in place to to uh, make sure that our flow is consistent and that we are optimizing the space and the resource and the, and the vaccine that we have. So to 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 the point that we have the two phase strategy, we for sure will be uh, taking that taking the freedom that the age based strategy gives us. Uh, to to try to supplement and and to actually supplement our mobile response, but it can it can't take on the volume that's uh, 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 I think anticipated through through the motion. It would definitely impact our mass clinics. I'm not sure where the staffing could come from otherwise. Uh, the uh, and then uh, CAO Baker has outlined. For, uh, a number of the issues around the vaccine, uh, the fragility of the vaccine, the cold chain management. Uh, we've got backup generators at every one of our uh, mass uh, clinic sites because we can't just trust not having that vaccine properly uh, properly stored. And uh, uh, it's it's the gold that we have now. So uh, to to take it out is, uh, into the community is a very uh, the mobile strategy is best at smaller locations and congregate settings. If we get the massive resource from the province and uh, alter alternate supply and alta, uh, you know additional fridges, et cetera, that's a that's an option. But to set up any pop up uh, clinic that's anticipated, I think through a website is for sure a uh, it's a it's a big lift. And, and <laughs> excuse me. Our teams would predict that that would take uh, a week and a half to two weeks to set up in any substantial workplace. So I'll just, uh, I'll start it there. I've started that there and, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Lowe. Dr. Lowe, uh, so did you have anything further? Yeah, so through the chair and, and uh, first of all, thank you uh, chair and council for your understanding of the uh, situation that just arose. Um, my daughter now has her French homework uh, ready to go. Um, but uh, in respect of uh, the uh, discussion and question at hand, um, I, I think it's really important to outline that uh, we agree, Councillor Parrish, uh, that we, we wanna get through this as quickly as possible. And based on our historical trends and based on our data and based on our understanding with our community and the community agencies that are ready to push people uh, to clinics, we know that sticking to the plan uh, with the math clinics as a backbone uh, still remains the fastest way through. And especially when you get through all the age brackets, it covers off questions of, you know, who works where, medical conditions, uh, hotspots. It's really just making sure that we uh, continue that significant throughput. However, what I do want to share is that we are not a 
against mobile. We do see value in uh, mobile clinics as well, but in a specific nature deployment. And I think to the extent that we share your concern and we share your desire to try to get to some of those hard to reach uh, you know, neighborhoods, some of those hard to reach populations, we have deployed a mobile modality. It has largely been focused on hard to reach seniors in congregate settings and hotspots at this time. Um, the, only, the goal and the original plan with mobile up until these recent discussions was to finish off all those senior congregate settings, including getting down to Councillor Dasko's ward, presumably, and, and the Fairways building. Um, and then once that was done, was then to figure out how we would use it in pop-up settings and workplaces. But now we, we see that that phase, especially in the province's discussions, has now been moved up. So. Given that it's all very new, given that the province has indicated that there are going to be provincial mobile units, which we we might be able to rely on, um, given that um, uh, you know we we do have a commitment to mobile, but we're really trying to study the recent provincial unlocking and the moving up from June to April of people who can't work from home. I think we really, if anything, probably just need a little bit more time uh, to continue to figure out how mobile will will still use uh, continue to be used as a useful adjunct. And I know I've used the word elegant uh, to describe our mass clinics. We can also make mobile very elegant in terms of how it gets to people who uh, have difficulty, uh, you know, getting to a mobile uh, to a mass vaccination center or who can't take time off work, who can't get off work. All these other pieces. I think that the uh, I, my only request would be uh, to say, yeah, we. we we are committed to mobile. We want to actually see how that all fits, um, uh, and that you know we have the opportunity to maybe bring back further details once we've had a chance to explore it. Uh, the recent provincial announcement and any resources offers that may be coming from the province at this time, uh, together that would essentially supplement and build on uh, what we think is honestly the fastest way to get a whole bunch of people through almost 60% of our population by mid-May. So thank you, and I hope that helps to share at least where we're coming from when we hear this motion. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Hey, I'm going to be very patient, very, very patient. I didn't suggest the buses. I suggested that was one way to do it, and it appealed to me because it's working in England. That was what I suggested. If you look at the motion, I'm not telling you how to do it. Nobody's going to tell you how to do anything. We've given you the task, or we will if this passes, we're giving you the task to figure out how to do it and to figure it out quickly. The motion says find a way. And if we stop the spread of those 300,000 people and their families and their kids and their teachers and leaving the region of Peel and going into the other regions, we benefit the whole GTAA. So we've had a couple of weeks with vaccines. So far, I, w I took George yesterday, he got his vaccine, and I sat in the car in the parking lot watching who was coming in, in big Cadillac SUVs, Porsche sports cars, the people who are wealthy and can afford to stay at home and have takeout food, they're benefiting from the vaccines. The people who can't, the frightened people, the people who are, we've been elected to protect, because all the rich people can take care of themselves. All the counselors can take care of themselves, all the, all the professionals, all the doctors, all, the, all these people, lawyers, none of them are suffering. None of them are getting sick. The people that need help are the people in the factories. And if you can't come up with a way to help them, come back and tell us. But I want this motion to pass. I want the province to know that we care about the people who can't take care of themselves. And absolutely, if you have a whole bunch of people in a factory parading out for some, whatever you set up with freezers and all the rest of it, coming out into the out into the parking lot, especially in the nice weather, they see all the other ones are going, they're more likely to go. Even the wealthy, smart, I can take care of myself people in Moore Park, only 77% of them went. You've got to take these people. You'll be lucky if you get 7% right now that can figure out how to get to one of your clinics. So I'm not telling you how to do it. This motion doesn't tell you how to do it. It says, find a way. And I use the example of the seniors dental. Talked about it, talked about it, talked about it. Went through a year and a half. And the thing is working like a charm. And what has also happened is the province has woken up and said, yeah, we're going to bring this in all over the province. They messed it up a little, but they brought it in. We've got to be leaders here. And we can't wait for the province. And we can't, we've got their permission. 
And Janice, with all respect, I really don't care if it's a little extra complicated for the staff. If it's impossible, you come back and tell us in two weeks. But I know you, you'll make it work. That's why you're in that, that chair. And every time I get the, the triumvirate of Nando's comments, your comments, I know, here we go again. This is not, it's got nothing to do with people that are sitting here on this call. It has everything to do with people who have to go to Ace Bakery and sweat all day to make bread to go into Costco so we can all feed our kids and our grandkids. So I'm, I'm very offended by the fact that I'm being handled. I'm being tossed around like a little tennis ball. No one told you how to do it. We're asking you, do it. Do it as quickly as you can. It could take a couple of weeks and this part will be over. And then you're gonna start seeing the incidents go down. I guarantee it, and I'm not a doctor. I'm very, very, very disappointed. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on with our list, Demerla Medeiros Thompson Sato, Councillor Demerla. Thank you, Chair. Um, I feel like both Councillor Parrish and the CA are saying the same thing. So I'm just trying to understand where the difference is because Councillor Parrish is saying her motion doesn't speak to the how and just the what, and I guess we are all in alignment on the what. So I, I guess I just want to understand a little bit more uh, from the CAO as to what parts of the motion, because I don't, I have the motion that Councillor Parrish has put forward. I am not aware of what those changes were. Perhaps, maybe we're not that far apart, and uh, perhaps someone can speak to that and uh, we can resolve it and have a win-win. Okay, great idea. Through to the CAO. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So maybe I can offer as a solution then uh, a couple of extra words and, you know, that Councillor Parrish might consider. And I promise you, Councillor Parrish, I'm not handling you. I'm trying to help you. Um, that the Region of Peel outfit mobile vaccination units. I mean, that's pretty tactical. That's, that's I think, um, the way I, I read it anyway. Uh, so maybe if we could say that, you know, the staff be asked to report back on the role of, mo out of mobile vaccination units in uh, the vaccination strategy or something along that line. I mean, the comment through through you, Mr. Chair, you know, Councillor Parrish said, well, we could have this problem solved in a couple of weeks. I think we just heard Brian say, it'll take us two weeks to stand this up. So you're probably two weeks away from the first needle in arms, uh, even if we were able to put all of the pieces together to make this work. So I would really ask that uh, instead of the the more I, I, I interpret, I apologize if that's not Councillor Parrish's intent, um, you know, that outfitting mobile vaccination units is a very prescriptive and uh, specific ask. And if we could just make it a bit more general so that we could direct the staff, as they already are, uh, to ensure that the, um, a, a mobile vaccination uh, strategy is part of the rollout, in, is particularly as we consider essential workers and the categories of employees that Councillor Parrish has mentioned. I, I mean, with the, with the greatest of respect, you know, Councillor Parrish talked about Ace Bakery. I mean, we would never have the capacity to, to, to run, you know, are we talking large businesses? Are we talking small businesses? Because the bakeries, you know, three employees uh, to, to, you know, that's, that's probably not a good strategy from a mobile perspective. So I apologize, Councillor Parrish, if I'm taking your words too literally, that's not my intent, but I think it is important that we understand what's being asked and that uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we can manage on our side. That's really my, my concern. Thank you. Councillor Parrish, carry on, please. Thank you, uh, Councillor De De Demerla. Uh, I, the wording I would change is that the region of Peel, under the supervision of the MOH, create a mobile vaccination program. 
It takes the wheels out of it. Yeah. Just call it a mobile vaccination program. And Ace Bakery has 3,500. Yeah. And Carolyn, I'm seeing a bunch of thumbs up up here. Carolyn, you can't see them, but I'm seeing thumbs up here in this room that that seems more workable um, from the CAO. Okay, I'm good with that. Oh, okay. And so, do I still have the floor? Yeah, you still have the floor, Demerla. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I apologize for the, the deviation. You still have the floor, Councillor Demerla. Go ahead. Thank you. Just one last question. This is to the solicitor. Uh, I just wanted to ask the solicitor. I know she said we can't direct the house, but we can certainly set an agenda. So I, I just want to make sure that she's all, she's on side with this, and then I'm, I'm going to support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Through the chair, yes. Uh, as amended, I'm quite satisfied with the, the wording of the motion. Thank you. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Councillor, and that was quite helpful. Moving on with my list, Maderos Thompson, Sato Santos. Councillor Maderos. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Chair, and uh, I think uh, uh, some of what I wanted to say has been already uh, dealt with, so I thank you for uh, staff, and I just want to recognize, uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, Councillor Parrish's leadership in this, and, and certainly all three mayors have been very active in uh, promoting. Uh, a comment that I had at City Council yesterday was this idea of mobile vaccination. It's a, I've heard this from, you know, different people, different residents, and, and certainly, you know, this idea has been tossed around over the last six to seven months and but you know really what what this speaks to today is really finally us uh, uh, taking action and really uh, uh, commending uh, Councillor Parrish who um, you know another files that we talk about uh, talks about just really taking the bull by the horns and, and and let's doing it so I think what this motion really does it just provides that on for us to uh, go ahead but I, I do want to recognize all the great work that staff are doing all the uh, amount of uh, hours uh, uh, being put into this and uh, uh, really uh, it's, a, it's an honor to second it and, and thank you to all my colleagues to support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Thank you. And basically what I was trying to get the clarification on is basically what we mean by mobile. I've been approached by Amazon where they could do it out in their parking lot and process not them but process everybody in the same thing. I got the car dealers that said it's gone very well across the United States with the drive through You know how they have the cars going through? They'll clear out all the cars, particular dealership, let's pass everybody through on a drive through You see how well Vaughn is working. So when I'm just saying mobile, I, 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 I understand where Councillor Paris was using a bus, but what I'm just saying is, to me, is it's just volatile that it can move. Uh, I would like to leave that open, and that's what I was basically wanting to know is, Let's keep it broad, and uh, that's what I was basically asking, but I think we've got there, but that's where I was coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sado. Well, sorry. <laughs> I clicked and something else popped up. Um, a resident just sent me um, an email that she just heard on CP24, an announcement by the Ministry of Labour that they have approached 500 businesses to do on-site vaccinations at the businesses. Do we know anything about that, Dr. Lowe? I mean, that that would kind of cover the uh, what we're talking about um, if the businesses are in Peel and the Ministry of Labour is going to go in and do vaccination clinics right in the company. Uh, so uh, through the chair to Councillor Sato, uh, and I think that really speaks to what I have been saying uh, throughout the update is that we just found out about this announcement and it's not clear to us what the plan is on the provincial mobile units. So um, we're hoping to get further information and uh, once the, you know, if the if and when the motion passes, we'd be happy to bring that along with the broader mobile strategy back at, at the next council meeting. So um, basically the ministry has already, from what the minister said, I guess today, they have already contacted the businesses um, that they are going, that the province is going to go in, I assume, and do the vaccination. So we would not be doing it. It would be provincial staff, I guess. I don't know who um, would do it, which which is really what we want to achieve. Um, let let them use their staff so we don't have to take them out of uh, out of our vaccination clinics, but. Um, is there a way that we would be able to find out um, where these businesses are in Peel and if, in fact, 
Um, they are the ones that we are trying to target. You know, I, I have a lot of distribution, and so does Councillor Parish, and, and I know in Brampton, but we have the majority of the distribution centers, uh, big ones, the, the Walmarts, the Amazons, the Ikeas, and and all of those that uh, that have thousands of employees um, in, our, in our communities. So it'd be very interesting if we could find that out. And, and I, you know, I don't want to wait two weeks <laughs> for you to come back with uh, with the information. So, could we just ask that uh, that following the minister the ministry's announcement today, which I understand was just a short while ago on CP24, um, that we try to find out which of those 500 businesses are actually in the region of Peel, and if they would cover the areas that uh, that we're trying to target through the motion. Yeah, Councillor said it would seem only logical as well and speaks to the point that everything's late breaking on this file, isn't it? So, uh, yes, I, I see Dr. Lowe nodding and saying, sure, we got to get our heads around that and maybe we're all going in the same direction. Okay, moving on with my list, Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Sato, for, for bringing that up. Um, unfortunately, we as a council have been logical for many months now, and the province is only hearing us now, so I'm not convinced that they have their list right. And so I, I share the sentiment um, and passion from Councillor Parrish. At the end of the day, some of the most, the people who need us the most are the ones who are not getting the help that they deserve. And it is our job uh, to make sure that that happens. And regardless of what the provincial announcement is or was just now, Dr. Lowe and Janice and regional team, let's please try to do our best to get ahead of it. And let's give them the information. Like, let's tell them exactly where they need to go before they make a decision, because their decisions over the past few months have been really wrong, I think, um, and, and not really prioritizing where the help is needed the most. So. Perhaps we can work with the Brampton Board of Trade, Mississauga Board of Trade. They would have those lists at their fingertips. Um, they would know exactly where to go. And instead of waiting for the province to figure out where to put them, let's tell them where, they, where it needs to go um, so that we can get this done and figure this out as quickly as possible. Thanks. And thank you, Councillor Parrish, for, for the motion. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. Thank, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. I, of course, I'd like to support the motion, and I intend to do that. And I, I don't know what those big dummies at Queens Park are, have been done in the last 24 hours to wipe out their record of failure on this file from day one. So you know, you know, maybe if stu stupidity got us into this, it'll get it out of get us out of it too at the same time. But uh, I, all I can tell you about the province is they know 100 ways not to do this. So. If they're on side now, that's great. Let them catch up with Peel because we we can. Uh, I've always thought local government is the level to implement things and to get things done in an efficient way. And every time the province does it, they got that rule book that they look at and blow the dust off of it and follow all the guidelines. Like if you follow all the rules, you miss all the fun. So it's time. It's time for us to get to work ourselves and stop waiting and hoping and praying. Praying and hoping is, are not strategies. Their, their last ditch effort. So let's get in there and get some work done. Dr. Lowe, if you got to do this on a tricycle and you want somebody to push you through Brampton and put the needles behind your ears, I'm going to give you a hand. I'm, I'm, let's, let's, get, let's get going. We got to, I, I, I've been put up with these boneheads now long enough and I, I, I don't know why we think they're going to do better at the end than they did in the last year and a bit. This government's crumbling, by the way, and the reason why the locals are getting a little restless. This is like the last scene in Frankenstein, you know, poor old Frankenstein, he didn't kill anybody, but he got blamed for it. And, they ch and the locals chased him up into that tower with the pikes and the torches and they burned it. And that's what I'm afraid of is happening in Ontario. People are getting pretty fed up with this and they're going to take the law in their own hands and they won't be making all the right decisions. But there's one thing, that guy going up in the tower is going to get set on fire. And I think we need to put a fire under ourselves and stop worrying about these minor bureaucratic nonsense. Let's let's get the, the needles in the arms where we need it. And if we have to deliver a truck and rent a compressor, oh my goodness, you make it sound like a logistical nightmare. Just uh, get working on it. And I'm sure that we can put some needles in some arms and stop listening to all the doubters and naysayers. What a 
sad, depressing bunch of people. I'm, I'm glad this is the, the fatality rate is as low as it is at one or two percent. If this were 10 percent of the population, would we still be sitting around? No, we wouldn't. We'd be doing something, even filling sandbags if we have to something. So uh, uh, I'm 100 percent behind it. It's overdue. And uh, Councilor Parrish, don't worry about the details. Uh, they'll sort themselves out when this thing is all over. And uh, let's get at it. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, George. Let's get at it. I want to read the motion so that everybody is clear. More for Councilor Parrish so I can make sure it's the motion she intended, which is duly moved by Councilor Parrish, seconded by Councilor Medeiros. Whereas COVID-19 variants are attacking younger victims, many of whom are essential workers. And whereas it has been known for months that essential workers in warehouses, manufacturing facilities, logistics companies, and packaging companies are a source of the spread that is not being addressed by lockdowns or age-related vaccine distribution. And whereas essential employees working shoulder to soldier and multi-contact frontline workers, often those without sick leave, which would allow them to self-isolate at the onset of symptoms, are contracting infection in their workplaces. And whereas essential workers are spreading COVID variants in multi-generational households, family members who are initially asymptomatic then spread disease in schools and other public places. And whereas vaccinating by age group is methodical, but is not stopping the spread of COVID-19 and its variants effectively, therefore be it resolved that the region of Peel under the supervision of the MOH create a mobile vaccination program to go into high infection workplace sites in Caledon, Brampton and Mississauga to vaccinate all workers wanting to be vaccinated regardless of age necessitating a minimal disruption of productivity and further that the mobile program includes those employed in schools, transit workers and other essential workers exposed to multiple human contacts regardless of age. You have heard the motion, Madam Clerk, for a vote over to you. Count Councillor Parrish, I, I, to vin I see the yeah. thumbs up, Carolyn, we're good. Thank you very much, Councillor Parrish. There's the motion before you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll begin with Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? George for logistics. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demerla? Yes. Councillor Demerla in favor. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes, absolutely. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes, thank you, Councillor Parrish. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? In favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? Yes, in favor. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? I'll help push. Yes. Councillor Pileshi <laughs> in favor. Councillor Parrish? Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr. Councillor Starr. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Thompson. In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente. In favor. Councillor Vicente in favor. And that carries. Thank Th you. That carries unanimously. Well done. Okay, moving on. Uh, the matters outstanding on our consent agenda. That takes us down to 13-1, building an enhanced community paramedic paramedicine program in Peel that was asked held by Councillor Groves. Councillor Groves. Um, actually, Mr. Chair, I'm good. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do you need a vote on that? We need a seconder from Councillor Groves. Anybody opposed? 
That is carried. Thank you. The right. next. Oh, oh, oh. So we do need a recorded vote. Oh, we do need a recorded yep. vote on that. So yeah, because it was held. So it was moved by Councillor Groves. I think I saw Mayor Crombie wave her hand as well. Yes. She'll still second it. That the approach to an enhanced community paramedic program with provincial funding is outlined in the report of the Commissioner of Health Services, listed on the April 8, 2021 Regional Council agenda, titled "Building an Enhanced Community Paramedicine Program in Peel." Be endorsed and further that three million dollars increase to the expenditure and revenue of the 2021 operating budget for paramedic services be approved. You've heard the motion, Madam Clerk. The vote to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor Brown? Mayor Brown? Councillor Carlson? I uh, can hear you now, Mayor Brown, your vote? Yes. yes. Mayor Brown in favor, thank you. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor DeMurla? Yes. Councillor DeMurla in favor. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? Yes. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? In favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? In favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes, in favor. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? Yes, in favor. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Uh, Councillor Starr? Councillor Starr, he was having some technical issues. Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? In favor. Councillor Vicente in favor, and that carries. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us down to 19.5. Report of the Clerk regarding the Regional Council Policies and Procedures Committee. Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you very much. I didn't want this to just slide through without a very warm thank you to Catherine Lockyer and to the whole clerk's crew who did an amazing job pulling this together. John Maskerin is a man who obviously loves his specialty and he kept us all entertained for hours. And I, I just needed to thank our staff. They did a first class job. It was kind of thrown on them quickly. They pulled a, a very professional program together and I'm very, very pleased. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Motion to move receipt is moved by Councillor Parrish, seconded by Councillor Carlson. All those in favor, Karen, and Karen, you were right. Even those that have been around a while learned a lot from the and reaffirmed. It was very well done. So shout out to everybody involved. Moving on, that takes me to I've got notices of motion and other business. So before we go to the notice of motion, is there any other business on the part of councillors before I go to Councillor Fonseca's notice of motion? Seeing none, that takes me to item 22-1, motion regarding 2021 Year of Sustainable Active Mobility, as requested by Councillor Fonseca and Councillor Santos that we held over from the last meeting. Councillor Fonseca. Oh, uh, Councillor Pileshi. Can you hear me? Oh. I, I will, but I'm just uh, sorting out Councillor okay. Pileshi through to clerk. If you, you're advising me, Councillor Pileshi put his hand up to support something on the last vote, and the clerk is clear on what that is. Okay. Oh, so Councillor Pileshi may have had something on other business. Thank you. Councillor Pileshi, I will come back to you once we've dealt with this matter. Councillor Fonseca, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just before I uh, begin, um, I had submitted, and thank you, uh, thank you to everyone. This, this item, this motion has been referred or deferred a number of times, uh, but I think it's actually worked out uh, strongly um, to all of our benefits because in the meantime of this, uh, the motion being deferred, the federal government made um, uh, further to other announcements made by the federal and provincial governments with regards to climate change uh, funding, active transportation uh, infrastructure funding, uh, a first ever uh, announcement um, and funding stream for specifically dedicated uh, for active transportation. Uh, 
over five years, $400 million. So um, it's very exciting news and uh, speaks specifically to uh, the motion that Councillor uh, Santos and I have been working on. Um, and just to clerks, uh, there was a, um, based on uh, input and discussions with staff, and thank you very much to the variety of staff uh, that uh, helped us craft the motion, um, the amended uh, motion or additional uh, whereas is and therefore be it resolved. Um, could we get that motion on the screen or, or do I have confirmation that everybody received the amended uh, or the edited or updated motion? That goes to clerks. Are we okay. confirming everybody? Happy? So I'm happy to take it as read because what you've asked is correct, Councillor Fonseca. Excellent. So I, I won't, um, I, I will let the motion speak for itself. I will say a big thank you uh, to Councillor uh, Santos and, the, and, uh, and again to staff. And based off of uh, the conversations that we have had um, when it comes to addressing uh, Vision Zero, uh, when it comes to addressing and collaborating and taking opportunity to access um, uh, available funds and ensure um, that we are providing uh, safe uh, infrastructure uh, when it comes to active transportation infrastructure um, within neighborhoods and communities and also infrastructure that connects um, to region appeal and local municipal uh, infrastructure, uh, as well as addressing um, uh, motions that we have approved and passed uh, through master plans, both at the local municipal uh, table and around climate change, uh, action, uh, active transportation, vision zero, um, and all of all of the different and various uh, various motions that are actually laid out in the mo in this motion itself. Um, this is why I'm putting forward uh, this motion here today. Um, and I think the timing is excellent and uh, we need to make sure and send a strong message to uh, the provincial and federal government um, that we are uh, working together collaboratively, uh, the local municipalities, but also through the region appeal, a different and across um, different departments and with all various stakeholders to ensure that we are not only accessing the funds, but accessing the funds in a way that we are going to reach um, the outcomes that we, uh, we have expressed through other motions when it comes to addressing climate change crisis and active transportation and healthy and well health and well-being um, and complete communities. So I will leave it at that and I'm not sure if there's any questions, uh, but also I guess over to Councillor Santos and again, a thank you to her um, for all that she has added also to this motion. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, Chair. It was such a, it was so fun working with Councillor Fonseca on this motion. We've been working on this one for about a month now together with staff. It was also great working with staff and talking it through to get to a point where it is um, right now. And coincidentally, of course, the federal government made that historic announcement for funding for active transportation. I, I don't think we need to really convince our colleagues here the importance of doing this work and, and taking the lead and, and seizing the opportunity with respect to active transportation. Um, so I'll just say thank you very much, Councillor Fonseca, and to the team for, for helping us put this together. And uh, thank you in advance, hopefully, for the support from our council colleagues uh, on this motion. And let's take that vote right now. Madam Clerk, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll begin with Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demerola? Yes. Councillor Demerola in favor. Councillor Dasko? Councillor Dasko? Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? 
Yes, in favor. Councilor Fortini in favor. Councilor Groves? Yes, in favor. Councilor Groves in favor. Councilor Innes? In favor. Councilor Innes in favor. Councilor Kovac? In favor. Councilor Kovac in favor. Councilor Mahoney? Yes, in favor. Councilor Mahoney in favor. Councilor McFadden? Yes, in favor. Councilor McFadden in favor. Councilor Medeiros? Yes. Councilor Medeiros in favor. Councilor Pileshi? Absolutely. Councilor Pileshi in favor. Councilor Parrish? Yes. Councilor Parrish in favor. Councilor Raz? Yes. Councilor Raz in favor. Councilor Sato? Yes. Councilor Sato in favor. Councilor Santos? Yes. Councilor Santos in favor. Councilor Sinclair? In favor. Councilor Sinclair in favor. Councilor Starr? Councilor Starr? Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councilor Vicente? In favor. Councilor Vicente in favor. And I'll circle back one more time to Councilor Dasko. Oh, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And as promised, I'll circle back to other business. Councilor Pileshi, did you have something? You're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I just, with respect to, uh, you know, COVID-related businesses and, and taking the the time on our, our our agendas, and I leave it up to you, Mr. Chair, to for the possibility of looking at our scheduling coming up in the next few weeks. There's some some holes in there <clears throat> that maybe we we should or could look at uh, uh, regional council meetings just related to COVID possibility, but uh, maybe having more meetings uh, scheduled in. But I would leave it up to you, and I just wanted to to throw that out there, uh, Mr. Chair. It's, it's a very fair point that it's crossed our minds as well. So, Paul, thank you very much for bringing it up because it's all about time management for all of us. So thank you very much for that, duly noted. Okay, with, with that, Madam Clerk, I think that takes me, I have the bylaws, so let me first go to then a motion moved by Councillor Innes, seconded by Councillor Carlson, that the bylaws listed on the April 8, 2021 Regional Council agenda being bylaws 23, 2021 to 25, 2021 inclusive be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Regional Clerk and the corporate seal be affixed there too. Madam Clerk, any objections? Hearing none, the bylaws carry. I think that takes us to in camera for one item, 42.2, an update on creating new affordable residential rental units in Peel through the Rapid Housing Initiative. Uh, to the clerk's team, if you can make sure we're properly in camera, please. Okay, we are properly back in open session. Madam Clerk. Thank you. I've got a motion uh, moved by Councillor Dasko and seconded by Councillor Sinclair uh, that the um, oral update listed as item 24.2 on the April 8th, 2021 Regional Council agenda be received. Are there any objections? Seeing none, that carries. Okay, next up then is a motion moved by Councillor Rado, second, uh, Sato, seconded by Councillor Raz, that bylaw 26 2021 to confirm the proceedings of Regional Council at its meeting held April 8, 2021, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the Regional Appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. Are there any objections? That is carried. And then I have a motion moved by Councillor McFadden, seconded by Councillor Innes, that the April 8, 2021 Regional Council meeting be adjourned. All those in favor, that carries. Well done once again. Thank you all.